members, the speakers. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Clark. Government business, notice number one, Administrative Decisions, Effective International Instruments Bill, 1997. Minister. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I present the Administrative Decisions, Effect of International Instruments Bill, 1997. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act relating to the effect of international instruments on the making of administrative decisions. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move that this bill be now read a second time. Minister. Uh, this bill responds to the High Court's decision in Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs and TO reported in 1995, volume 183 of the Commonwealth Law Reports, page 273, which was handed down on 7 April 1995. In that decision, the court found that by entering into a treaty, the Australian government creates a legitimate expectation in administrative law that the executive government and its agencies will act in accordance with the terms of the treaty even where those terms have not been incorporated into Australian law. The court also said that where a decision maker intends to act inconsistently with a treaty, procedural fairness required that the person affected by the decision be given notice and an adequate opportunity to put arguments on the point. If not, the decision could be set aside on the grounds of unfairness. The High Court made it clear that such an expectation cannot arise where there is either a statutory or executive indication to the contrary. The High Court's decision gave treaties an effect in Australian law which they did not previously have. The government is firmly of the view that this development is not consistent with the proper role of Parliament in implementing treaties in Australian law. It is a long-standing principle that the provisions of a treaty to which Australia is a party do not form part of Australian law unless those provisions have been validly incorporated. Under the Australian Constitution, the executive government has the power to make Australia a party to a treaty. It is for Australian parliaments, however, to change Australian law to implement treaty obligations. For these reasons, on 25 February 1997, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and I made a joint statement which set aside legitimate expectations arising out of entry into treaties. This was a clear expression by the Executive Government of the Commonwealth of a contrary intention referred to by the majority of the High Court in the TO case. The joint statement of 25 February 1997 replaced a joint statement which was made by the previous Government on the 10th of May 1995. However, the 10 May 1995 joint statement continues to apply to decisions made between the date of that statement and 25 February 1997. On 25 February, we also announced that legislation would be introduced into the parliament to displace the legitimate expectation in administrative law which would otherwise arise out of the entry into treaties. This bill fulfills that undertaking. It is a clear statutory indication to the contrary, as discussed by the High Court in the TO case. It gives this parliament a role in restoring the effect of treaties in Australian law to that they had prior to the High Court's decision in the TO case. In passing this legislation, the Parliament also will be reasserting its proper role in changing Australian law to implement treaties. Indeed, the bill complements the treaty reforms this government initiated on coming into office. One of the principal <coughs> aims of those reforms was to enhance the role of Parliament in scrutinising treaty action by the executive government. 
Those reforms included the tabling of treaties in Parliament prior to the government taking action to fully become a party to a, to a treaty, the preparation and tabling of national interest analyses for each treaty to which it has proposed Australia become a party, and the establishment of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties to examine treaties. These measures, giving the Parliament a proper role in the treaty-making process, could have been introduced by the previous government. However, it was too intent on keeping Parliament in the dark about <coughs> treaties. This veil of secrecy uh, now has been lifted. I turn now to the terms of the bill itself. The bill will restore the situation which existed before the TO case. That is, if there are to be changes to procedural or substantive rights in Australian law resulting from adherence to a treaty, they will result from parliamentary and not executive action. Indeed, this proper role of Commonwealth, State and Territory legislatures is emphasised in the sixth paragraph of the preamble to the bill. Clause 5 of the bill gives effect to the statement by the majority of the High Court that a legitimate expectation arising out of entry into a treaty by Australia can be displaced by executive or legislative action. Clause 5 provides that no legitimate expectation providing a basis at law for challenging an administrative decision can arise out of the fact that Australia is bound by an international instrument or the fact that an enactment produces or refers to such an instrument. The term international instrument is defined in Clause 4 and covers, amongst other types of instruments, treaties and conventions. To fall within the definition, the instrument must be binding at international law. The definition also covers parts of such instruments. The terms administrative decision and enactment are also defined in Section 4. The Act will apply to administrative decisions made after it enters into force. However, the term administrative decision extends to an administrative decision reviewing or determining an appeal in respect of a decision made before the commencement of the legislation. The 25 February 1997 joint statement will continue to apply to decisions made between 25 February 1997 and the date of entry into force of this bill. It is unclear from the decision of the High Court in TO's case whether state and territory administrative decisions may be the subject of legitimate expectations arising out of treaties. This uncertainty could not be allowed to remain. Therefore, the bill is expressed to extend to state and territory decisions. Since ratification of a treaty is a Commonwealth executive action, it is entirely appropriate for the Commonwealth to legislate to control the effect of that action in Australian domestic law generally. The states and territories all support Commonwealth legislation on this issue. However, they differ in their views on whether the Commonwealth legislation should be applied to state and territory decisions. Therefore, Clause 6 of the Bill contains a rollback provision. This excludes the operation of the Bill in relation to state or territory administrative decisions where the relevant state or territory legislature passes, or has passed, legislation having the same or similar effect as this Bill. This means that it will be open to a state or territory to have its own legislation of similar effect. South Australia enacted such legislation in 1995. Therefore, the bill will have no application to state administrative decisions in South Australia. Nor does the bill prevent any state which wishes to do so from passing a law or taking its own executive actions in relation to treaties accepted by Australia, which might themselves create a, a legitimate expectation in that case, the legitimate expectation would flow from state law and not the Commonwealth Executive Act of Ratification. Clause 7 puts it beyond doubt that Parliament is not affecting the way in which treaties may otherwise have relevance in Australian law. Let me mention a number of existing uses covered by Clause 7. This bill will not affect the operation of treaty provisions which have been incorporated into Australian law. For example, it does not affect the provisions of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, which are given the force of law by the Diplomatic Privileges and Immunities Act 1967. Secondly, the bill will not affect the operation of an Act which provides for the redress of grievances in respect of alleged breaches of international instruments to which Australia is a party. For example, the bill does not affect the operation of procedures available under the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission Act 1986. Thirdly, the bill does not affect the operation of legislation which provides that compliance with an international instrument is a relevant consideration 
in making an administrative decision. For example, under the Air Navigation Regulations, compliance with Australia's bilateral air services agreements is a relevant consideration in making various decisions. Fourthly, the bill does not make compliance with an, an international instrument an irrelevant consideration in making an administrative decision where that would otherwise be consistent with the scope and object of the particular statutory provision. Fifthly, the bill will not affect the use by courts of international law in the form of treaties in the interpretation of statutes. Finally, it will not affect the use of international law as a source of guidance for the development of the common law. This use of treaties as one source for the development of the common law is to be distinguished from the High Court's finding that treaties gave rise to <coughs> legitimate expectations in administrative law. It is the legitimate expectation aspect of the TO decision with which this government and the previous government disagreed. This is the aspect addressed by this bill. On 25 February 1997, I stated that I looked forward to continuation of bipartisan support on this issue. The strength of feeling which the opposition, when in government, demonstrated on this issue was no more evident than in the speech given by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to the Mason and Beyond Conference in September 1995. He stated, my lack of enthusiasm for TIO is not especially a function of my lack of appreciation of how it has narrowed the gap between international and domestic, domestic law. Rather, it is a function of my belief that TIO creates a decision-making environment that is unworkable in practice, and that it goes further than the court was compelled to go by any legal principle, or should have gone, in upsetting the present balance between executive legislature and judiciary. The pre-TIO balance was a delicate one, to be sure, but nonetheless one perfectly attractive in theory and workable in practice. Uh, there can be no doubt that those words are his own. They encapsulate the reasons why this legislation is necessary in order to restore the proper role of this parliament in the implementation of treaties. I commend the bill to the House. Mr Speaker, I present the explanatory memorandum to the bill. The debate must now be adjourned. Adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those in favour say aye to the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Notice number two, Copyright Amendment Bill 1997. Minister. Mr Speaker, I present the Copyright Amendment Bill 1997. Clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Copyright Act 1968 and for related purposes. Minister. Mr Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Minister. The, Mr Speaker, the Coalition went into the 1996 election with a strong policy commitment to bring about an up-to-date and workable copyright law and specifically to legislate to recognise properly the moral rights of authors and artists. The comprehensive protection of moral rights of authors and artists is something for which Australia's creators have been agitating during the last few years. Provision for this is the single most important reform in the bill. The bill will also reform the law of ownership of copyright in the works of employed journalists and the law governing importation of goods with copyright labelling or packaging and introduce much needed streamlining or modernising of the operation of some areas of the Act. Under the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works, which is the main international convention on copyright, and of which Australia and 124 other countries are members, moral rights are the right of an author or, or artist to be identified with his or her work, known as the right of attribution, and the right to object to alteration or other derogatory treatment of the work that would be prejudicial to the author or artist's honour or reputation, known as the right of integrity. The rights apply to literary, dramatic, musical and artistic works and to films, but not to sound recordings. Personal honour and reputation are already protected by the laws of defamation. The law of passing off enables professional authors and artists to prevent another person representing himself or herself as the creator of their business output, including copyright works. The provisions in the Trade Practices Act 
against misleading or deceptive conduct could also be invoked by authors or artists. Some provisions in the Copyright Act already protect specific aspects of moral rights, for example, the duty to refrain from falsely attributing a work. However, this fragmentary and incomplete coverage by Australian law of the Berne Convention moral rights obligations has been increasingly criticised. Among other common law countries that had a similar approach to moral rights protection, the United Kingdom and Canada introduced improved moral rights legislation in 1980, <coughs> 1988, and New Zealand largely adopted the United Kingdom model in 1994. The bill that I'm now presenting honours this government's 1996 election policy commitment to the introduction of comprehensive moral rights and does so by reference to the international standards set by the Berne Convention. It is not just fulfilling international obligations. It is also acknowledging the great importance of ensuring respect for the integrity of creative endeavour. The right of attribution will be an important advance for authors, artists and film producers and directors because they have no comprehensive right beyond any relevant contract to require attribution. The right to take action against false attribution is essentially a consolidation of existing provisions in the Act. <clears throat> the right of integrity will provide a more certain and uniform level of protection than the laws of defamation which vary from state to state or territory, and will, consistently with the Berne Convention, last as long as copyright in the work, that is life, life of the creator plus 50 years, or in the case of films, 50 years. The government recognises the concerns of users of copyright, such as broadcasters, advertising agencies, filmmakers and newspaper publishers, that these rights will unduly hamper their existing practices. It is understandable that they fear use of moral rights by creators as an additional form of leverage to extract higher returns for the use of creators' works. However, if a user of a work respects the rights of the creator, that is, acknowledges where reasonable the authorship of the work and where reasonable avoids treatment that is prejudicial to the reputation of the author, then the user does not owe the author anything and does not need the author's permission in making the intended use of the work. In contrast, a user of one of the copyright economic rights, such as the right to copy, to publish, to broadcast, must always have the copyright owner's permission, express or implied, unless the use comes within a statutory exception. In determining whether non-attribution of authorship of a work is an infringement of moral rights, a court will have to consider whether the omission was reasonable in the circumstances. Reasonableness will depend on a number of relevant factors that must be taken into account, notably the nature of the work, industry practice, and whether the creator was an employee. Whether alteration of or dealing with a work infringes the right of integrity will also be subject to a similar test of reasonableness based on relevant criteria. Further, there will be no infringement of moral rights by a particular act or omission if it was consented to by the creator or if it was covered by a waiver by the creator of one or more of their rights for the work. Finally, it should be emphasised that the introduction of moral rights, in particular the right of integrity, is not intended to impede or adversely affect the time-honoured practices of parody and burlesque. The moral right of integrity is not intended to stifle satire, spoof or lampoon any more than does the existing law of defamation. Mr Speaker, experience in other countries suggests, and the government envisages, that enforcement of moral rights through the courts will be an exceptional occurrence. The main impact of the new legislation will, it is hoped, be to build upon good existing industry of practice and, where necessary, to raise awareness in an educative way of the need to respect the creativity of authors and artists. In those exceptional cases in which a creator feels forced to take action, courts will have the discretion to order a range of remedies, including damages, injunctions, publication of apology, or reversing infringing treatment of a work. Journalist copyright. A general rule under the Copyright Act is that copyright in works created in the course of employment belongs to the employer, 
who has engaged and paid the employees to create the works. However, there has long been an exception in the case of employed newspaper journalists in regard to use of their works other than for the purpose for which they have been employed, that is, new newspaper publication. Thus, those journalists have copyright for the purpose <coughs> of book publication and photocopying of their articles, pictures or cartoons. With the impact of new technology, the way that the Act divides copyright between the publishers and employed journalists has become out of date. In regard to electronic uses of employees' works, for example, selling of online access to the public, the government accepts that the publisher's copyright in their employees' creations should now extend to electronic rights, and the bill provides for this. However, the book rights now held by employed journalists in their articles and pictures will stay with them. The existing right of the employed journalists to authorise photocopying of their articles, most notably in press cutting services, will also remain with them. While the publishers have indicated that they do not oppose this, they have been concerned at the possibility that photocopying could impact on the circulation of their publications. The government is not satisfied that photocopying by press cuttings services up to now has had such an impact. Nevertheless, the government sees justification in giving publishers a right of objection to the making of photocopies of more than 15 per cent of a newspaper or magazine other than those pages containing full page advertisements. Where the copies are being made for several or indeed many clients, as is done by press cutting services, the right to object in the bill will operate in respect of any one client and not all clients in aggregate. Copyright packaging and labelling of imported goods. In 1988, a report by the Copyright Law Review Committee recommended to the then government that copyright in packaging or labelling of imported goods should not be able to be used to control distribution of the goods. Copyright control over importation of copyright items such as CDs, books and software, is a controversial matter, and the government is currently reviewing it. However, control of importation of non-copyright items, such as bottles of liquor, by exercise of the copyright in the label, is an inappropriate restraint of legitimate trade, and as recommended by the CLRC, it should be ended. This bill will implement this clearly desirable and long overdue reform. This change will not, however, relax existing controls over importation of goods with labelling or packaging that <coughs> consists of copyright materials made without the consent of the copyright owner in the country of manufacture. Streamlining and rationalising other areas of the existing Act. The other provisions in the Bill, while of a more technical machinery nature, introduced much needed streamlining or modernising of the operation of areas of the Act, including the provisions allowing governments to, copyright, uh, to copy copyright material subject to providing equitable remuneration to copyright owners, the provisions allowing institutions serving persons with print or intellectual disabilities to make special editions of works to help those persons to have access to copyright materials, the provisions allowing educational institutions to copy materials for teaching, the provisions establishing the copyright tribunal, the provisions governing the remedies that may be awarded by the courts for copyright infringement and the provisions for border interception of infringed imported yeah. copyright material. The, the bill also makes some formal amendments, such as updating the references to broadcasting legislation. Mr Speaker, this is an important bill for copyright creators because it delivers to them comprehensive moral rights which are so important in reaffirming respect for the creative role of authors, artists and film directors and producers. It is also important to copyright owners in facilitating payment to them for uses of their works under various statutory licences. The bill is at the, is at the same time important for large institutional users of copyright, not just governments but all the educational institutions, in streamlining the procedures for them to account to copyright owners. The bill includes important changes to ownership of copyright in works of employed journalists, which recognise the impact of new communications technology on the delivery of newspapers and magazines. In that regard, further changes to copyright in the new communications <coughs> network are likely after the government has considered the new international copyright treaties concluded at a diplomatic conference in Geneva last December. And this bill includes a microeconomic reform 
in lifting copyright control over distribution of imported goods with copyright packaging or labelling. All in all, Mr Speaker, this bill is a very substantial first instalment of the government's commitment to bringing about an up-to-date and workable copyright act. I commend the bill to the House. I present the explanatory memorandum to the bill. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Camp. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those in favour say aye to the contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. Clark. Notice number three, Student and Youth Assistance, Sex Discrimination Amendment Bill 1997. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I present the Student and Youth Assistance, Sex Discrimination Amendment Bill of 1997, and I present three signed copies of the bill. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Sex Discrimination Act 1984. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I move that the bill now be read a second time. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this bill introduces a statutory exemption for the Austudy and Abstudy schemes from the operation of the marital status discrimination provisions of the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984. At present, the Austudy and Abstudy schemes discriminate on the basis of marital status in two key ways. First, there are differences in the way legally married students are treated as compared to students in de facto relationships. And second, there are differences in the way legally married students are treated in comparison to single students. A number of these differences go to the broader issue of the assumptions of dependency which underpin Commonwealth allowances generally. Rates of allowance and the income and asset tests, including those applied to receipt of rent assistance, are based on the assumptions, which also underpin other Commonwealth allowances, that a person with a partner has access to the financial means of their partner to meet their combined costs. And a single person who is independent of parental assistance does not have the opportunity to share costs for accommodation and other living expenses. In addition to these broader issues, a number of the problems which Ausstudy and Abstudy uh, have in relation to the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 are specific to the schemes. Uh, unlike the social security situation, the recognition of de facto relationships in the Ausstudy context would generally result in increased eligibility for benefits. In the social security context, beneficiaries actually have a financial disincentive for establishing de facto relationships as their combined eligibility is, re is reduced as a result. In Ausstudy, a person who is married is considered to be independent for purposes of the scheme and is eligible for a higher rate of Ausstudy than the rate payable to a student who is considered to be dependent. If de facto relationships <coughs> are treated the same as marriage, that is, as a ground for independent status, there would be a financial incentive for establishing the existence of a de facto relationship so that the student is eligible for a higher rate of Ausstudy. This would make it difficult for the scheme administrators to verify the legitimacy of de facto relationships. Abstudy experiences similar problems under the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 in relation to living allowances, income testing and eligibility for rent assistance. The Ausstudy and Abstudy schemes initially had a legislative exemption from the operation of these provisions of the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 prescribing discrimination, prescribing discrimination on the ground of marital status. The Ausstudy and Abstudy schemes currently have an administrative exemption from the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission in relation to the marital status provisions of the Sex Discrimination Act 1984. The administrative exemption expires, however, on 31 December 1997. Non-legislative options for dealing with this issue have been explored. However, these would have serious social or financial repercussions. Failure to take the action proposed would mean that complaints could be made under the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 once the existing administration exemption has expired. It is therefore necessary that this amending legislation be in place by the 1st of January 1998. So, Mr Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and present the explanatory memorandum. The debate must now be adjourned. Mr Speaker, I move the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made an order of the day for the next sitting. All those in favour say aye to the contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. Clark. Notice number four, Indigenous Education Supplementary Assistance Amendment Bill 1997. Parliamentary um, Secretary. Mr Speaker, I present the Indigenous Education Supplementary Assistance Amendment Bill 1997 and 
I give the clerk three copies. Clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Indigenous Education Supplementary Assistance Act 1989 and for related purposes. The Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I move that the bill be now read a second time. Uh, the bill provides for this government's commitment to two initiatives. The first is its commitment to lift the requirement for at least 10 per cent of enrolled students to be Indigenous before a non-government, non-systemic preschool, school or vocational education and training institution can be funded under the Indigenous Education Strategic Initiatives Program. The amendment leaves in place the requirement for there to be a minimum of 20 students in a non-government, non-systemic school and a non-government, non-systemic VET institution and for there to be a minimum of five students in a non-government, non-systemic preschool. These limits will avoid the administrative expense of providing small amounts of money to small numbers of scattered students. It will also avoid the situation where there will be little or no benefit to individual students from the provision of small grants. This amendment will enable institutions where there are significant numbers of Indigenous students, but these students represent less than 10 per cent of total enrolments, to qualify for funding under the Act. Experience has shown that the 10 per cent requirement has excluded some institutions from receiving supplementary funding in respect of their Indigenous students. The second amendment will permit the adjustment of grants under the Indigenous Education Strategic Initiatives Program in line with cost increases for the period up to 30 June in the year 2000. The appropriations for these years are in subsections 13 b, 4, 5, 6 and 7 in the Principal Act. Inclusion of a cost supplementation provision in the Principal Act will bring the program into line with other education programs. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum. Order of the debate must now be adjourned. I move the debate be adjourned, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order of the question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Notice number five, Aviation Legislation Amendment Bill number two, 1997. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Transport and Regional Development. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I uh, present the Aviation Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 1997. Clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend various acts relating to aviation and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, this bill contains several important amendments to five existing acts. The Air Navigation Act 1920, uh, the Airports Act 1996, the Air Services Act 1995, the Civil Aviation Carriers Liability Act 1959 and the International Air Services Com Commission Act 1992. The Air Navigation uh, Act 1920 amendments. These amendments concern the security screening of passengers boarding large commercial aircraft within Australia. The amendments represent a minor change to Australia's aviation security regulatory framework based on operational reasons. Currently, arrangements under the Air Navigation Act 1920 make individual aircraft operators responsible for passenger screening for certain domestic and international aircraft operations. The responsibility for segregating passengers who have been screened from those who have not also currently rests with the airlines. In larger airport terminals around the country, the favoured method for segregating screened persons before they board an aircraft is to screen into sterile areas. Sterile areas offer savings and security costs by minimising the required level of screening staff and equipment compared to screening passengers at individual gate lounges. With the increasingly commercial approach being taken by airport terminal operators to non-aeronautical revenue raising, more and more commercial activities, such as retail outlets, have been located within sterile areas where the departing passengers tend to congregate. These activities are controlled by the, operation, uh, the, by the operators of the passenger terminal buildings through the terminal operator leases and not by the airlines. The operation of these commercial activities, particularly the need to restock out of hours and some of the delivery practices for goods and services, do have an impact on the security of the sterile area. As a result, the government proposes to centralise the responsibility for sterile area access control and passenger screening into the one organisation. This will be achieved by making terminal operators primarily responsible for passenger screening at sterile areas. 
In summary, these amendments will ensure that airlines remain responsible for what is carried on on their aircraft and for passenger screening when a sterile, when a sterile area is not used to segregate passengers, ensure that airlines remain responsible for the segregation of their passengers between a sterile area approved under the new arrangements and their aircraft, make operators of terminals in which sterile areas operate responsible for access control and passenger screening, with the Department of Transport and Regional Development having the power to designate the sterile area and any conditions of operation, and finally ensure that these arrangements are sufficiently flexible to allow the Department to designate an airline or airlines or other persons with their consent to be responsible for passenger screening into a sterile area where local circumstances indicate that this would give better security outcomes. The Airports Act 1996 Amendment. The bill also makes a minor amendment to the Airports Act 1996 that allows fees to be levied under regulations made for the purposes of environmental protection at least airports. This will allow partial cost recovery of administrative expenses associated with processing administrative and other approvals under the regulations. <coughs> Air Services Act 1995 Amendment. Air Services Australia's primary function is to provide for the safe navigation of aircraft. This is essential in a large country with population centres separated by long distances. Australia's aviation industry plays an important role in providing rapid, safe and reliable communication links. It is one of Australia's key strategic industries. Air Services plays a vital role in this industry, providing essential air traffic and other services to all participants. Given Air Services' special position, the government believes it had a key role to play in encouraging and promoting the overall benefits of an efficient aviation industry. Air Services will continually review the services it provides to ensure it is meeting industry's genuine needs and is not placing impediments in the way of growth in the industry. To this end, Air Services must continually strive to provide its services by the most cost-effective means, at the same time structuring its pricing as far as practical to ensure industry participants are paying for the services they actually use. I need to emphasise, however, that the change to the legislation will not, in the government's view, require Air Services Australia to ensure the viability of any individual operator, nor will it require that the aspirations of any particular aviation sector be met. The Air Services Australia Board will be expected to take this objective into account in their strategic planning, and principally as such, and I'll be writing to the Chairman to this effect. The Civil Aviation Carriers Liability Act 1959 Amendment. This amendment will ensure that de facto spouses are included among the members of a passenger's family for the purposes of being eligible for the compensation available under the Act in the event of the passenger's death or injury as a result of an air accident. De facto spouses are currently excluded from compensation, and this is contrary to the Commonwealth's own policy and legislation relating to discrimination on the grounds of marital status. In National Air Services Commission Act 1992 amendments. Since this government came to office, capacity for international services to and from Australia has increased by 17 per cent over the accumulated capacity increases of the past 50 years. That equates to an additional 135 Boeing 747 scheduled services per week available to fly to and from Australia. Along with this massive increase in capacity available for Australian overseas carriers to service the Australian market, there has been a rapid increase in the sophistication with which Australian carriers have approached their operations overseas. Like many Australian businesses, Australian international airlines' future growth can be enhanced by operating effectively and efficiently in overseas markets. As part of this development, Australian carriers will be seeking to establish networks combining overseas markets into a potentially fully integrated service. Since 1992, when multiple designation of Australia's carriers on international routes was introduced, the International Air Services Commission has been allocating Australian capacity for services between Australia and other countries in a process that has been widely acknowledged as transparent, independent and equitable. While not a major uh, aspect of previous Australian uh, ca uh, carrier operations, the International Air Services Commission Act did, however, prevent the Commission from allocating capacity 
between points outside Australia available to Australian carriers under Australia's air services arrangements. The amendments in this bill will allow the Commission to rightly assume responsibility for this function from the Department of Transport and Regional Development in an orderly manner. This amendment represents the final step in ensuring the complete independence of capacity allocation from capacity negotiation and will provide certainty to Australian scheduled carriers by confirming the Commission's role as the single independent authority for allocating all rights available under air services arrangements. As the structural complexity of international air services increases and Australian carriers become more sophisticated in the way in which they apply allocations of capacity to particular markets, the Commission will increasingly be called upon to consider the nature of any cooperation between Australian carriers or between Australian carriers and foreign carriers and how that might affect the use of the capacity that the Commission allocates. The bill therefore provides additional guidance for the International Air Services Commission on what constitutes a joint international service for the purpose of allocating capacity without reducing the Commission's flexibility in their determinations. The bill also makes some technical amendments, including the removal of definitions of new and shelf capacity, which are now redundant, the inclusion of a provision to allow the Commission to revoke a determination at the request of an Australian carrier to whom that determination relates, and a new provision to ensure that the proposed amendments do not affect current operations between points outside Australia by Australian carriers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I present the explanatory memorandum to this bill. Order the debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Canberra. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the debate be adjourned. Order the question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Notice number six, carriage of goods by C, Amendment Bill 1997. The Parliamentary Secretary. Sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I present the carriage of goods by C, Amendment Bill 1997. Clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the carriage of goods by C Act 1991. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, the purpose of this bill is to implement a package of enhancements to Australia's marine cargo liability regime. The Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1991, which is often referred to as the COGSAR, deals with liability for loss or damage to sea cargoes. The package is the result of extensive negotiations with and agreement by all affected interests, shippers, cargo owners, carriers, ship owners, marine insurers, and maritime lawyers. Deputy Speaker, I seek leave to table the document which records the package of changes which maritime industry, industry, industry interests have agreed should be made to improve a marine cargo liability regime. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I thank the Shadow Minister. The COGSAR, Deputy Speaker, the COGSAR operates by applying as domestic law in Australia an international convention and several protocols collectively known as the Amended Hague Rules. However, the COGSAR also provides for the future possible implementation of an, of an alternative international convention known as the Hamburg Rules. The bill I've introduced to amend the COGSAR deals directly with two of the seven items in the industry package, the Hamburg Rules Trigger, now contained in the COGSAR, and with arbitration in Australia. The other five items in the industry package dealing with documents, coverage of importers, deck cargo, duration of liability and liability for delays will be implemented by regulations to be made under the Act. The Hamburg Rules trigger. The Hamburg Rules, although a more recent convention than the amended Hague Rules, have attracted very little support by major trading nations, including Australia's mating trading partners. The Hamburg Rules trigger was first due to operate on 1 November 1994. Prior to that date, there had been vigorous debate between the shipper interests proposing the implementation of the Hamburg Rules and the carrier interests opposing this. In November 1994, both Houses of Parliament passed resolutions to defer consideration of the question of acceptance 
or repeal of the Hamburg Rules for another three years. Following this resolution, an industry working group developed a compromise solution in which carriers conceded significant extensions of the protection offered to shippers in return for the removal of the automatic trigger for the Hamburg Rules. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to congratulate the industry interests concerned on the spirit in which this process was conducted. This bill implements that compromise solution developed by industry. At present, the automatic trigger provision will operate again on the 20th of October 1997 to bring the Hamburg Rules into, into force in the COGSAR, and action is therefore needed to prevent this. This bill will remove that trigger and the requirements for a resolution of both Houses of Parliament. In its place, provisions are inserted for the Minister to conduct a review from time to time of the desirability of bringing the Hamburg Rules into force in Australia. Provision for arbitration. Industry has concerns that under the existing legislation, arbitration has not been made available as an option for resolving disputes. The Act will now make it clear that arbitration in Australia does, offend section 11, does, not offend, I'm sorry, does not offend section 11 of the COGSAR regulation making provision. The bill includes a power to make regulations to implement the highly technical elements of the industry endorsed package dealing with a coverage of a wider range of contracts of carriage, including electronic documents by the COGSAR. B, providing coverage for importers in some circumstances. C, coverage of cargo agreed to be carried on deck in certain circumstances. D, extending COGSAR coverage from the current hook-to-hook -hook coverage to terminal-to-terminal -to -terminal coverage. And E, providing limited recompense for shippers' losses due to the delays, except where the delays are excusable delays according to criteria well understood in the maritime industry and which will be defined in the regulations. These changes will extend the protection which the COGSAR offers to Australian shippers, particularly exporters. The concepts behind these changes can be simply expressed. However, given the nature of international conventions, the modifications to the amended Hague rules to make these changes are technically complex and lengthy. Given the need not to overburden Parliament's business agenda, and recognising the resources of the Office of Parliamentary Council are under pressure, it is quite appropriate that such technical matters be handled by regulation. Accordingly, the bill includes a very precise regulation-making power, which will enable the subsequent drafting and making of regulations to implement these changes. <coughs> this might be regarded as a Henry VIII clause, uh, which is a clause that permits the making of regulations which have the effect of amending the operation of an Act. However, such clauses are used in Commonwealth laws regularly and enable the expeditious passage of legislation. The regulations are, of course, subject to disallowance and will be required by the Act to be made only after consultation with relevant industry stakeholders. Financial impact. While the amendments will enhance the operation of the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1991, they will have no impact on Commonwealth revenues or outgoings and no direct financial, financial impact on the industry. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present a copy of the explanatory memorandum. Order. The debate Sorry. must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Canberra. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Notice number seven, Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Amendment Bill 1997. The Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Minister representing the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, I present the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Amendment Bill 1997. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act 1976 and for related purposes. Minister. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the bill now be read a second time. Uh, the bill seeks to make an amendment to the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act of 1990, uh, 1976 
to ensure the effectiveness of subsection 52D of the Act, which prevents land claims over stock routes and stock reserves. Uh, the background to this matter is that the previous government entered into a memorandum of agreement in 1989 with the Northern Territory concerning the granting of community living areas to Aboriginal people in pastoral districts in the Northern Territory. As part of the agreement, the Commonwealth undertook to proclaim a 1987 amendment to the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act 1976, preventing the making of land claims over stock routes and reserves. Now, this amendment was made because it was never intended that stock routes and reserves should be available for claim. The amendment was proclaimed in 1990. Uh, however, it appears it may be technically deficient. The effect of the amendment as drafted is that while the claims cannot be heard by the Aboriginal Land Commissioner as a result of subsection 52D, they remain registered. Uh, this means there is some doubt about whether the Northern Territory Government can deal with the land. In 1995, the Commonwealth and the Northern Territory governments reached an agreement that an effective amendment be made in exchange for the Northern Territory accepting Commonwealth proposals for amendments to the Northern Territory's Pastoral Land Act 1992. The aim of these amendments is to expedite the granting of, Commonwealth of community living areas to Aboriginal people, particularly those being dealt with by the Community Living Areas Tribunal. Uh, this bill, once agreed to by Parliament, will conclusively eliminate stock route and uh, stock reserve claims by removing any doubt about the effectiveness of subsection 52D of the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act 1976. The amendments contained in the bill before the House will commence on proclamation with a 12-month limit on the time within which the proclamation is to be made. The intended proclamation period has been provided so that, in accordance with the 1995 agreement with the Northern Territory, the amendment can commence the same time as the Northern Territory's amendments to its Pastoral Land Act 1992. There are no financial implications arising from the bill, and I commend the bill to the House. I present the explanatory memorandum to this bill. Order. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Melbourne. I uh, move that the debate be adjourned, Mr Speaker. Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Order of the day number one, Australian National Railways Commission Sale Bill 1997, resumption of debate on the second reading. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Melbourne. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This bill is one of the more outrageous pieces of legislation that's been put before this parliament in recent times, not merely because it seeks, contrary to the election commitment of the new government, to privatise Australian National and also, incidentally, subsequently to privatise the government's holding in National Rail Corporation, not merely because it threatens large numbers of jobs and significant rail services, not merely because it is based on a gross exaggeration of the financial problems that Australian National is currently suffering, and not merely because it surrounds itself with an entirely fictitious $2 billion reform package which is almost totally comprised of existing obligations on the part of the federal government. What is particularly most outrageous about this legislation is the content of the legislation itself, because what it in effect does is empowers the two ministers named, the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Transport, to do whatever they like with respect to the future of the rail industry in this country. The bill, in effect, empowers the two ministers to sell, by their own decision, any assets of Australian National, to set up companies that can be used as halfway houses to transfer assets to private owners, to transfer the Australian National debt to the Commonwealth, to amend or repeal any acts of parliament, any acts of this parliament, or the transfer agreements between the two states involved and this parliament, and to wind up the Australian National Railways Commission. In effect, the parliament is being asked to hand over all of its powers with respect to the legislation surrounding the Australian National Railway system to the two ministers. It is being asked to completely abrogate any responsibility that it has for making decisions with respect to the future of the rail system without being told what the two ministers are going to do with these powers. The two ministers are in effect, and the government with them, saying, trust us, give us the power, we intend to flog off Australian National, we may sell it in bits, we may sell it as a single unit. We can't give you any guarantees about services. We can't give you any guarantees about jobs. We've got some general propositions in place, 
That's all the parliament's being told, and it is now being asked to simply give a carte blanche to the two ministers to do whatever they like. The opposition has a number of objections to the legislation, which I'll get to sometime later, uh, that are contained in a second reading amendment that I'll move at the end of my contribution. And we also intend to move a set of amendments in detail relating to the question of the future of the proposed track authority. But I'll deal first with the background to the situation that faces the parliament with respect to Australian National. In April of last year, the chairman of Australian National, Jack Smorgan, wrote to the Minister for Transport indicating that the anticipated loss of Australian National for the 1995-96 year that was, was $26 million was now anticipated to be somewhere over $100 million. Naturally, the minister sought to blame the former government and commissioned Mr John Brew to conduct an inquiry into the cause of this financial difficulty. The minister sought to make cheap political points about the number of job losses and line closures that had occurred in Australian National in the preceding 13 years, uh, naturally failing to point out that equivalent things had occurred throughout the state systems in other states over that period largely relating to changes in demand, changes in the freight task and also particularly changes in technology and productivity. So that in my own state of Victoria, for example, we've seen very substantial reductions in employment in the equivalent state system, similar to what has occurred in places like South Australia. The losses that were anticipated were not unusual in Australian national history. In fact, if we go back to the last couple of years of the former Conservative government, we'll see that in 1982-83, $106 million was the loss that Australian National recorded in that year, and in today's dollars that's roughly $192 million. In 1981-82, $73 million was the loss, and that roughly today is $146 million. So we've seen a pattern over a number of years where there has been a substantial subsidy from the Commonwealth to the operations of Australian National. It's varied from time to time, but it has generally been fairly substantial, albeit often nowhere near as substantial as rail is subsidised both in other, in other parts of the Commonwealth by state systems and also in other parts of the world. Generally speaking, direct government subsidisation to rail is the norm throughout most of the world, the reason being that the effective community subsidisation that goes to road, both through the direct construction of roads and the financing of roads and also through indirect costs associated with road trauma, pollution and the like, is very difficult to compare directly with the direct subsidisation that goes to rail. If we look at the more recent figures with Australian National, we'll see that in 1992-93, it had a bad year because of the recession. 93-94 was one of its best years for a long time. 94-95 was not such a good year, but not, not much worse than 93-94, and certainly better than some of the years it had in the early 90s. So for the last full financial year figures that the former government had available to it, Australian National was basically doing reasonably well relative to its history. In December 1995, the chairman had spoken to the former transport uh, minister, the honourable member for Kingsford Smith, who was told not that the organisation was in financial trouble, but rather that there were questions with respect to the current CEO and that the board wished to deal with these matters, which could potentially include dismissal. And the then transport minister indicated quite properly that the government was almost in caretaker mode, an election was pending, and that it would be more appropriate for such matters to be dealt with under the auspices of any new incoming transport minister and transport uh, administration. In the wake of these, the government then instigated the Brew Inquiry, which was essentially a very narrow accounting exercise that looked only at the balance sheet, in effect, for each of Australian National's businesses. It anticipated that the loss for the 95-96 financial year would be somewhere between $130 and $148 million. It identified the creation of National Rail in 91-92 as the key reason for the decline in Australian National's fortunes, which, I hasten to point out, a fact that the minister, of course, doesn't ever mention in the House, was ultimately forced on the former Labor government by the states. The former government wanted to have National Rail's functions as essentially part of Australian National, but the states refused to do so, and in order to create an integrated interstate rail system, which has achieved massive improvements in the uh, public sector deficit with respect to rail freight, the former government had to separate out national rail from Australian national. 
that then had an adverse consequence for the operations of Australian National because the bulk of its profitable activities were now part of another organisation. The Brew Inquiry recommended wholesale closures and sell-offs and made a range of fairly harsh recommendations based on very narrow consultations and a very narrow perspective on the overall operation of Australian National and the rail industry. No consideration was given to the nature of the rail task. No consideration was given to the role of rail in the overall transport network, the interaction between rail and other modes of transport. No consideration was given to the significance of community service obligations and the current operations of things such as the passenger services or the grain lines in South Australia. No serious analysis was made of the performance of management, something which particularly sticks in the craw of many AN workers. And no analysis was made of the merits of separating out all of the various components of AN's operations and of setting them up as separate businesses, following in a very popular management fad, which we can see throughout most of the private sector in recent times, and indeed in some parts of the public sector, of separating different components of an industry, particularly on a vertical basis, and establishing them as autonomous business units, with an attendant array of considerable transaction costs and complications that, in my view, mostly will cancel out or even negative, the, uh, even end up as an, as an overall negative relative to any efficiency gains that may be attained by that. As a result of Labor's return to order motion in the Senate, the Brew, Inquir Brew Inquiry report was forced public, albeit a slightly doctored version. And in the debate that followed, the Minister first claimed that the Labor Party in government did nothing about Australian Nationals' problems. And then, a day later, when the report had been released and Australian National had issued a press release calling for expressions of interest for the sale of substantial part of Australian's businesses, the minister then sought to blame this on the former government. So, in other words, on the one hand, the former government did nothing to address AN's financial crises, but on the other hand, when it became clear that AN was already moving to sell off substantial parts of its operations, this was blamed on the former government. Of course, it soon became very clear when a letter leaked from the, uh, the minister to the, the chairman of Australian National, dated August the 15th, it soon became very clear that the actions that Australian National were taking had been taken specifically at the request and instruction of the minister. The final blow to the credibility of the Brew report came in September of last year when it emerged that Mr Brew had, shortly after submitting the report, engaged himself in discussions with one of the front runners to buy parts of Australian National, the Great Southern Railway Corporation, uh, based on Macquarie Bank, with respect to possibilities that he may become a consultant. And in fact, the discussions had reached to a stage where Macquarie Bank and the Great Southern Railway felt that it was appropriate that they could advertise their prospective running of Australian National in the future, mentioning the fact that they would have the unique expertise of John Brew on board as a consultant. Clearly, although no agreement was finalised, Mr Brew obviously had it in his mind when conducting his inquiry that at the conclusion of that inquiry there would be some substantial opportunities for people with rail expertise to make a dollar out of the dismembering of Australian National. And as far as the opposition is concerned, that tainted the whole inquiry, and the inquiry really doesn't amount to a great deal in the overall perspective that we need to develop with respect to the future of the rail industry. Then we saw in November the reform package, as it's been dubbed in Orwellian language, from the minister, in which the minister announced the total privatisation of Australian National with respect to the mainline interstate track. It was originally all of the mainland track, but it's now the mainline interstate track on the mainland. That this could occur either as a totality or in pieces the government's ownership of its share of National Rail would also be included, even though that was not recommended by John Brew, and in fact was a good illustration of the government's hypocrisy on this issue, because Australian National was being sold, we are told, simply because its finances were in difficulty and that it needed private ownership in order to get it back on an even keel and that the government needed to get out of a potentially spiralling deficit with respect to rail. Yet, on the other hand, the government's share of National Rail was also going to be sold, even though National Rail was doing quite well, was roughly on target to achieve its five-year objective to a commercial break-even point, albeit with one or two problems on the way, but nonetheless doing quite well, and had, in the words of 
the minister's own department, improved the interstate transport, the rail transport freight deficit from $350 million in the early 90s to $50 million in 95-96. So the contradiction of the government's position was very strongly exposed by what it was actually doing. It was seeking to sell both, even though the NRC sale was not proposed by Brew, and even though the justification for selling AN was completely irrelevant and uh, not applicable with respect to NRC. The package that was put forward was almost totally fictitious. It included, for example, $580-odd million relating to superannuation. What did that reflect? When you actually went into it, what it reflected was that for many years Australian National has been fully funding its superannuation but paying its obligations into consolidated revenue, with the Commonwealth meeting its obligations from time to time. So, in other words, that $580 million was simply an existing obligation that the Commonwealth always had and always would have. Similarly, with respect to the debt, $780 or $790 million worth of debt, already a Commonwealth liability. The $50 million for the environmental cleanup. This was based on an estimate put forward by Australian National with respect to the total cost that would apply if all of its sites had to be cleaned up. In other words, in effect, if all rail operations were closed down, which would be the circumstance in which you would have an obligation for an environmental cleanup. In most cases, the contamination that this relates to is the sort of standard common or garden contamination you'll get with any form of industrial or transport activity with land, things like diesel spills and the like. And that $50 million uh, figure is clearly something that may never eventuate. Some of it will, but the total really is essentially an imaginary figure. In the course of this so-called package, there was no statement with respect to anticipated proceeds, a measly $20 million for regional assistance, no guarantee of jobs or services, and no requirement on the buyers to keep any part of the existing AN network operating. The $20 million that was specified for regional assistance was described by the Chief Executive Officer of the Spencer Regions Development Association, Mr Rod Nettle, who I understand is a former National Party candidate for Grey. He described the $20 million as, and I quote, a Laurel and Hardy show and, again, quote, 3,000 beach barbecue sets was about the net impact that that would have, particularly in places like the Iron Triangle and Port Augusta. This was made in submissions to the Senate Rail Inquiry. The minister claimed that the actual loss for Australian National was $250 million in 1995-96. First it had been anticipated to be $26 million, then AN suggested about $106 million, then Mr Brew suggested $135 to $148 million, but shock horror, it had actually blown out to $250 million. What he didn't tell us, and what he didn't tell anybody else, was that the bulk of this $250 million was in fact one-off asset revaluations that AN had undertaken over that period which have to be put in the account somewhere and do have some significance, but they are quite distinct from an ongoing deficit, because it's reasonable to suppose that if you've got a situation where there is an operating deficit of a certain level based on current revenue and current expenditure, that will continue in the future unless something is done to change the situation, whereas an asset revaluation is a one-off exercise that will not reappear in the deficit in the following year and the following year and the year after that. But, of course, none of this was mentioned. And, in fact, the actual operating deficit for AN in that year ended up being $69 million, $14 million higher than the $54 million that was the operating deficit in the 94-95 year. Not a great outcome. Not a fantastic result by any means. Certainly there were problems with AN, issues that needed to be addressed, but these were being grossly exaggerated by the minister in order to justify simply getting the Commonwealth out of rail, removing the subsidies that have been there for a long time under governments of both persuasion and simply abdicating any responsibility for the future of rail transport in this country. Since then, we've had the expressions of interest process and a number of organisations, both Australian and foreign, e expressing some form of interest in buying parts of Australian National. We've had various statements of general intention on the part of the government, but very little serious detail. And I'd suggest to the House that it takes one step back on this issue for a minute and considers an interesting contrast. 
The most recent major privatisation or total privatisation that we've dealt with, certainly in the transport area, has been the airport sales legislation. When you look at that legislation, it is very thick, substantial, very detailed, and it sets forward a framework with respect to the future operation of Australia's airports, the obligations of the new owners, and all of the regulatory structures that apply to that in considerable detail. Concerns about the environment, about noise, about the operations of airport owners vis-à-vis -vis the airlines, all of those issues, not perfectly, there are one or two things that weren't properly addressed, but certainly overwhelmingly all of those issues are dealt with. Yet in this instance, another transport privatisation, another thing that's of major significance to Australia's transport system, major significance to Australia's transport users, what do we have? We have a very small bill, a bill that in effect says the parliament empowers the ministers to do what they like. What in effect that amounts to is an outrageous abrogation of parliamentary sovereignty, something that uh, the uh, honourable minister at the table, of course, would have been great to, uh, would have loved to speak about from opposition, but no doubt has different views about now. But what in effect it means is that people, not only the opposition, but the independents, minor parties in the Senate, who are entitled to represent their constituents, to be part of a debate, to be part of decisions about the future of the industry, are in effect being told, you have simply got a situation where you are being asked to empower the ministers to do anything they like and write, simply sign off carte blanche to do anything they like with respect to the future of the system. And yes, there'll be a few dis disallowable instruments involved in that, but ultimately you're going to be in a position where your ability to make decisions with respect to detail about the future of the industry is being taken away. Labor's specific objections to the legislation, more particularly to what it doesn't deal with, what it doesn't address, are as follows, Mr Deputy Speaker. First, there is no reference to the establishment of the long-awaited Track Authority. It's had various names. It was going to be Track Australia under the former government. There is no reference to that at all. And the, effectively, the legislation empowers the two ministers to establish this authority without further reference to the parliament. So we've got a position where if this legislation gets through in its current form, and we'll be moving amendments in detail to prevent this later on this morning, but if this legislation gets through in its current form, the proposed National Rail Infrastructure Authority, which will manage the track, which will be retained in Commonwealth ownership, will be able to be established by this government with no further reference to the parliament. Decisions about the types of access regime that apply with respect to the use of the track, how it will be maintained, what sort of labour will be used, the types of funding arrangements, all of those things will be taken out of the jurisdiction of this parliament with no further potential for the parliament, for people who represent constituencies in the parliament to deal with those issues. It's more particularly significant that there is no reference to this proposal when we consider the recent budgetary arrangements that have been, or estimates that have been applied with respect to the track authority. The Labor government, with the honourable member for Kingsford Smith, in, uh, as Minister for Transport in 1995, committed itself to $370 million over five years for the track authority. This was reduced down to about $240-odd million in the budget of last year, and again this year to $185 million, although the minister seems to be a bit confused because he actually put out a press release saying it was $175 million. And an extraordinary example of how little there was for transport in this year's budget, he actually sought to make a virtue out of a vice and put out a press release proclaiming how wonderful it was that the government was going to set up a track authority, something that the government had previously announced, something that the previous government had previously announced, and something that he was now proposing to spend half, less than half, of what the former government was proposing to spend on. But he had so little to say, so little good news, that he had to turn bad news into good news. I don't think too many people were fooled by it. The, third, the, the second issue that there is a great concern on the part of the opposition, and I suspect other parties in this parliament, is that there are no details in this legislation with respect to the regulatory arrangements that will apply with respect to the operations of the rail system. Clearly there is a substantial difference, as there is in the airline industry, when you remove dominant public sector operation and replace it with private operation, you have to have a different regulatory regime. There are questions of train control operations, safety, access, all sorts of things that need to be dealt with. And again, the parliament is being told don't you worry about that. Leave that up to the ministers. We'll sort all that out. You don't have any entitlement to a say. The third issue that the opposition is concerned about is that there is no guarantee with respect to services. People in western New South Wales, for example, 
are worried, and with some good reason, as to the future of the Indian Pacific, which plays a very significant role with respect to communities such as Broken Hill Parks and the like as a major transport artery. Others are worried about the future of the overland, the GAN, and of course things like the grain lines in South Australia, the freight lines in Tasmania, and so it goes on. We're not being told anything. No guarantees about the future of these operations, no guarantees about the future of community service obligations. The opposition is also particularly concerned about a number of issues that apply with respect to the workforce of Australian National. No labour adjustment program. Some workers undoubtedly will get jobs with future private operators if the privatisation proceeds, but many won't. And if they're in places like Port Augusta, their ability to access training to ensure that they've got some chance of getting future employment in alternative areas is very limited and very costly without a labour adjustment program, such as the program that the former government put in place with respect to workers who'd been retrenched from Australian National, but this government cut and now refuses to do. There is no specific provision being made for most apprentices currently employed by Australian National, particularly people who are roughly in the middle of their apprenticeship. They're suddenly going to be left high and dry. No guarantees about their future, no guarantee that they'll be able to complete their apprenticeship and to complete the learning of the skills and the acquisition of the trade that they were taken on by Australian National to do. There is no detail about the future shape of the industry, the future role that the industry will play with respect to the overall transport picture and economic arrangements in Australia. There is no guarantee that predatory asset stripping will not occur, particularly in things like the workshops, where there are many private competitors and there is an a significant oversupply of workshop capacity. One of the risks that this government should be guarding against and the parliament should be concerned about is the proposition that another owner may buy one of those workshops, strip the assets out of it that it can sell or use and close it down. There are also, in recent weeks, two issues with respect to the entitlements of workers that have emerged which the government has failed to deal with which are of some considerable concern. Superannuation is one. The Australian National Principal Scheme, which was established seven years ago, does not have full vesting entitlements for workers who are deemed to have resigned. And in fact, I think it takes 15 years before you get the full vesting rights to the employer contributions. What that means, of course, is that it is impossible for workers who are in that scheme to get their full superannuation entitlements. But they're not resigning, even though they're deemed under the scheme to be resigning. They are being retrenched. They are being compulsorily retrenched, in effect. But they are being denied their full superannuation entitlements. And yet there is $4.5 million in surplus anticipated to be in the fund once all of these arrangements are completed. So that we're seeing somewhere in the vicinity of a third of the workers in Australian National who will be denied their full superannuation entitlements and at the same time the government, because it's the government that controls the decisions, is going to reap $4.5 million effectively out of their money, money that's been put aside by their employer for them for their superannuation is going to be taken by the government. That is outrageous. It's something that the government has known about for some time and has refused to deal with. And the final issue, which I'm still endeavouring to find out the, the full detail of, relates to a small number of people who have resigned on ill health workers' compensation after having been told that they would not get a redundancy. And then apparently Australian National has changed its mind and said, yes, people in that situation will be included in the redundancies, but not retrospectively. It would appear that there may be some people in the situation who, since the minister's announcement, have resigned and are now in a position where they're being told they won't get the redundancy, but those who are in the same situation who haven't yet resigned will get the redundancy. In effect, Mr Deputy Speaker, the government's saying, trust us, give us carte blanche, give the two ministers the capacity to do what they like, and don't you worry about that. They will make the decisions about the future of the industry. It's abundantly clear that they have no vision, no strategy, no plan for the future of rail in this country, no sense of how rail can play a substantial continuing role in our overall, trans overall transport arrangements. We disagree with privatisation of Australian <coughs> National. We don't support that. But our overall commitment beyond that issue is to the best available rail system with the most number of jobs, the best quality services, the greatest efficiency for the transport system in this country. And it's interesting to note that the Launceston Examiner, not necessarily renowned as a great supporter of the Labor Party, described our reasons for taking the response we are, are taking with respect to the legislation as reasonable. In fact, I'll quote from their editorial of May the 28th, Labor's declared reasons for deferral sound reasonable. And I think that says it all. The unions are opposed to the sale 
for similar reasons. The representatives of the workers have, in Australian National have put forward similar justifications. And the minister had the gall to stand up here the other day in question time and first say that I didn't have the guts to go to Port Augusta. Now, I was there to talk to the workers on Monday for the second time since this issue has emerged. The minister hasn't been there since he's been a minister. The, the former minister, the member for Kingsford Smith, he had the guts to front up there. He had the guts to go along when sometimes there was bad news, more retrenchments involved. He had the guts to go there and talk to the workers and explain the government's position. This minister won't. There's a rumour that he might be there in July. Well, that's been promised before. We'll wait and see. But that's right. He'll probably get a helicopter ride uh, from one of his mates uh, to go up there, as the honourable member for Batman uh, indicates. It's natural that some people in the workforce want this issue resolved. They have had enough and want to go. Others don't. Different people are affected differently. But the opposition is concerned that further delay may damage Australian national further, but let's ask where the delay is coming from. It's taken weeks for this debate to even occur. The government has not been able to organise its own schedule to get the legislation quickly to this House, and indeed the same will occur with the Senate. The process of bidding and discussions and expressions of interest has been prolonged. So what's happening now is, yes, there is delay, but it is being caused by the government. Labor has put out its position out into the public arena very early, indicated to the government that there are a number of issues that it should be addressing and is failing to addressing, and that the current legislation is completely unacceptable. The government has as yet failed to respond. We are throwing down the challenge to the government to address these issues, both the broad big picture issues with respect to the future of rail in this country and also, importantly, the specific issues that relate to the interests of the workers. At the moment, we have got a fire, a fire sale. We've got no plan, no vision for the future, no guarantees with respect to the future of services, no guarantees with respect to the future of jobs, no guarantees with respect to the future of those who can't get jobs and their capacity to retrain. And what we see is a situation where all of the other players, the unions, minor parties in the Senate and the Labor Party are all saying what we need is some detail of the government's plans, the capacity to address these issues, to actually play a proper role as a parliament, as representatives of the Australian people. At the moment, all we're getting is, trust us, carte blanche and abuse from the minister and absolute hypocrisy. This is one of the situations where the Senate and the parliament can exercise genuine accountability, can require accountability of government, and what this government is seeking to do is to effectively ask this parliament to abrogate its responsibility as a legislative body and simply hand over all power to make all decisions with respect to the future of the Australian rail industry to the two ministers without telling the parliament, without telling A and workers what it intends to do. I move the second reading amendment, which stands in my name, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order. Is the amendment seconded? The honourable member for Batman. Mr Deputy Speaker, I formally second it and reserve my right to speak. Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the honourable member for Melbourne has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Adelaide. Mr Deputy Speaker, it was said after the last election that Labor had lost touch with the battlers and was letting them down and misunderstood them. What we have just heard from the Shadow Minister for Transport is a true indication of that. He has said that workers support what Labor is doing. He is wrong. He, he has said that unions support what Labor is doing. They are wrong. Workers, union members and non-union members have contacted me in recent weeks and they have actually told me of the faxes that they have sent to the Shadow Minister for Transport. And I said to them, well, there's not much point doing that. There's, well, I can give you a lot more than that. I said there's not much point sending faxes to the Shadow Minister for Transport because I don't think he's going to let that on to anybody. And having heard what he said uh, this morning, he's painted an entirely different picture. Because Labor wants to go on in the same old way. Losses for 95-96 were likely to be around 150 million, with debts and liabilities exceeding 1 billion. And yet Labor would like us to go on the same old way. Over the 13 years that Labor was there, 7,000 jobs gone. The, rep the Brew report, commissioned by the government, has been most useful 
because it's told us lots. But we didn't have to rely on, um, on the Brew report. If we had only just spoken to the workers who have worked for AN, I've met some whose fathers and grandfathers have worked for, on the railways, as have others of my colleagues. But no, the member for Kingsford Smith, as recently as last as January, just a few days before the election was announced, was saying at the Islington workshops in my electorate that all was well, everything was on track, there was no, no need for anyone to be concerned. But this was at a time when uh, he had already signed off more, uh, more jobs to the dust heap. It was a time, of course, when he was uh, knowing that the election was about to be announced. So Labor's record with rail is absolutely disgraceful. And I think that uh, the shadow minister, who's quickly disappeared out, uh, out the door, would really know this. And there is no better example to give them the fact that there is no member of the Labor Party, of the opposition, from Tasmania or South Australia speaking on this legislation this morning. I think that is an absolute uh, example of why they know that they have been wrong, because no member from those states that are, both, that are most affected is prepared to come in here and defend Labor and defend the fact that they have said that they, are, um, they will um, block this in the Senate. Senators from Tasmania or South Australia will be doing their, their states no good at all by blocking this, no good at all, because rail has been on the decline, there are difficulties there. Governments just haven't managed it terribly well, and when the gov this government comes along after only 15 months in office and tries to do something, they want to spoil it. They'd rather stand on their record, their very hopeless record, than join us in a bipartisan way of seeing if something could be done to maintain a viable rail industry uh, for Australia and viable jobs for the people who are suffering from the lack of them. Now, the uh, member for Hotham, he's been to Port Augusta too. And he said on uh, that occasion, because I was there representing the Prime Minister, the member for Hotham said that Labor would stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Port Augusta. Well, they're hardly standing shoulder to shoulder with the people of Port Augusta over this, over this, when they... I can, I'm going to refer to what other people are saying in a moment, and many of them are from Port Augusta too, and many of them from uh, the Islington workshops. Of course, I questioned him at the time as whether he'd been standing shoulder to shoulder uh, with, the, Peter, with uh, the member for Kingsford Smith when he was signing off uh, more jobs to the, uh, to the dust heap from Port Augusta. Um, it is interesting, and uh, given some of the comments made by uh, the shadow minister, it's interesting to, and not too difficult to rebut them. Uh, towards the end of his speech he said that uh, there were problems with superannuation. But I can say that the government has already committed $112 million to refund redundancy payouts, as well as $580 million to cover superannuation and an extra $90 million to cover unfunded contributions such as leave. Now, then we come in here and hear these unsubstantiated claims from the Minister for, for Transport. It's an absolute disgrace. But to return to what, what others have been saying. Um, which the, uh, the shadow minister doesn't seem to want to believe, and in fact claiming that he has the support of the unions, and this is what I find most amazing, because in yesterday's uh, advertiser, the South Australian paper, the Public Transport Union State Secretary, Mr Rex Phillips, warned that any delay would cause, and I quote, unneeded heartache and grief for yeah, workers. Yeah, yes. Unneeded heartache and grief for workers. And that is certainly the, uh, the message that I have been getting from those workers as well. It might seem strange to some members on the other side that a Liberal member will be hearing more stories from union membership than they are themselves. And I have to say that I have enjoyed the trust which has developed between uh, me being able to represent workers from uh, the Islington workshops over a period of years and to know that when they ring my office that they are going to get uh, attention and, and uh, be given assistance. It is also uh, interesting to note transcript of an ABC radio interview in Port Augusta just in the last couple of days. and The shadow minister has actually claimed credit for visiting Port Augusta. There are people up there who thought he should have stayed away. The newsreader, for instance, and I quote, rail unions say they are worse off after the meeting with the Federal Opposition Shadow Transport Minister in Port Augusta on the future of Australian National. 
Lindsay Tanner has met about 50 workers. The federal opposition has threatened to block the sale of AN, but Len uh, Scharenberg of the Australian Workers' Union says that means no job guarantees for the workers. He says the opposition has turned its back on rail workers. This is the unions in Port Augusta. Len, and I quote, after a fair bit of soul searching, we, the majority of the workers in Port Augusta, had agreed to a sale. We saw that as, the, that as the best way to keep the workshops viable. And then to see our own people coming out and endorsing the blocking of the sale, it sort of left us with a bit of egg on our face. Later in the interview, uh, when he was asked if there was any point to the visit at all, he said, well, well, as I say, after a fair bit of soul searching, the majority of workers in Port Augusta had agreed to a sale. We saw that as the best way of keeping the workshops viable. And then to see our people coming out and endorsing the blocking of the sale, it sort of left us, left us again with a bit of egg on our face. So how are the workers feeling, he was asked. Len says, between a rock and a hard place. He then goes on, we can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, we must say as much as it hurts me, after Lindsay's visit here, it's even worse than it was before. Len continues later in the interview. Ah, oh, well, we're in the lap of the gods now, just in the lap of the gods. So much for Labor standing up for the workers, so much for Labor standing up for the battlers. They've been let down. They also feel, I quote again, that the situation has been to totally taken out of their hands. Now, could anyone believe a word then that the shadow minister has said after we've heard him in here today, claiming worker support, claiming union support? And uh, that has just been on the media record in the last couple of days. There are, of course, um, the faxes that I've had. And uh, he said, as he was walking out, interjecting that he'd had three faxes. Ah. Well, I'm just wondering, and I know he's after the leadership at some time in the future, but I'm just wondering if he's actually been honest enough to tell the, uh, the current leader of the opposition the messages he's getting. And uh, if Labor would like to change their mind and support this sale and stand up for the unions and the workers there, then I'm happy to provide them with all the faxes and all the letters that I've got here. And that doesn't, there's over 20 or 30 there, and that doesn't count any that have gone to, uh, to my colleagues. And I know that uh, the member for Gray has certainly had the same sort of uh, representations. Uh, I quoted in the, um, in the uh, appropriation debate a couple of these, but I might just do it again. This uh, letter is from um, a locomotive maintenance worker at the AM workshops. It is my belief that Australian Nationals should be sold because we, the employees, are sick and tired of being in limbo. Labor started the demise of Australian National with the introduction of the National Rail Corporation and are now extending the agony by blocking the sale of Australian National in the Senate. I think it is unfair to prolong the uncertainty and you urge you and your fellow ministers to do all in your power to allow the sale process to continue, with the sale taking place as soon as possible. I believe it is our only hope to some sort of future in the industry. I think that it would be fair and equitable that all Australian national employees be made redundant and that the choice of employment with the purchasers be left to the successful tenders and the relevant individuals. Another one from a locomotive electrical operator at Inslington. Can you ask the following questions of the opposition? Because I cannot possibly see any political mileage in the non-sale of a skeletal remain of Australian national. Question one. Why is the federal opposition opposed to the sale of Australian National when it was a Labor government that started the demise of Australian National with the introduction of the National Rail Corporation? Question two. Why doesn't the federal opposition allow the sale of Australian National so that we, the remainder of the employees, know where we stand so that we can plan our futures instead of being used as, political punching, as a political punching bag? Now, that's what the workers... That's what union membership of your, uh, supposedly your supporters, the people you've deserted, and no wonder they're communicating with a Liberal member of parliament because they know they're going to get better representation. They know that somebody will stand up in this place and put their case. And if the, the previous uh, Minister for Transport in the last government had gone and honestly consulted with them and acted on things, then there wouldn't have been any uh, need for a brew report because he would have been putting changes in action. 
then and we wouldn't. And the taxpayer be in such a mess, and the taxpayers uh, of Australia wouldn't be funding the debts that they are now having to. Because the history of government ownership of railways in Australia has seen a declining workforce, declining market share and spiralling debts. Government ownership has resulted in a political intervention in the rail industry to the detriment of its long-term viability and, as I've already demonstrated to you this morning, to the detriment of the workers. It has allowed government-owned rail operations to behave as monolithic providers of services, inflexible in their practices and unresponsive to the need of customers. The rail industry needs 10, 20 or 30 years planning, and this has not been achieved when short-term political ends have dictated investment decisions, rail operations and reform. Last weekend's Australian newspaper highlighted the problem of government ownership of rail, where the New South Wales Rail Union is opposing efforts to reform rail maintenance in New South Wales, reforms designed to achieve greater efficiency in rail. The involvement of the private sector in rail is not unique to Australia something, once again, that you didn't hear from the Shadow Minister this morning. But it has occurred and continues to occur, occur around the world, in Europe, the United Kingdom, the United States, in Asia and even South America and New Zealand. Evidence from all countries demonstrates that although the particular environments of each are different, the common threads of private sector investment, introduction of competition, provision of access has led to a, a revitalised uh, rail and new opportunities in that industry. Countries where the private sector have become involved in taking over Moribund rail operations have seen old lines reopened, new lines constructed, foreign uh, tonnages, uh, freight tonnages increase, new rail jobs created, private sector investment in track and rolling stock, and a much greater focus on customer service. As I have already demonstrated to you this morning, Labor's party the Labor Party's history of ownership of AN is appalling. Job losses, line closures, freight lost, a massive spiralling debt. And Labor told AM, the AM workforce that all was well and that they would have jobs in the future. And yet the Labor Party secretly signed off hundreds of rail jobs and approved the business plans that would see further service reduction and job losses. Yet the AM Commission itself knew that this was not true, and the Chairman advised Minister Sharp on his coming to office. The Minister, as I've mentioned, commissioned the Brew Report to reveal the true position. 7,000 jobs gone in 13 years, 50 per cent of the South Australian rail network closed and ripped up, a $1 billion debt with no way of servicing it, passenger rail services to Mount Gambia, Borough, Peterborough, Port Augusta, Wyala and Broken Hill all closed, a reduction in the frequency of the Indian Pacific services and the closure of the Trans-Australian Rail Service a train that operated Adelaide, Perth and supplemented the Indian Pacific, which operates Sydney, Perth. The Brew report revealed that, I, that uh, AN, an AN employee was being subsidised by the taxpayer by $30,000 per annum, and with this uh, increasing to $220,000 per annum if nothing was done. But Labor today says they don't want us to do anything. Business levels were decreasing and there was no way AN could cover its cost. It was technically bankrupt. The report revealed that the way the Labor Party had set up National Rail was the cause of much of AN's problems. National Rail was given all the best assets and the revenue generating inter interstate business, and AN was left with all the debt and no possibility of repaying the debt. AN was doomed from the day National Rail began, as Senator Collins is quoted as saying in the Senate Reference Committee in the hearing uh, in Adelaide and Port Augusta. Port Augusta. Now, the government announced a $2 billion reform program to fix uh, these problems. And the government is selling Australian national its shares in uh, national rail and is setting up a national track authority to bring single management to the interstate standard gauge network. It is supported by AN workers, as I've uh, explained to you this morning. It is supported by a petition to the Senate signed by 120 workers of Australian national at Port Augusta. It is supported by the customers of Australian National, and uh, I've got letters to support that. It is supported by the South Australian Tasmanian governments. It's supported by the Australian Rail Association, the peak rail industry body with over 80 members. It's supported by Rail 2000, the lobby group in South Australia. It's supported by AN Commission and Management itself. It's supported by National Rail. 
And uh, as I've also said, evidence around the world supports private sector enterprise investment. Now, uh, Labor, of course, and as you've heard from the Shadow Minister this morning, wouldn't uh, have you believe any of that. They uh, are delaying the 20 million uh, rail reform transition program that benefits will bring to rural uh, South Australia, the metropolitan northwestern suburbs of South Australia, that $20 million uh, for the creation of long-term sustainable jobs. No little barbecues, no, little, no programs that somebody goes in, comes out the other end after six months and still no job. Programs that will lead to long-term sustainable jobs. And I've been chairing some consultative meetings over that and I'm a member of uh, that state uh, committee looking at that as well. And I know the quality of many of the submissions that have been put up. Most of that first round of $10 million goes to the Port Augusta region, but $1.5 million will be available to the northwestern suburbs, some of which are in my electorate, and where people there will benefit from that. But it will be held up. Those programs will not go ahead. They will not stand a chance, because that, that uh, first mi uh, round of $10 million will not be available until after this uh, uh, sale legislation is passed. So if Labor and Democrat and independent senators wish to do, uh, do in South Australia and do in Tasmania, then they know uh, what course of action they can take when this legislation reaches the Senate. Um, and of course, the Senate did have a um, the Senate did have a committee uh, of inquiry, and it was interesting to note some of the things that were uh, that were said there. Uh, Senator Collins, as I've already mentioned, uh, was quoted as on uh, what had happened to Australian National uh, when um, National Rail was set up. The colourful uh, um, Mayor of Port Augusta, Joy Baluk, who stands up for, uh, for her city, had things to say as well. And she couldn't believe that any, uh, any senator would, uh, would be dumb enough, I think was the word she used, be dumb enough to be blocking this sale. And Senator Collins asked her if, how many senators she knew. Her quote was, well, I know you, dear. So, uh, from, uh, from the city of Port Augusta, strong words of support, many letters, many faxes, editorials, media, workers want AN sold. From uh, the workshops at Islington and from the workers and from the unions who speak to me, obviously, more frankly and uh, more frequently than they communicate uh, with, uh, with the Labor Party, that party that's meant to be supporting them. Strong, strong, strong support for the sale of Australian National. I would have thought, after Labor's record of 13 years, they could join us in doing something about this. Because if there aren't problems solved, there will not be a, vial, a viable rail industry. And rail is important. As my colleague, the member for Grey, has told this chamber before, rail has a proud history. It helped open up this country. As I've said, I've met workers whose fathers and grandfathers have worked on the rail. They've got to be given a chance. We must look at ways of doing thing dif things differently. If there's been failures in the past, there is no point in going on the same old way and having one more failure, one after another. Now, I'm calling on all parties to get together on this, to do the decent thing and, su and support the sale of Australian National. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. And I call the honourable member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I listened with interest to, to many of the crocodile tears that uh, have flowed from the from the mouth of the uh, or from the eyes rather of uh, the member for Adelaide, as I've heard her similarly speak in respect of the car industry. Order, <coughs> member for Mitchell. I beg your pardon. The member for Shortland will ignore the member for Mitchell and address his remarks through the chair. Please continue. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. But uh, just let me say that uh, the, the history of Liberal National Party government's inspector rail services in this country is a very shabby history. And if the honourable <coughs> member for Adelaide wants to refer to losses incurred by AN as her opening gambit, let me remind her that uh, when we come into government in 1983, the loss incurred in the previous year by the Australian National Railways Commission, which at that time embraced all of its services, from Kalgoorlie across to Broken Hill, and from, from uh, Alice Springs down to Darwin, down to Adelaide rather, and all of the 
country rail services in South Australia, its loss in today's terms was $192 million. The AN she's referring to now are the remnants that are left after the mainline operations were taken out to be absorbed into the National Rail Corporation. So that what we're looking at is the result of the formation of the National Rail Corporation, which was strongly supported by those opposite when in opposition. So they can't have it both ways. But if you're going to make comparisons, please make comparisons on a like basis, not on a selective basis. And she refers to uh, the performance of the government railway systems, as did the minister in his second reading speech. And he opened up with these words, Mr Deputy Speaker, Australia's national operations, in common with many other government-owned railways, are characterised by a large and increasing debt and a declining market share. The performance of rail stands in stark contrast to the road transport sector, which has been very successful in addressing customer needs and therefore increasing its market share. That is cynical. It's dishonest. It doesn't present the picture. And whoever drafted those words knew when they drafted those words they did not present to this parliament an accurate picture of what constituted AN or the problems with AN as the segments that were left following the formation of the National Rail Corporation. AN's operations were, as I said, that, those sectors that were left and those assets that were left, knowing full well the National Rail Corporation and that the revenue-earning revenue -earning sections had been taken out and placed into the National Rail Corporation, had been removed. And he should not demean all railway people in performance of the decisions made by the this parliament and by the people who manage those organisations. In the case of AN, certainly the staff at AN, like all other railway people, are a proud people. And in the railway industry, where there is generation upon generation upon generation from last century of people working in the rail system, they have good right to be proud. They were the people who developed much of this nation albeit they destroyed the horse-drawn transport industry and the riverboat industry and, in many ways, the coastal shipping industry. But they were the state-of-the-art transport system in their time. And that generation upon generation of service is a very proud service. And I've sat in the dust and talked to the people in Port Pirie and in Port Augusta <coughs> and in Peterborough and in Wyala on numerous occasions in the past. I very much understand and feel for those people but what we're seeing in this situation, which is being quite cynically exploited by this government, is that you have people who have had disappointment upon disappointment, who see no future with this government for a publicly owned rail system, and they see the sale and getting out and taking a redundancy package is their only hope of getting some way out and some way into the future. So that's been very carefully exploited by the previous speaker and by this government in the, sub, in the contributions that have been made by the previous minister, by the minister, I'm sorry. Now, if you look back to when the rail system was formed, Australian National, it followed on from the 1975 legislation and then from national party ministers from 1975 through to 1983 that were responsible for the administration of the Australian National Railways Commission. Their record, as I said, was a very shabby record. But if you turn to then the, the, the role that was played by that rail system, I mean, to put things in their proper perspective, if you see the posters of the Trans-Australia line advertising their travel, uh, they read something like uh, Trans-Australia, uh, see Australia in comfort, save days, uh, travel Trans-Australia. Uh, we've gone from that to where we go in three and a half days to get to the west now, and three and a half hours to come back by air, three and a half days by rail, and three and a half hours return by air service. So the world has moved on, and in nature of the services have been moved on. But what is wrong about this legislation? There's two fundamentally things, two fundamental things wrong with it. One is the power that's being passed, if were this legislation to pass through the Senate, to the Minister for Transport and the Minister for Finance to virtually do as they will in respect of assets of the organisation and the formation of the National Track Authority. The second is there is no national strategy. I mean, it is not good transport planning to be considering formation or disintegration of a rail system to the exclusion of all other forms of transport. And there's no better 
no better source to go to than that other than the current, uh, or the, rather the recent Senate uh, Committee report, the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References uh, Committee, their report on the Brew report, and their recommendation on page 60. The committee therefore recommends that before proceeding with the sale process, the government should develop a coherent land transport policy framework, taking into account financial, economic, social and environmental goals, and recommending mid- and long-term investment programs for road and rail in all major corridors. It's a current recommendation, avoided completely in this parliament and by this government. Let me go to the, then to the report from the National Transport Planning Task Force of 1994, recommendation two. Page Roman 7, 8. Road, rail, port and airport infrastructure investments and their funding arrangements should be considered within a framework that allows intermodal, network and corridor considerations to be evaluated transparently. And it goes on, and I'll come back to this a little bit later. But there is the best report that's been done on transport needs and the establishment of a proper transport strategy no, in this nation's history. And it's current. It's right across the three forms of transport. It's not being picked up in this legislation. There's no regard had to its recommendation or to, or to its content. And then we can go, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the meeting of this morning's uh, uh, tra uh, Communications, Transport and Microeconomic uh, Reform Committee. And the terms of reference have been handed to us by the Minister. And the terms of reference for an inquiry into the role of rail and national transport network. And item one of that says, we're asked to inquire into and report, how current administrative, institutional, operational and pricing arrangements can be improved to promote effective and efficient use of the national rail network and to investigate the role of the Commonwealth and the States Territories in achieving consistency in these areas. Two, the opportunities to increase the participation of the private sector in the rail industry. Three, the opportunities to maximise access to and utilisation of the rail network. Four, effective investment and ownership arrangements for the rail network. And five, characteristics of international best practice in rail operations. So Mr Deputy Speaker, that's the current recommendation and that's the inquiry we're about to embark upon. But this legislation precedes all of that. So this is really, from this government, the blind leading the blind. It's a bit of a stab. They see an opportunity to exploit. They've misrepresented the situation in respect of AN. And to talk about AN's losses and the fabricated figures and selective use of information by the minister and by that uh, documents that have been circulated, and particularly by Brew, and Brew had a vested interest, which was what was disclosed, and he's had to withdraw. Now that wasn't his report. In my view, was not a report of integrity, was not a report of impartiality, and it wasn't a report designed to present the most accurate position and a position to the best interest of this nation and to this parliament. So when you look at all of these things. You can see that what the government's doing is going for a quick fix, and it's opportunistic. But take, let me look at it again from a broader view in what's best for Australia and what should be happening in this situation. And if we talk to the, no, turn to the transport shares again to the National Transport Planning Task Force report, and we see that in 1988-9, which were the latest figures available then, on a weight basis, rail carried 23% of the transport task in this country. Road 74 per cent and C 3 per cent. And that's out of a total task of 1,337 million tonnes of goods or freight transported in that year. But when you go to a, a weight distance basis, rail's share goes from 23 per cent to 32 per cent. Road drops to 33 per cent because most of road is short haul. It's metropolitan, intra urban, intra region. And C is 35 per cent. C goes from 3 per cent on a weight basis to 35 per cent on a weight distance or ton kilometre basis, and a total task of 257 billion net ton kilometres. And when you turn to value, it all changes again, because it comes back to road then that 73 per cent of the expenditure on transport in that year 88-9 was with road. 19 per cent with rail, 6 per cent with C, and 2 per cent with air. Now, that's the foundation of transport within this nation, the analysis of it, and this legislation ought to be legislation that sets the arrangements for what will give us the best integrated transport 
set of arrangements for this country, not just opportunistically plucking out some information to deal with it uh, on a budgetary basis to the exclusion of what is best for Australia. Now, the other thing that worries me greatly about all of this, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that here we see in this government's ideology, and the ideology is in, the second, in that second reading speech of the Minister again, it says to a large extent, referring to AN's losses, to a large extent the situation reflects the fundamental problems arising from government owning and operating business that are more efficiently conducted by the private sector. That is bunkum. It is total misrepresentation, and I'm sure it wasn't written within the department. That's straight out of the minister's office, those words. Because it isn't the ownership that's the problem. That's straight ideology. It's the nature of the system and the remnants of what was the Australian National Railways Commission and its interstate operations. But when you look at the ideology now wanting to sell this off, whatever it is, sell it. Now, that's the policy of this government. If you can get a buyer, sell it, based on that ideology that anything that's government owned and operating business are more efficiently conducted by the private sector. Well, ask some of the shareholders, I mean, ask some of the bond shareholders, Alan Bond companies, that bit of ideology. Run through the stock exchange. Ask some of the shareholders of some of the other companies at the moment on the stock exchange. But you have a look at all of that and see about the private versus public. But what concerns me, what concerns me, and this is my view, what concerns me is this, is that when you look at the nature of the transport task around the world and look at rail, that in the United States, you know, the mecca of free enterprise, in the United States there are two main rail operators in the west and two main rail operators in the east. And what's happening with rail transport is the growing provision of point-to-point -point services, door-to-door -door service. The European Commission is following the same thing, so there's an integrated service. You transport from a place in one nation to another place in the same nation, from a place in one nation to a place in another nation. So you have that seamless transport system. It's all linked together, that one service being provided. And to do that, in those two largest markets, they're looking at growing integration of rail systems to get the economies of scale, the efficiencies of management, the reliability of service and, as I said, the efficiency of service. That's so important, reliability and efficiency. What's happening in this country is it's being fragmented with a market that's a Mickey Mouse system in comparison to the United States and to the Europe. In a market that's a Mickey Mouse system, it seems this government has determined to make it a Minnie Mouse system by fragmenting it into smaller and smaller bits. Now, sure as night follows day, later there will be a reconsolidation of rail systems in this country. It will go back into being a larger system because that's where the efficiency is going to come from and the reliability of service is going to come from. So I have a great fear about the direction being followed. From this government, it's simply ideology. And then when we turn to, to what should be happening, I've explained my concerns about a micro series of micro systems when the world is moving to larger, more efficient systems. But this situation in this country will be further exacerbated because what's happening is this government has a policy of opening up Australian coastal shipping to foreign shipping. Now, the effect of that, Mr Deputy Speaker, is this that the cargoes that are being lost to foreign ships operating between Australian ports isn't so much cargoes from Australian flagships, they are cargoes from the National Rail Corporation. It's railways land and land transport cargoes that are being lost to foreign ship owners and to foreign third world seafarers. So again, this government doesn't have a transport strategy, it's operating on this issue in isolation, it's not taking into account other domestic forms of transport and the prospects of integration, but it also has another policy in respect of shipping that is damaging and has for several years been damaging the Australian railway industry. So the target of the third world seafarers and the foreign ship owners isn't so much the Australian coastal shipping scene, it's hitting the National Rail Corporation. So effectively what we're seeing, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I know you understand this, 
effectively what we're seeing, that Australian railway workers are being replaced by third world seafarers. And if you look at an analysis of the cargoes being carried under single voyage permits, and there are already 288 being granted, I think, in the first half of 96-97, which is looking towards a figure of well over 500 for the 96-97. If you're looking at that and have a look at the cargoes that are being carried, they are essentially cargoes from east to west, containerised, break bulk, not cargoes that are being carried by coastal Australian vessels, which are mostly bulk cargoes. So here is the government's own shipping policy flying in the face of what purports to be its rail policy. And that's why, Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the amendment that's been put forward by the Shadow Minister, the member for Melbourne. The House declines to give the bill a second reading until such time as the government, government develops a coherent policy uh, for the Australian railway industry. And the government reaches agreement with Australia, South Australia and Tasmania on the funding assistance for the development of their rail infrastructures. Remembering that Tasmania, the, system, the rail system, is a fundamental part of their land transport system down there. And the, the, the amendment I'll come back to in a moment, but what that again is underlining, this government doesn't have a transport strategy. It has something it wants to do in rail, in this case, in this legislation based on ideology. It has something it wants to do, again based on ideology, in shipping, because it hates the membership of the Maritime Union of Australia. It can't lift its blinkers to see that all of the wiser countries in the Western world are looking to expand their shipping industry because they recognise the value in jobs and financial turnover that comes from all the shore-based industries that are associated with your own flag shipping industry, Mr Deputy Speaker. But then the amendment goes on. We say that in number four of the government guarantee, until the government guarantees existing passenger service operations and concession arrangements. Next, that the government guarantees the employment and training of apprentices currently employed by the Australian National Railways Commission until the completion of their contracts. And six, until the South Australian and the Tasmanian government have put in place safety and regulatory arrangements for the rail industry. And seven, that the Australian National Railways Commission demonstrates that all employers that have left the Australian Nationals on 24 November 1996 as a result of work-related illness or injury have been offered a redundancy payment. And the last part deals with the vesting of employer contribution to employees that have left or leave Australian National after 24 November 1996. Now, there are groups of employees, as the Shadow Minister mentioned earlier, that are not being fairly dealt with in this legislation. And hopefully the legislation will be amended in the Senate to make sure that those people are properly dealt with and they do get a fair go. And then <clears throat> the other thing that is of great concern is that in the case of the in the case of the powers being passed on to the ministers by this legislation that they are then not accountable to the parliament, they're not accountable, and that they will have a power that I think is unprecedented. So when we turn back and conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, with the National Transport Planning Task Force, and I recommend this to members to look at it because it, it considers what is the best system of transport services for Australia, the nation. And it points to the need to improve the efficiency and the linkages between roll, rail and road and sea. And then it also points out that nothing much has changed. I mean, rail has a natural advantage in about 40 per cent of cargoes. Road has a natural advantage in about 40 per cent of cargoes in their respective areas of land transport. And there's about 20 per cent that's left to compete in the middle. So Order. overall, we want to the see a system that is integrated as a whole. The uh, question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Richmond. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise today to speak in, uh, in favour of the government's policy of the AN sale. And I would like to take up a number of points, if the Member for Shortland happens to remain in this chamber, on some of the comments that he made. Uh, one of the comments that I think should be corrected is this, this notion that this is ideology. And it was quoted by him that we're selling everything. Uh, well, it's interesting that some of the greatest asset sales happened under the previous government, whether it was Qantas, whether it was the Commonwealth Bank, which they promised on numerous occasions to their workers and that they would not sell it, whether it's Commonwealth Serum Laboratory. Uh, he talks about the, the reforms in the waterfront. I mean, an enormous amount of money was spent on the waterfront reforms, and today our container rate of shifting is still lower. And indeed, the government's strategy of a 
of a more efficient rail system will lead to greater efficiencies that would lead to greater tonnage coming off roads, onto rail and from ships to rail. This package is part of the two billion package uh, and it's the beginning. The AN sale is the beginning, then moving on to national rail. And indeed the problems with AN today have been created by the previous government when they took out most of the valuable freight assets and put it into national rail. And that is why we have a situation today that we have to address. And it's interesting that, as previous speakers have mentioned from the coalition, that the unions support it, that the locals support it, that the papers support it, that the communities support it, and indeed it just highlights that the ALP are very much out of touch. This package, which is this two billion package, 325 million, of course, goes to the AN restructuring. There's 50 million, which goes to environmental work to clean up potential sites. 800 million in, uh, in retiring debt. So the future buyer of AN, whether it's a whole or whether it's components of it, uh, will be unencumbered. There's obviously a large portion, which is the superannuation, 580 million, and 90 million unfounded, which is very different uh, from what uh, uh, Mr. Lindsay was saying in this parliament. And indeed further investment of $175 million in track access. The whole purpose is to develop a system that gives greater competition, greater flexibility, gives long-term job security and gets the politics out of rail, which has dominated the industry since Federation. And the facts are that it was the ALP that left, and the member for Kingsford Smith, who I'm delighted is in the chamber, that left AN in this troubled at the moment. And so this sale is concentrating on the assets of AN in South Australia and of course Tasrail. And as has been mentioned before in the Brew report, the Brew report which came out, and I might add he did not have a vested interest, as was previously the uh, previous aspersion by the member for Shortland, that when AN when NR was established, all the profitable routes were taken out of AN and it was left with unprofitable routes, an enormous debt, an uncompetitive passenger service, uh, and even as Senator Collins said, it was doomed from the very day the plan was cooked up. And he should know, a member of the Northern Territory, which has still been trying to connect that line from Alice Springs to Darwin. And it's interesting when you look back in history at AN and these crocodile tears that are coming from the opposition, that 7,000 jobs were lost in 13 years under Labor. And the losses, if nothing was done, would continue, or well, this year I should say, it's 150 million from 95 to 96. And in South Australia, there's now with AN, there's $1 billion worth of debt. Indeed, passenger services have diminished. Many lines have been closed, whether it's to Mount Gambier, Augusta, Wyala, Broken Hill, and of course there is a far less frequent service of the Indian Pacific. Unless we do something now, it'll be a basket case, and there'll be no hope for those people in South Australia and regional areas. And indeed, the sale of AN is an integral part for the future rail reform of this Australia, of, of Australia. If AN was to continue in its current format, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at the moment it's a 30,000 debt per annum per employee, and on current forecasts. That would move to 220,000 per annum in the next couple of years if we did nothing. It would be irresponsible for this government not to make the hard decisions that it's made, and it is even more irresponsible that the opposition, in this blatant, uh, opportunic, opportunistic blocking of legislation, when even their own workers want it. The sale of AN to the new purchaser, where there's been over 50 registered interests will either be as a total vertically integrated components or it can be broken up into parts. It may well be the three passenger trains, which are the GAN, the Indian Pacific or the Overlander. It may well be just the workshops at Wyala. It may well just be TAS Rail, which has worked quite well, or it may well be some of the intrastate tracks in that particular state. But when you look back at the history of AN, as I mentioned before, it was left in this deplorable state because all the valuable assets were ripped out of it and put into NR. 
And the membership of Shortlands that stands up here and says that NR is a great success. Well, it's carrying less freight today than it was a year ago. And if you talk to the private operators who use that member for Shortland, whether it's SCT, whether it's TNT, whether it's Patrick's, it's got worse. And at the end of next year, when this agreement unwinds, and let's hope the New South Wales government, who have been dragging the chain on this, comes to the party, it will be unwound and it will be sold. Because the deal you put together for National Rail, the deal you put together for National Rail is where the Commonwealth has 73 per cent of the equity but only 49 per cent of the voting rights. We never had a chance from the day one. But let's look back at the history of rail. And of course, we've had five states who've, had, uh, who've been rail players. And part of the problem when you go back to Federation is that we had three different networks. We had the narrow gauge, uh, which is predominantly in Queensland. We had the uh, standard gauge in New South Wales and WA, and of course, broad gauge in, um, in uh, Victoria. And so there were numerous problems as we built the steel highway that created problems for this country and which naturally have been superseded in many areas, whether it's with road or whether it's with air or indeed sea freight. The Trans-Australian Railway was completed in 1917, which linked from Perth through to Adelaide and which opened up the west and that was one of the, the, uh, one of the carrots that got Western Australia into the Federation. And indeed it was the Labor government uh, in, in the 1970s under Whitlam that actually tried to buy back the rail systems into a Commonwealth system and of course only South Australia and only Tasmania came to the party. And that's why we're trying to sort out that problem now. If all of them, the players had come together, maybe it would have been different. But AN is the smallest of the rail operations in Australia. It has a track of about 6,151 kilometres of track, capitalised around about 1.5 billion and moves about 12 billion worth of, of, of tonnage. Uh, V-Line uh, has around about the same amount of track, 5,670 kilometres, which is in uh, Victoria. Uh, moves a smaller amount of freight. Uh, of course, West Rail has the same amount of kilometres, about 5,411 kilometres, uh, capitalised at 6.2 billion. Then moving to New South Wales with the old State Rail Authority, which has now been split up, about 8,000 kilometres of track, capitalised at 15 billion. And the big one, of course, is in Queensland, which is almost up to 10,000 kilometres of track, uh, capitalised at 26.5 billion a vertically integrated railway organisation. And what is terribly important that what this government is trying to do is to build an integrated transport policy, particularly with rail. And the beginning of this is the privatisation, is the sale of AN so we can get greater competition, greater flexibility, better services, lower costs and more viable. And it doesn't cost the taxpayer an enormous amount of money and it gives hope to those communities, particularly in South Australia and Tasmania. Because the importance of rail, there were some salient points made by the previous speaker, but rail still accounts out of capital city areas, it still accounts for 56 per cent of the non-urban land freight. It is still the king of, king of freight outside of capital cities, relative to trucks, which is 44 per cent of land freight. But what has to be done, though, like the trucking industry, which is seamless, which is reliable, we have about 20,000 operators, which is good for short haul, there has to be greater competition put in for rail. Just as has happened overseas, and as I'll illustrate in a number of other countries, particularly in New Zealand. Some of the success stories are West Coast Rail, which is in Victoria, which is now running on a private line there where they have increased services to Warrnambool and a number of other regional communities. But they still have difficulties, and particularly the interstate operators who are in a partnership, um, some of them with National Rail and some of them not. They still have to go through 13 different authorities to move goods from the port of Fremantle or from Perth through to Adelaide and through to Melbourne. It is inefficient. And to think that the previous member was standing up here and uh, espousing the efficiency in the claims of national rail is quite frightening considering that he was the previous Minister for Transport in an earlier period of this country's history. The ALP's position, particularly with One Nation, they directed an enormous amount of money, perhaps with the best of reasons, into rail. They built crossing loops, 
Unfortunately, the crossing loops they built are too small now for super freighters that are coming from, uh, from Brisbane to Sydney. They didn't address the problems of congestion, particularly with freight trains in Sydney, where the rail links all hub into that area. They did do some positive things. I'll hand them that. The, the, uh, the, the uh, standard gauge that went from Melbourne through to Adelaide was a positive move. But the facts are that when they created this beast called National Rail, they saw it as their salvation, and it just hasn't stacked up. And this government has to clean up that and to build not only to have some viable private operators, but to also have a national access regime, track access regime, and that's what we're building towards. When you look at the overseas experience, and it's interesting we look at the United Kingdom, that prior to 1948, all the railway systems for that country for 120 years, which is built after the Industrial Revolution, were actually privately owned. And they worked well. Of course, uh, in the, uh, straight after the war, when the, when the Labor Party was put back into office, they privatised, they nationalised it all. And that's been the case until recently where it has been privatised. And it has worked well because the key elements of safety, of reliability, are lower cost and frequency of service. And this is where rail has not been able to compete principally in freight and also in passenger services in this country. When you look at New Zealand, which had a, a, a government-owned railway until recently, it was privatised, Transrail, as it is now called. A uh, large equity holder is a major US operator called Wisconsin. They came into it. Uh, the usual uh, fears were, were uh, voiced, but today there's a 15 per cent increase in passenger numbers. Instead of making enormous losses, they're making good profits and they're actually building more track and expanding their services and trains are running more on time. That's what privatisation has done for rail in New Zealand. And indeed it's the same case in the United States now, where most private operators there now are moving huge amounts of freight, where they have intermodal ports, where you have road and rail access, where it is seamless, where it doesn't matter how it's transported from A to B as long as it gets there on time, and that's where they have been successful. And that's exactly the vision that we want to do for this, for Australia with rail. And that's why the sale of AM is critical to it. If we do nothing, as has been demonstrated, by previous speakers, the losses will accumulate. The services will be cut back even further. It never had a chance from when the, the main interstate freight assets were taken out of that and transferred through to national rail. It has to be sold. We do need to get private operators on those short lines, in, in intrastate lines, whether it's with those workshops or whether it's with those icons, whether it's the GAN or the, um, or the uh, Indian Pacific. They're losing money hand over fist. They need to have a private operator in there who can, uh, who can use it as a torch to attract not only domestic tourists but foreign tourists. And that's the way it'll be done with government getting out of it. And that's exactly the policy that the previous government was advocating when it privatised Qantas and Commonwealth Bank. Uh, and no doubt it would have with Telstra if Kim Beasley had had his way. So the vision that we're looking for from, from, from the sale of AN is to give a private operator access into that, then to move on with the sale of national rail, to link up all the rail links. It's a bit hard in Queensland, but you can get to Brisbane because of the different narrow different gauges. To link them up and to have private operators running on those lines where there's equal access to people, where we have a national rail infrastructure entity, where the Commonwealth will still retain control of uh, those main interstate lines and tracks. And even with the sale of AN, even with the sale of those particular intra-state lines, the Commonwealth will still retain interest in the actual land that they're built on. And that's with the state government as well. And that's exactly what the workers want to be given these opportunities. And as we look into the future, not only will we have a viable north-south link, uh, uh, east-west link, 
where ships will dock into Perth as they do now, and the member for Shortland is quite uh, uh, deceptive in what he's saying because ships are doing that now. They're coming into those ports of Perth. They want to, putting their cargo across the Indian Pacific, across the Nullarbor. They're doing it now. They want to do it now with Brisbane, with Acacia Ridge, with the rail line put through to Fisherman's Island. Ships want to dock in there, put their cargo on it, and to get it straight through to Brisbane or through to Melbourne, which would be faster than sending a ship around the coast to the port of Melbourne. That is the vision that they want to do now with foreign carriers. And, and, I, might, and I might add, there was, a, there was even the suggestion that I got the impression that National Line was held up in shine, as, as, a, as a shining light. I mean, that's made horrendous losses. It couldn't be sold. So the vision is that there will be intermodal ports that will be seamless, that cargo can come into this country, can get off a ship, can get on a train, can get to an to a, uh, intermodal port and then onto a truck or into those particular locations. That we will see the completion of the line from Alice Springs to Darwin. That we can integrate that rail infrastructure that should have been done, not just by the previous government, but by other governments back through our history. That we will have a viable transport system from north to south and from east to west. There's been 50 expressions of interest now for AN. This is just the beginning, and if this is done right, and it should be bipartisan, because it is your supporters, it is ALP supporters of the ones that are, who will be the beneficiaries, where new opportunities and new jobs. And it is disappointing when I hear the shadow minister for transport that the only holes he can put in this legislation uh, really is that the way it's been conducted, not the spirit of it uh, and the intent of it. And Really, I think the, member, the shadow member uh, should take his, take his guide from Tommy the tank engine and go back home because he is not making a valuable contribution in this House. This is a good package. The government needs the sale of AN. It needs to rebuild and revive and rejuvenate rail, not for nostalgic reasons, not for the romance of rail, but to get greater efficiencies, to get cargo off the roads to put it back onto rail, to get cargo to locations quicker, and the way to do that is to sell AN, to give it to private operators. I do not believe, though, we should have a monopoly situation. We do need to have uh, adequate entrance coming into the market. The next step, of course, is for our national infrastructure regime, uh, for track infrastructure, and also having adequate access rights, and that is particularly important. So I commend this bill to the House. <coughs> the question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Fraser. Mr Deputy Speaker, that, that just says it all, doesn't it? I mean, the, the intellectual fortitude that the government brings to bear on the debate about uh, the rail infrastructure of regional Australia is to be reduced to Tommy the tank engine. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's a very sad thing to bear witness to an attempt by the Liberal government to sell out our national railways. It is the backbone of regional industry in this country, particularly in South Australia and Tasmania. It's very sad to bear witness to yet another attempt by the government to sell out regional Australia, selling off public assets, adding to the crisis of employment in regional Australia, particularly in our centres. Let's look at the evidence of the sellout. We've got the Prime Minister tripping off to the UK to watch the cricket in, in Lords. Meanwhile, BHP is still waiting. The workers at BHP are still waiting for the Prime Minister to make good his promise to go and talk to the workers about their concerns, about the lack of a consistent, coherent industry policy by this government, a lack of a steel plan. And the minister couldn't even be bothered to go and talk to the workers in National Rail. He hasn't been to major National Rail workplaces as minister like the shadow minister has. We now have a government getting more workers sacked with this potential sell-off of National Railways. This bill refuses to guarantee existing services. There are at least 2,600 jobs that are placed at risk in regional Australia by this bill, as well as vital railway services. 
This does not include all of the other workers who depend on the operation of our railways to keep their jobs. The government does not appear to care that this bill, which is still vague and fuzzy around the edges with regard to the real future of our national railways, is spreading fear and concern amongst railway workers all over Australia. The government's blackmailing battlers in regional areas who have given their lives to maintaining and developing our national railways. It has put a gun to their head and is threatening to close the lines if the bill does not pass. And what sort of government does this to people, revelling in the fear that they've been able to generate in the hearts of regional workers? People in regional Australia are being held to ransom by the government on this issue. Support privatisation or you lose your jobs. But there's no guarantee that they will keep their jobs if they do support this Liberal government's agenda of privatisation. Of course there are railway workers who are scared in this environment, and of course there are railway workers who consequently are attracted to the minor safety net of privatisation that is brought about under the threat that is perpetrated by this government. Of course there is a minor union that, that is concerned about the opposition's uh, position in relation to opposing this bill or seeking to amend this bill. The SBU, the single bargain unit representing the majority of workers in AN, has carried a resolution supporting uh, the opposition movements to oppose and amend this legislation. The coalition's pontifications about the support it purportedly has from AN workers is absolutely hollow. The government plans to make all staff redundant, with the new operators being able to recruit staff as they wish, if they wish. The government has sold these people out without even ensuring that they will be able to get jobs with the new proprietors. The rail unions are asking for continued employment and training of current AN apprentices to the satisfactory completion of their contracts of training without being disadvantaged. That is wage maintenance. What undertaking can the government give that this bill will deliver for apprentices? Our young people in regional Australia need jobs, they need careers, they need futures. It's commonly known that there is a crisis of confidence by young people in regional Australia. They have a higher incidence of suicide rates and substance abuse. This bill does nothing to reassure the young people in regional Australia of their future. Railway workers have indicated through their unions that they want to make a labour adjustment program a specific feature of the regional impact fund, with an increase to the overall fund to support the workers who will be losing their jobs if this bill passes. They are not asking for much, just to ensure that there will be money available to clean up the mess once the Liberals have finished chopping up our railways, just enough money to address some of the economic and social problems that this bill will cause in regional Australia. None of these protections for regional workers and their families are in this bill. But more than that, workers have indicated through their unions that they are not just concerned about their own jobs but the regional economies themselves. They are concerned about the future of Australian railways for all of Australia. This bill will destroy the Australian rail industry as we know it. The railway unions have started the fight for all rail users as well as the workers from the majority of industry players who move freight by rail to pensioners who travel by train. Many people in regional Australia and throughout the land are affected by this bill. The unions have called for guarantee service levels in the Indian Pacific Garn and Overland, an overhaul of the Overland rolling stock and the guaranteed continued concession levels for pensioners on these services. And where, where are the guarantees from this government? to industry in regional Australia? Where are the guarantees from this government for pensioners who need to rely on rail transport in regional Australia? There are none. This government is seeking to abrogate its responsibility, the responsibility of the parliament to people in regional Australia who rely on rail transportation. They've asked for the retention. The workers have asked for the retention of all services and lines unless there is an independent public inquiry which determines that they can be closed. This already applies in South Australia, but this bill leaves the Tasmanian services and lines unprotected. Why won't the government support the opposition calls for a coherent rail policy? Why won't the government hear the opposition's calls for a coherent steel plan, for that matter? And where is the member for Parks in this debate? 
whose electorate in Western New South Wales stand to lose a great deal from his government's actions. He's silent, complicitly agreeing to his government's attack on the, his electorate. The railway unions have called for a commitment from the government to interstate rail infrastructure in South Australia and Tasmania and have opposed the sale of track infrastructure. Yet in its rail reform package of November last year, the government provided inadequate funding for track upgrading to provide Australia with a decent interstate rail network. And now it has the intimidity to turn around and say that the sector is um, not performing as well as it might. The government is out of touch with regional Australia. They don't know what the needs of regional Australia are, and they do not want to spend money to service those needs. Their solution is to sell out and then sell off. What this government does not understand is that rail is a vital link for Australian travellers and industries. Not everyone can do a John Sharp and jump the queue at the airport. Many Australians cannot afford to travel by air. For all Australians, an affordable, well-maintained and cohesive rail service is essential. It is essential for developing and maintaining regional industries in Australia. Importantly, unions have argued the government to establish a regulatory and safe frameworks in South Australia and Tasmania. Australians still remember and mourn the very few accidents that we have suffered on our railways. Without ad adequate regulatory and safety frameworks, how will the government ensure that accidents do not occur? By abrogating the parliament's responsibility to the minister, clearly it cannot. There is no provision for any of these protections in our rail industry in the bill. With all of the pitfalls in this bill, all of the bits of half-thought-out material that the government is peddling, the question has to be asked, what is the government attempting to do? John Howe continues to fiddle around while the Treasurer slashes and burns our national railways. He lets his Minister for Transport run around at the edges with no idea how to develop a coherent plan. But this is just incompetence, or is it something more sinister? Why can't they tell us what they really want to do? Why release reports bit by bit? Why do they persist in fighting workers in regional areas by not giving them any certainty about what they are going to do with their national railways? This bill places our fragile regional economy at risk and places Port Augusta, where workshops and infrastructure facilities are under severe threat of closure. Closure of workshops at Islington will further reduce the already declining heavy engineering industry in Adelaide. Not that this appears to worry the government. I'm concerned that those people in regional Australia who look to the National Party in the hope that in government that party would deliver regional growth have been bitterly disappointed. This bill does nothing for rural Australians. Railways are commonly in public ownership throughout the world, and for good reason too. For Australia to sell off its railways in the general economic rationalist agenda that this government is running just does not work, and there will be plenty of people out of work as a consequence. This economic rationalist agenda has failed to provide Australia with a coherent national rail policy. In fact, the economic rationalist agenda underlying this bill reduces any capability we may have of the national rail plan that we in this country need for our future. Under this bill, our railways will become a weak link in any regional employment or industry strategy. Who then does this economic rationalist agenda serve? This is where we get into the really gory bits. It is clear that it serves one group in this country and one group only. Why else would John Sharp appoint John Brewer, who was proposing to act as a consultant to the Great Southern Railway Consortium formed by the Macquarie Bank to buy and operate AM business, to conduct an inquiry into AM? Why else would the government delay the release of the full report of the Brewer report and only provide an edited version of the executive summary of the report nearly three months after the report was provided to the Minister for Transport. The Minister for Transport maintains that the only edited version of the summary was made available to protect commercial interests. This is Liberal code for protecting the interests of his mates. People in regional Australia should be very worried. Why are the interests of commercial firms more important to this Liberal government than the interests of workers in our regions? And they are. Why else would the parliamentary secretary, the Minister for Transport, tell the Senate that no one should assume the government will be implementing this report in making decisions about the future of the rail industry? 
when a press release was available which reflected key recommendations of the Brew report the next day. This government has sold out the workers in regional Australia. This is a government which is prepared to sacrifice, to offer up national programs and enterprises which should be owned by all Australians. This is a blood sacrifice that the government is being asked for people in regional Australia to pay. It's a treachery by the government. The government should be condemned, in my view, by every person in Australia for this sale of AM. There are a number of uh, amendments that, that the opposition are seeking to move in this legislation. I'd like to talk about two of them. One is that the government develop a coherent policy for the Australian railway industry. What is wrong with the government developing a coherent policy to the rail industry? Clearly it's something that's well overdue. A lot has been made by members opposite about difficulties in performance in rail in Australia. And it's well known and documented that rail in Australia has been starved of funds. Uh, certainly uh, it, uh, a lack of infrastructure development commitment over many decades by the Australian governments of successive orders has meant that it is problematic for rail in Australia to compete in perhaps the way that it might like to and the way that would be in the interest, the national interest. Of course, what we have here is a government that is intent on privatisation and after that privatisation regime has been unleashed, it will then release into the sector capital that it has been held in abeyance. There, is a, there has been a capital strike on rail in favour of road transport, in my view, and one that is uh, contrary to the national interest. Regional Australia requires good rail infrastructure. Regional Australian industries requires sound uh, rail infrastructure. This bill does not guarantee existing services. In the absence of guaranteeing existing services and where there isn't a commitment for cross-subsidisation to regional Australia, people in the bush will suffer. Businesses in the bush will suffer. Pensioners who rely on rail transportation will suffer. We've also said that the government should guarantee existing passenger service operations and concession arrangement. What is wrong with that? Why can't the government guarantee existing passenger services? Is this really a way of closing down passenger services by stealth? Flog it off and let someone else do your dirty work. It's an outrage. And why not guarantee concession arrangements? What's wrong with ensuring that pensioners can travel about, go and see their kids or their grandkids by rail? Ensure that, um, that they can meet the costs of rail transportation. They certainly can't fly around the place like John Sharp can. Why can't they guarantee the concession arrangements? I think that a government that is seeking to privatise something, um, if it can muster the argument, needs to be questioned about why it would want to abrogate the parliament's responsibility and regulation for this sector. It has to justify why it is not guaranteeing existing services. And so far, we haven't been able to get a single line of rational uh, debate from the government justifying why it shouldn't, at the end of the day, guarantee services for the community. And what do members of the community expect from government for paying their taxes? What do they expect from us all in this House? At the end of the day, they expect good law and they expect services. People in regional Australia particularly rely on things like cross-subsidisation. That's at the heart of the debate about telecommunications. If people in regional Australia were paying full market rate for telecommunications uncross-subsidised by people in the city, there is an argument that says that, it, <laughs> that life will become very difficult for them, just as there is an argument for transportation that if people in regional Australia are not guaranteed services and enterprise runs them at full cost recovery, people in regional Australia will become extremely isolated. In a world uh, arguably where well, a lot of is made of, of the world as a, as a smaller world these days with modern transportation systems, but unfortunately Australians in regional Australia, the, the people in the bush are going to be finding that the world is becoming a larger place, not a smaller place. It is going to be harder to get around. It is harder for business. 
to freight their materials around because they will not be cross-subsidised. The increased urbanisation in this country has been the subject of a lot of research and discussion and ultimately debate in this parliament. Increased urbanisation will continue, uh, in my view, not only unabated but hell for leather. People will be continuing to leave our regional uh, centres and, and the bush in general for the cities at a greater rate of knots when jobs disappear. Jobs will disappear when enterprise in regional Australia, when uh, business in the bush goes bust because the cost of transportation of their products to cities and ultimately overseas goes up. That on cost for doing business in the bush has to, has to essentially be reliant upon an adequate national infrastructure. And this bill is about destroying that national infrastructure. Thank you. Order. The question is that the words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Lyon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, this is a very important piece of legislation that the House is debating today uh, with regard to the uh, or entitled the Australian National Railways Commission Sale Bill 1997. The debate that I've been listening to so far this morning has been quite uh, wide-ranging um, from a number of different speakers, and I think that it's important that we, uh, we draw a bit of a focus back on some of the key elements in this. And the, the first point is that um, uh, the, the, the name Australian National uh, belies actually what it actually does. I mean, Australian National doesn't operate rail nationally around Australia. As the previous speaker alluded to, it doesn't. Uh, he was trying to allude to the fact that it services all of a regional Australia. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't serve my part of uh, Australia in the, seat of New South, in the state of New South Wales or up into Queensland. But part of the previous speaker's comments with regard to uh, the operation of rail in Australia, and partic particularly the subsidies and cross-subsidies within the passenger systems, uh, those comments should have been uh, directed maybe to some of his colleagues in the New South Wales government uh, with the way that the, uh, the state rail operation is run in New South Wales. But, Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the purpose of the bill is to allow the sale of the non-interstate mainline track rail assets of Australian National. Australian National operates South SA Freight, TAS Rail, within the states of South Australia and Tasmania, respectively the seat of government railway, uh, contract rail and engineering services, and the in Indian Pacific, the GAN, and the overland passenger trains. Now, it's interesting um, to note the, uh, the, a bit of the history of uh, what's happening and where the government, on how the government has arrived uh, at the decision to propose the sale of Australian National and put this bill before the House. Uh, the history of government ownership of railways in Australia has seen declining workforces, declining market share and spiralling debts. And that is not just a comment limited to this debate and to this particular rail operation. It's across the board. Government ownership has resulted in political intervention in the rail industry to the detriment of its long-term viability. It has allowed government-owned rail operations to behave as monopolistic providers of services inflexible in their practice and unresponsive to the needs of the customer. Again, I note, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the state Labor government in New South Wales is, trying, is grappling with this same problem with their state rail operation in New South Wales and, and the costs. The rail industry needs 10, 20 and 30 year planning horizons, and this has not been, not been achieved where short-term political ends have dictated investment decisions, you know, rail, uh, rail operations and reform. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the coalition was elected to government with a commitment to reform not only the rail industry as part of the transport sector, but the overall transport sector. I think it was, uh, was identified in the National Commission of Audit to the, uh, the Commonwealth Government that um, reform in the transport sector of the economy could produce a massive improvement in real terms to the GDP of this nation. And that's, that's road, that's rail, that's sea, and it's air. It's all those elements of transport. And, the, and this government is about reviewing and reforming all those elements of, of, of the transport network in Australia. Now, the proposition that's uh, before the House today is um, as a result of 
some, uh, some, of the, some of the decisions of the previous government. Obviously, it's a result of uh, the review that was undertaken by uh, and reported on in the Brew report to government, particularly about AN. Now, the Labor Party's history of ownership of AN is, uh, is not very good at all. It's a history of job loss losses. It's a history of line closures, of lost freight, and spiralling debt. You know, the Labor Party told the AN workforce, as well as that uh, they would would all have their jobs. In the, the Labor Party told AN workforce, as well as, as that they would have all their jobs in the future in AN. Yet the Labor Party secretly signed off on hundreds of rail jobs and approved business plans that would see further service reductions and job losses. Yet the AN commissioner, commission itself, knew that this was not true, and the chairman advised uh, the now minister on his coming to uh, coming to office. And so. You know, the former government was, was overseeing a declining service, uh, spiralling debt, and, and an organisation, a government business enterprise, that was getting itself into a lot more strife, as did ANL. And we know the history of ANL. I mean, the former government tried to sell it and couldn't, and the, and the taxpayers of Australia poured hundreds of millions of dollars in. And, and we're getting into the same situation as a country with this particular government business enterprise. Now, you know, we've got to be realistic. Now, now, opposition speakers this morning have spoken about um, the jobs that are there and the jobs in regional Australia. What this government is trying to do is to try and secure those jobs before they are all gone and beyond redemption, and absolutely beyond, beyond redemption. And that's about where, uh, sadly, ANL probably is today, Mr Deputy Speaker, beyond redemption. And, and you know, we had the appointment of. Um, uh, of uh, special consultants to try and salvage ANL at, at great taxpayers' expense. It just didn't happen. And, and the former government now know they should have acted sooner. They should have acted sooner. Now they probably reckon the, the former government probably reckons that they uh, they did fairly well getting away with some of the privatisation exercises that they undertook in government, considering the uh, the different elements of their political party. And I mean, we've listened to speaker after speaker in this debate and other debates in this place, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about um, track records and, and uh, you know, the shock horror about the, uh, you know, the, the economic rationalist view of privatisation and uh, what it's going to do, and it's just going to be a scorched earth uh, policy of privatisation under the coalition government. And it was interesting to note, and it, and it, uh, it, um, it flashed up to me yesterday in, in, a, in a division in this House. Where there was a bit of um, a bit of uh, argy bargy between the both sides of politics in this house over a division yesterday, and who should be crossing the floor and who should be sitting anywhere, and the sorts of, and you know the, and the control exercised by different political parties in this place. And I remembered, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the division that took place, and you'll remember, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the division that took place in this in this house under the previous government on the sale of the second half of the Commonwealth Bank. And you'll recall that the government of the day, the last thing they wanted, the last thing they wanted in this place was to have a division in this house on the sale of the Commonwealth Bank. And, uh, but it occurred because two members that used to sit here in these seats here, the member for Wills and the member for North Sydney, called a division to highlight, and particularly the member for Wills, to highlight to the people of Australia the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the bleeding hearts in the left wing of the Labor Party who were all over there voting to sell the Commonwealth Bank. They were voting to sell the Commonwealth Bank, Mr Deputy Speaker, and they'd voted to sell Qantas and they'd voted to sell Australian Airlines and they'd voted to sell CSL, they'd voted to sell the, the, uh, our share in the Snowy Mountain schemes and a whole raft of government business enterprises. Yet it's amazing how short that road to Damascus is and how quick the conversion takes place when flicked back onto the other side of the House. Because all of a sudden they're anti-privatisation it's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the dogma of the economic rationalists. It's got nothing to do with good management. It was all to do with good management when the Labor Party were in government, but it's got nothing to do with good management of the, uh, the government business enterprises today. And that's the, uh, that's the Labor Party that is opposing this bill today, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker. And I mean, you know, the one thing that the coalition has been consistent about, and that included 13 years of opposition whilst the Labor Party was running this country and running a similar agenda as far as management of government business enterprises was concerned, there's one thing we were always consistent about, and that was as far as privatisation of uh, government business enterprises and assets that weren't seen as a core responsibility or activity of government. And we consistently supported that government then. 
We had some credibility on this issue in opposition, Mr Deputy Speaker. I put it to you, the Labor Party didn't and doesn't have any credibility in this debate. They don't. And, 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 you know, I have the greatest respect for the member for Jellybrand, but when, when the government, the former government, sold the first half of the Commonwealth Bank, they signed off on the prospectus and said the remaining shares of the Commonwealth Bank would remain in public ownership. Now, if that was a private operation putting out the pr pr perspective, then surely there'd be some prudential rule somewhere that would call that, that, that statement into question. But the former government just straight over the top of that we're selling the other half. And it was interesting to note, and I, and I, and I, just, I brought back to my memory that particular division in this place when, uh, when, there was, when all the government members and, the, and all the opposition members all sat over there supporting the sale of the Commonwealth Bank, and you had a couple of independents here. The members of the left wing of the Labor Party, where were they? They were over there. They didn't even go outside the doors. That's how much control was exercised by the government of the day. They didn't even leave the chamber and abstain. They were in here voting to sell it. But this, the sale of this government business enterprise, Mr Deputy Speaker, is, is based on the fact that we want to maintain some jobs, those jobs that with, are with AN. We want to give them an opportunity to keep working in the rail industry. And they are based on the diabolical situation that, that this government business enterprise is in as a result that of the report by the Brew Report. The re Brew Report revealed some appalling mismanagement, as well as the fact that 7,000 jobs had been lost out of AN over 13 years. Who was in government? The Labor Party. 50 per cent of the SA Rail network was closed and ripped up and ripped up. And if we've got any chance of resurrecting rail in Australia, Mr Deputy Speaker, as a major element of, of the transport infrastructure, how are we going to do it when the rail lines have been ripped up? A $1 billion debt with no way of servicing it. Passenger rail services to Mount Gambia, Burra, Peterborough, Port Augusta and Whaler and Broken Hill all closed. A reduction in the frequency of uh, the Indian Pacific services and the closure of the Trans-Australian Rail Service, a train that operated uh, Adelaide Perth and supplemented the Indian Pacific, which operates Sydney Perth. The Brew Report revealed that uh, an AN employee was being subsidised by the taxpayers of Australia to the tune of $30,000 per annum with this increasing to $220,000 per annum if nothing was done. What the Brew Report did identify, Mr Deputy Speaker, was that there was no do-nothing option. There was no do-nothing option which is being proposed in the amendment that's being put forward by the Shadow Minister. A do-nothing option. The Brew Report indicated there is, there, that option did not exist. That to be a responsible government we had to do something about it. Uh, in the, uh, in the correspondence that attached, was attached from, uh, from Brew to the minister, you know, he, and, uh, he, he quoted that, uh, in comparative terms, the overall loss and debt position of the ANR is four to five times that of the Australian National Line, which the previous government attempted to sell and couldn't. Four to five times. So why didn't the previous government take any action on this, apart from ripping up line and ripping up jobs? The question is still unanswered. He also said this financial year ANR's total loss is likely to exceed 130 million and there is no prospect of it making a profit in the foreseeable future. He went on to say later on the situation has been deteriorating for some time and the Department of Transport in 1992 and again in 1995 provided formal advice to the then government and suggested urgent action was needed. No do nothing option, urgent action was needed. Was there any urgent action, Mr Deputy Speaker? No. We all know the case that there certainly was not, and that has been highlighted in that, in that report to, uh, to the current government. It was interesting to note in the, uh, in the Bills Digest, Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the actions that the previous government did take as far as AN was concerned and the reshuffling of the Commonwealth's involvement in rail when, uh, when setting, up, um, the, uh, setting up National Rail was to hive off a lot of the profitable sectors to National Rail. And the Bill's Digest uh, indicates that the loss of primary business from Australian National to the freight carrier National Rail has impacted heavily on Australian National to the point that debt levels and the structure of Australian National had to be addressed. Had to be addressed. And that's exactly what we're doing here, Mr Deputy Speaker. We are addressing a chronic situation in an attempt 
to save taxpayers' money and to try and secure the remaining jobs of those people with Australian national in the, in the rail industry. If we take the do-nothing op option of the shadow minister, there will be no chance of any redemption of those jobs. And the, and the people that ha currently have those jobs recognise that. Now, the shadow minister was um, reported as, uh, in the, uh, as doing a radio interview, I think it was in, uh, in South Australia, uh, recently when he went down there. And uh, the, uh, the shadow minister uh, indicated that uh, it was indicated to me in advance that the majority of workers there were of the view that the sale would now proceed, should now proceed, I beg your pardon, should now proceed. The majority of workers said that. The compare said, so given what the workers have said to you today, that they sh would like to see the sale proceed and get it over and done with, is that likely to change your opposition to the sale at this stage? The shadow minister, Mr Tanner, no, it is a factor in our, consideration, our consideration, but uh, and the, the compere said, you are not inclined to pull back at all, the shadow minister, no, that is right. Some popped that view, others didn't. We have got plenty of other workers in other parts of the organisation with a different view. We have also got to take into account the interests of the taxpayer. Well, I remind the shadow minister of that comment that he made, that we, we have also got to take into consideration the, uh, the views of the taxpayer, because that is exactly right. There are the jobs that are involved that need to be secured for the future of our, in AN, and there is also the interest of the taxpayers. And the taxpayers who are at the moment sinking a lot of money into, uh, into keeping AN in public ownership. And so I put it to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, they're fairly, fairly salutary comments by the shadow minister who has come in here and moved a, uh, an amendment, which is a do-nothing amendment, which everybody that has taken any time to investigate the situation of AM is recommending against the do-nothing option, and, uh, and, and, and he highlights in that interview that uh, we've got to take into account not only the workers' views but the views of the taxpayers, and that is exactly what the government is doing. We are looking after the interests of the taxpayers and we are looking after the interests of the workers of AM, and they, and they want that uh, locked in. There was another uh, interview, I think it was also on radio, with um, Mr Len Scharenberg regarding uh, the Shadow Minister's visit down there. And the newsreader said uh, rail unions say that they're worse off after a meeting with the Federal Opposition's Shadow Transport Minister in Port Augusta on the future of Australian National. Lindsay Tanner has met about 50 workers. The Federal Opposition has threatened to block the sale of AN, but Len Scharenberg of the Australian Workers' Union said that means no job guarantees for workers. He says the Opposition has turned its back on rail workers. Uh, then uh, Len Scharenberg went on to say, after a fair bit of soul-searching, we, the majority of the workers in Port Augusta, in Port Augusta, had agreed to a sale. We've seen that as the best way to keep the workshops viable and then to see our own people coming out and endorsing the blocking of the sale, it sort of left us with a bit of egg on our face. And I suppose when he's talking about our own people, he's talking about the Labor Party, the people who are supposed to protect the jobs of workers in Australia. And they are not. And their own, their own blue-collar workforce that supports the Labor Party, Mr Deputy Speaker, can see it. Why can't the shadow minister see it? He just can't see it. And so, Mr, Mr Deputy Speaker, you know, all the evidence, all the inquiries that have been undertaken, that is before the House, that is before the public in this debate, indicates that what the government is doing is the right path to take. It is the right path to take with, the, as far, with regard to the sale of AN, AN and the only people who can't see it and who won't see it is the opposition, is the Australian Labor Party. The, the sale of AN is supported by everyone except the Australian Labor Party. It is supported by the AN workers. It is supported by a petition to the Senate signed by 120 workers of AN at Port Augusta. It is supported by the customers of AN. It is supported by the South Australian and Tasmanian governments, but not the South Australian opposition parties. They're not supporting it. They're in bed with the, the, uh, the, the Commonwealth opposition parties. The sale is supported by the Australian Rail Association. The sale is supported by Rail 2000. The sale is supported by the AN Commission and Management itself. The sale is supported by National Rail. Why won't the Labor Party support it? Because they have become a populist party. That is all they have become. They have, they have just junked all their commitment to reforming Australia to take Australia in a healthy state in beyond the year 2000. They have jumped all of that to become a populist party. 
So why does the Labor Party want to continue their appalling record as far as AN is concerned? And that is the reason, because they have locked themselves in to becoming the populist party in Australia. I mean, we used to think it was only the Democrats that took, that, took on that mantle, but now the Australian Labor Party has joined them. And in the time uh, remaining, Mr Deputy Speaker, I just wanted to uh, refer to some comments that were made by uh, the member for Shortland, who is also the Deputy Chairman of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Communications, Transport and Microeconomic Reform. And the member referred to the, the terms of reference that our committee has received from the minister with regard to rail. And I put it to the House that the minister issuing those terms of reference to us to report to this House on reform of rail in Australia, and then the best way to go is a commitment that this government has to rail in Australia and the future of rail in Australia, along with the commitment the government wants to make to the workers at AN to secure their jobs into the future in the rail industry, and also the commitment that the, uh, the government wants to make to the taxpayers of Australia that they ensure that all government business enterprises are run in a commercial fashion and we are not wasting taxpayers' money on them. We're prepared to make the hard decisions. We're prepared to debate them in this place, and we are not prepared to go down the populist lines that the Labor Party has gone on this issue and a number of other issues since they became the opposition in the Commonwealth Parliament of Australia. It's very, it, as I said at the start of my address, Order. it's amazing how quickly Order. they've the changed their colours. The member's time has expired. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Kalgoorlie. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, uh, I get amused in this house when members of the government talk about populist politics, because populist politics invades both sides of this House, Liberal and Labor alike. We heard in this House the other day a disgusting speech by Laurie Brereton, a member for somewhere in New South Wales, uh, an attack on uh, one of Australia's heroes and Geoffrey Blaney. Um, it, was a, it was an attempt at populism catering to what the Labor Party sees as a groundswell of support, a support I can tell you is simply not there. But returning to the debate on the railway, having led for years alongside the track and having worked for uh, Australian National back in the days when it was owned by Charlie Ryan and um, having uh, worked as a fettler on that railway, I have some interest in it. The truth about Australian National is it was probably the best run railway in Australia, certainly up until the time that Julian Graw became the Minister for Transport in West Australia and reformed the West, West Rail, the West Australian Railways, which would now arguably be the most efficient railway system in Australia. The uh, chairman of uh, Australian National was a Don Williams, was an engineer, a brilliant engineer, uh, dynamic, and he had visions for rail transport across Australia. And he wanted Australian National to take over that rail transport. But apart from being a brilliant engineer, Don Williams was also a bit on the arrogant side and certainly didn't tolerate fools gladly. And it was for this reason he was totally unacceptable the railway system of Victoria, which was hopeless, and New South Wales, which by, while being very large was also moribund. It was quite clear that those states were never going to countenance uh, uh, an amalgamation or takeover by Australian National, and so the government of the day was forced to another alternative and set up the National Rail Corporation. The problem was, of course, that having set the National Rail Corporation up, they then took from Australian National a lot of its uh, equipment and all its business, but left Australian National with all its debts. So Australian National had no way of servicing its commitments and it had no option other than to go broke and become a big burden on the Australian taxpayer. It must be made very clear the failure of Australian National had nothing to do with the workers. The workers of Australian National were, in my view, long-suffering, uh, committed and, um, and uh, I think given very, a very, very poor deal. There is absolutely no doubt the failure of Australian National lies with the actions of the previous government. And it gives me no great pleasure to say that. Now, there are no job guarantees, contrary to the uh, mention of the member before, who spoke before me. Uh, the Act says all, all members, all staff will be uh, made redundant and uh, must reapply for their jobs with um, whoever takes up uh, the purchase of Australian National or parts of Australian National. 
Now, I believe it will be sold in part because I can't see anyone wanting to take up the whole lot. Um, but still, it is a much better option than no jobs at all, which is the only other uh, option I can see. There is a flaw in the government's bill, and that is, as I see it, it will make Australian National Railway simply a custodian of the permanent way. It will be responsible for the maintenance of the permanent way. Mr Deputy Speaker, you simply cannot maintain a permanent way unless you have rolling stock. And right now, uh, service uh, development is being impeded on the uh, trans line because Australian National don't have the wherewithal to carry the, the, their requirements for maintenance. So I think it would be very wise for the, uh, for the Minister to amend the Act to allow Australian National to still have some motive power of its own. Now, this could be done uh, if they were to use the services provided or offered by Aries uh, Engineering in Perth, who have developed a high rail system where they use a truck, in this case a Kenworth truck, which can move on and off the rail in two minutes uh, and is capable of hauling up to 1,000 tonnes. It recently did shunt, hauls, uh, shunt tests in Kalgoorlie where it successfully shunted very large loads. Now, this system uh, would be ideal for the Australian National, and they want it. They have their, uh, their uh, rest centres uh, set in place along the trans line, and they could use this assembly in the same way that in the past they used their sugar train, uh, which was called the bomber going the other way, which is a train, a slow goods train, used for stopping at the various sidings to service those sidings and to also carry the equipment needed for maintenance. And I'd urge the minister to uh, not listen to the vested interests that want to keep this uh, at a distance and uh, uh, encourage Australian National to acquire this equipment uh, available from Aries uh, Engineering in Perth. Now, there is one problem at the moment. The company is running this, this, this hold-up. To test this equipment, they are required by some law to have $100 million of insurance, uh, of uh, public indemnity insurance, and a, uh, a second uh, policy of $20 million, which appears to me be, to be for the same thing. Now, this might be all right to impose this on a rail system hauling large trains continually, but for someone running test operations, it's obviously a nonsense. It's obviously a fiction, and it could easily be overcome if they agreed to have this operating on the, um, un under the insurance, existing insurance of Australian National, or if they would apply the same sort of insurance that this assembly would have to have if it worked on the roads where the risk was much greater. So to see that in there, it is either incompetent, incompetence on the part of the bureaucracy or it is an, a, a, a clear uh, attempt by the bureaucracy to stop this very worthwhile development happening. Now, Apart from en enabling the, uh, uh, the access to the permanent way for maintenance purposes, there is also a local service commitment. All the stations across the Nullarbor, and I was involved in the opening up of the Nullarbor uh, for parcel industry, the last great parcel development will ever take place in Australia, but when those stations were started, they had a clear guarantee that they would be serviced by the Australian National. Subsequent uh, decisions taken, mainly at government level, made it, made it simply uneconomic for Australian National to want to service the intra-state positions. Now, if we were to uh, reinstate Australian National with this truck-powered uh, tea and sugar train or bomber train, whichever you want to describe it as, um, it would also be able to service those sightings once more. I have looked at some figures recently when the Nullarbor, where pastors have a, an urgent need to destock some of their properties, with an excess stock there, it is simply uneconomic at the moment to ship them to the only market, which is in Peterborough in South Australia. This could be accompanied, accomplished by uh, uh, a vehicle powered by the, uh, the Aries concept uh, much more efficiently and cheaper than the railways can possibly do it in their present uh, setup. Uh, it would serve a very useful purpose in helping the, in terms of land care on the Nullarbor, and it would certainly help to make those places viable, places which I believe the government has an absolute responsibility. 
Now, the other thing that's concerning me is this. We are told that Australian National is going to be the custodian of the permanent way and people are going to have to allowed access to the permanent way. Now, I think this is a good idea. But what we see happening already, and I can't get questions, answers out of the Minister's office, is we see people saying, yes, we want to use the permanent way for haulage. One company in Kalgoorlie wishes to haul limestone into Kalgoorlie to create um, uh, for the mining industry. Some to be made into lime, others to be simply crushed and made as a, uh, a, uh, an alkaline reagent in some of the processes. The company has already put an order in for uh, uh, railway equipment. It's already uh, put an order in for a loco, which it's seeking to buy from uh, one of the state railway systems in Australia. Uh, it is being hampered from getting access to the railway system, and I suspect this is because of vested interests that are applying. If it's not, the only other explication can be bureaucratic obfuscation, and I believe the minister has an absolute responsibility to consider this application now and let these people get on with uh, what looks to me to be a very viable and a very worthwhile operation, an operation which can cost the government nothing. They will pay access to the railway. That, that access must be on reasonable fees. It certainly must be at no more than uh, the large companies pay. Uh, but it will help to, uh, to support the gold industry, which is very, very important to Australia. It will help to support uh, employment and it will help to keep the railways viable. Why it's not happening, I simply need to know. Now, uh, the, uh, the other thing that must be done immediately, we must stop in Australia the destruction of existing uh, carriages. There, we, I know that uh, there are uh, tenders being put out now for, for uh, stop carrying carriages, uh, for the acquisition of them, which are probably designed to be scrapped. I believe this must be stopped uh, until we assess uh, the, uh, the need for these carriages. I think refurbishment will be obviously be a much better option than building new equipment, and I think it would be absolutely scandalous if we allow this, this uh, carriages to be scrapped on any railway system in Australia until there is a clear understanding of the need for this equipment. And uh, so many times have you seen in the past where we scrap perfectly good equipment and then put out tenders to buy new stuff. And I certainly hope this doesn't happen on this occasion. Now, the um, Australian National is very, very important to, uh, to uh, Australia. It is the link that links the east and west. It is the link that is capable of taking traffic off the Great Eastern, Eastern Highway. The Great Eastern Highway from Kalgoorlie to uh, Perth is already overcrowded. And uh, we now have uh, B-doubles and road trains operating uh, beyond Northam and I believe it is going to be an accident. There is going to be a serious accident there. I have actually driven the road myself and I have personally felt intimidated by some of these convoys of, uh, of vehicles. It is much better to have them on the rail. It is um, also much safer. But we must look at railways. The government says it has an absolute commitment to rail. Rail is triumphant over long distances, particularly in flat terrain. That is the nature of Australia. No country in the world is made for rail like Australia is made, particularly on east-west routes. And it must be remembered that east-west routes in Australia for rail have generally been profitable. The losses, the massive losses, have been on north-south routes. And the reason for that, of course, is that governments for the last probably 70 years have not bothered to keep up the infrastructure on those lines. But we find that road transport, and you hear, particularly from the other side of this, of the government, how efficient road transport is compared with, road, with rail transport. Road transport has a clear advantage in this. The government charges an excise on fuel. It charges that partly, say, for the construction of roads. So heavy trucks running on the road get some benefit from the excise. And all the reports have shown that it is large trucks that do the damage to, to bitumen roads, not motor cars. So, the, uh, the motorist subsidises the trucking industry on the road. The trucking industry itself gets a benefit from the, uh, the, the excise, which is get, some of which does go into roads. But railways pay that excise too, and railways don't get anything like the benefit. The railway has to pay for every, every inch, 
every centimetre of its permanent way has to pay the full cost. Now, quite clearly, this needs to be looked at if we're going to have a truly level playing field. I think uh, it's unfortunate this bill needed to be brought before the House. Quite clearly, it needed to be. But in, uh, in conclusion, I just want to say to the Minister, I believe there has to be some competition in there. I believe Australian National could in fact provide that competition to the National Rail Corporation. I believe that Australian National can provide the intrastate services, which I believe government has an absolute commitment, should have an absolute commitment to, and I believe has a duty to provide. It can certainly do that. I believe that um, we can see the passenger train uh, expand its services enormously with some intelligent promotion of tourism. And I'd see that passenger train benefiting by uh, having two classes of travel. Uh, the first class, which would be very good, and the price would need to go up, and, uh, and a real steerage class where you could uh, provide competitive rates for, for backpackers across Australia. Uh, and that would need, would in my view, need to be quite basic to keep the cost down. So, in conclusion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I do urge the Minister's Office to take heed of what I've said. There are enormous achievements and developments that can take place. They won't take place if it's left to rail, because rail is totally, it is totally stultified at the moment. They are frightened to do anything, and uh, people of Australia National have actually told me that they simply dare not make decisions. I think the government has to show that leadership, the Minister's Office has to show that leadership, give access to people who want access to permanent way, and certainly amend the legislation to allow Australian National to keep some locomotive power of its own so that it can be self-sufficient in providing uh, for the maintenance of the permanent way. After all, if that job is not kept up, or if they are forced into using expensive contract services, it won't be long before we're back in this House uh, bemoaning once more the problems of uh, national, Australian National and seeking uh, even more privatisation. I believe that railways like this, the permanent way, should at least be in the hands of the government, and uh, the maintenance of it, I think, is obviously better provided for in the main by employees employed by Australian National rather than contract teams. And I say that with some experience, as I say, having worked on the railways and uh, seeing the um, contract teams in specific areas, yes, but in general maintenance, I think it's going to uh, be in Australia's national's interest to keep a day labour force, which of course must be supplied. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Grey. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. The Australian National Railways Commission Sale Bill 97 uh, is something that must happen for the national interest and for the people of South Australia and Tasmania. This farce has gone on far too long. And to have my political opponents coming into this place today and posturing on this is beneath contempt. The purpose of the bill, of course, is to allow the sale of the non-interstate main line track rail assets of Australian National. And we know that Australian National operates SA Freight and TASRA within the states of South Australia and Tasmania, respectively. The seat of Government Railway, Contract Rail and Engineering Services, and the Indian Pacific, the GAN and the Overland Passenger Rail. Australia's rail history is really Australia's history. And the changes in the rail industry over the last 20 years, and no doubt further back than that, particularly the last 20 years, has, he has seen dramatic change. And we are at a stage in our history, in the, that is the coalition assuming government of March 96, we were at just another watershed another stage in the history of rail in Australia. As has been said many times in this place, the Brew Report, the much maligned Brew Report, 
has set a course, not a course, but set down the facts of life once again for the rail industry. I mean, the previous Labor government knew what it was, but uh, the minister, the new minister, confronted with the financial reality and the chaos that was the rail industry, particularly AN, had no choice but to move as the government has done. I just want to quote from the letter that uh, Mr Brew wrote to the minister as of 19th of June 96, and remembering that was just some three months after the government came to office. So the government acted as quickly as it possibly could. And he makes this point about Australian National Rail. In comparative terms, the overall loss and debt position of the ANR, that is Australian National Railways, is four to five times that of the Australian National Line, which the previous government attempted to sell. And this financial year, that is 96-97, uh, Australian National's total loss is likely to exceed 130 million. We subsequently found, of course, it was more than that. And th there is no prospect of it making a profit in the foreseeable future. And I'll just, uh, and that's, quite, that's the end of the quote, but I'll just make the observation that if you look back over the last decade and you look at the parliamentary reports, as far back as 1988, uh, a parliamentary inquiry of that era made it quite clear that they expected AN to be breaking even within the next three or four years. That is, by the early 90s, AN should have been in a position to be breaking even. And it's very interesting uh, that uh, if you look at the AN annual report of 1995-96, uh, you will see in there a deliberate government act of the Labor government to just defer all of this, defer all of this post March 1996, post the election, and uh, the blatant irresponsibility of that action in itself indicates uh, the Labor Party's inability to come to terms with the reality. My responsibility, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, at the end of the day as a representative of a federal electorate is to the people of that electorate. And it is well known that the seat of Grey has been a Labor seat for many decades up until 1993. And the township uh, or the city of Port Augusta was known as a traditional Labor city. Now, when I was first elected, I didn't receive a particular swing in that city, and I wouldn't have expected to. The traditional party lines were drawn, and uh, it was much the status quo. But as I became familiar with my role as a representative, I just became far too familiar with the neglect of rail by the Labor Party. It was, it, I could not believe that something could have been left to stagnate in the way that Australian National was. And Brew makes the comment, and I quote, in effect, the decisions that Labor made with the Australian National Railway and the National Rail Corporation meant, in effect, death by a thousand cuts for National Rail. End of quote. But I come back to my theme as representing people that those people of Port Augusta should never have been placed in that position over many years. They should never have been placed in that position. And as people have said to me that have got out of the rail industry over the last year or two, no people should be treated like that. Nobody should be treated with that sort of uncertainty. You either have a positive future looking forward with a growing industry or at least holding the status quo. You just don't leave an, leave a, an organisation there to hang out to dry. And that's effectively what the government did with Australian National. And just while I'm on brew, I'll. Uh, I'll uh, just uh, reiterate this quote, and he makes the point that the situation had been deteriorating for some time. The Department of Transport in 92, and again in 95, provided formal advice to the then government and suggested urgent action was needed. 
and the government ignored that advice. I come to today's transcontinental from Port Augusta after the visit by the shadow minister, the minister the, uh, Mr Lindsay Tanner. And the transcontinental's headline reads, too little, too late. Delays surrounding AN sale costing contracts, say workers. And there we have it. The epitaph for the Labor Party said by their own supporters, too little, too late. And I'll just quote from the article by Ben Osmond from today's, I repeat, Wednesday, June 18th, 97, the Transcontinental Port Augusta, and I'll quote from the article. One worker said the doubt surrounding AN's future had recently costed a contract with BHP. They looked at us and said, no, we don't know if you have a future, so they gave it to someone else. Who did they give it to, Mr Tanner asked. NRC and Gininan. The one you bungled set up, the worker replied. So there we have it, once again, AN laid out on the, as the sacrificial lamb. And that is what Mr Tanner had to confront at Port Augusta this week. But the Commonwealth government, the coalition government, confronted with those realities, had no choice but to act. And as of November 96, introduced a $2 billion package to revive the rail industry in Australia. And that package, as has been said by previous speakers, comprises redundancies $112 million, superannuation $580 million, outstanding contracts and liabilities $125.7 million, assuming the AN debt of $779.4 million, the regional assistance package $50 million, environment cleanup $50 million, national track authority established $161 million, AN subsidy $30 million, unfunded provisions, leave, workers' comp $90 million, other costs, that is managing the sale, $8 million. No easy matter, the business of cleaning up after labour and of putting rail onto a new path. For the record, I say to, to the parliament and to the community generally that the only people that are not supporting the sale of AN are the Labor Party. The supporters of the sale are obviously the Commonwealth, the South Australian Government, the Tasmanian Government, AN Management, the AN Commission, the Australian Rail Association, Rail 2000, National Rail and its Managing Director, Mr Vince Graham, Customers AN, including Australian Wheat Board, Australian Barley Board, the SA Cooperative Bulk Handling, South Australian Farmers Federation, the Mayor of Port Augusta, Joy Baluk, and the Corporation of the City of Port Augusta, Northern Regional Development Board, the Spencer Regional Development Association, the Australian Workers Union in Port Augusta, in, and may I also add the Trades and Labor Council in Port Augusta, and most importantly, the men and women employed by AN in Port Augusta, Islington, Port Pirie, Port Lincoln, Seduna, throughout South Australia and throughout Tasmania. The only opposition, as I say, is from the Shadow Minister and the Labor Party. I don't know if they even start to understand the issue. Can I just share with the House in the remaining minutes the comments of, the, of Mr Tanner when uh, he was asked on 5CK radio, ABC radio, remember, sorry, but the question is, uh, Mr Tanner was asked, will Labor's position change if it is clear that workers want to see AN sold? Mr Tanner said, and I quote, clearly we'll be taking a close account of the workforce view and the union's view, but you also have other responsibilities to taxpayer ultimately as well. well how about that? We suddenly remember the taxpayers. We suddenly remember the taxpayers after they've cost the taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars with their absolutely absurd and bad management. Anyway, he's remembered the taxpayers. Taxpayers old me as well. The views of the workforce are a critical component in influencing our overall decision, but are not the only component. It was indicated to me in advance that the majority of workers in Port Augusta were of the view that the sales should now proceed, much as they don't like it, but they feel they need to put 
be put out of their misery, and I think that that probably was accurate. So given what the workers have said to you today, this is the interviewer, they would like to see the sale proceed, and yet it's over and done with. Is that likely to change your opposition to the sale at this stage? And this is the key answer. Ah, no, it's a factor in that concern, but ah, oh, I think some people possibly do have a view that Labor should get out of the road. Exactly. Labor Party, get out of the road and let us get on with it. Just to uh, remind the House uh, about the facts of AN, the uh, losses in 1995-96 uh, are $250 million. The debt stands at $800 million. Employment uh, has collapsed by 7,000 jobs in the past thir 13 years. And you don't have to be Einstein to work out uh, who was in the government in over the last 13 years. Since 91, 4,300 of the 6,000 jobs have been lost. 50 per cent of SA's rail network was closed by Labor and ripped up. The passenger service, Mount Gamba, Borough, Peterborough, Port Augusta, Wail and Broken Hills have all been closed. And uh, the list goes on. The issue of the apprentices, I will address and um, simply say that it is expected that there will be less than 50 apprentices who have not completed their training at the time the sale is finalised and redundancies are offered. A number of organisations have indicated an interest in taking the apprentices on. They include the Spencer Golf Training Group, uh, similar schemes in metropolitan Adelaide, the new owner will be keen to employ apprentices, particularly those who, whose training is more advanced. And uh, the House, uh, the uh, nation and the communities of Port Augusta and uh, Metropolitan Adelaide can be assured that both the Commonwealth and the state governments will be seeking to ensure that young people who are still being trained will not be disadvantaged by the sale. I repeat, will not be disadvantaged by the sale. So. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, I come to my conclusion in this uh, in comments on the conclusion of my comments on this sad and sorry business. I can only plead to the Labor Party. I say to the Labor Party, I refuse to beg because their conduct does not require me to do other than to put the facts before them and say, for the interests of the people of Port Augusta and the people of South Australia, I ask you to uh, proceed this legislation post haste. You will be, I think, um, I wouldn't wish you to, because of your conduct, to get benefit from it, but I, can I say to you, in the national interest, remembering what the member for Shortland said to me about the transport task and the future of rail, that uh, the future of rail can be quite dynamic. There is a great future for the rail industry of Australia. We need to give it the dynamism, the strength, the private enterprise ethic, the investment to make it and enable it to perform the transport task for the nation. There is much discussion since 1915, as a matter of fact, but in the last decade and even in recent weeks, about the Alice Darwin Railway. And I think it was Senator Bob Collins who said uh, in the 93 election, he said, well, no one believes us anymore because everyone, every time someone says they're going to build the Alice Darwin Railway before the election, they uh, renege on it afterwards. So no one really takes us too seriously. And we know that uh, the previous Prime Minister, Paul Keating, was not a fan of that railway. But nevertheless, there is a growing body of opinion and growing body of evidence which will make that rail a viable concern. But I have always been one that said it could only be a viable concern if it was based on a properly structured rail industry. This gives us the opportunity to have a properly structured rail industry which will enable projects like the Alice Darwin Line to proceed for the national good for the export industries of Australia particularly, and ensure the jobs of people throughout South Australia and throughout Australia, linked to the, particularly the export uh, production, but also linked directly to the rail industry and associated industries. So, 
to, in my final minute or two, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, can I say that over my four years in the parliament I have come to have great respect for the rail industry and for those people who work in it. And it's a tough industry. It is, I'm used to working with heavy equipment. I'm used to working with my hands. But the rail industry is, is uh, all heavy equipment and uh, it, it requires uh, certainly uh, uh, particular skills to operate in an effective and efficient and safe manner. And I have nothing but respect for those, particularly our forebears, and for those who currently work in the industry. Because those people who work in the industry now and those who have recently left the industry, in no way can they be held responsible for what has happened. It has been the poor leadership of government which has led us to this situation. And therefore, with the new government, coalition government, with its proposals, we will go forward into the 21st century with a strong rail industry, which I will be proud to support. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Parks. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's uh, somewhat ironic that we're discussing this bill here to go today because it was 142 years ago, in September 1855, that the first uh, rail journey occurred in Australia between Sydney and Parramatta. And uh, the railway then was owned by the government, but it was only because a private consortium called the Sydney, the Sydney uh, Railway Company had gone bankrupt and the government had to step in and take it over. And of course today we're debating about doing the reverse because the government's gone bankrupt and we're going to hand it back uh, to private enterprise. This bill provides a flexible fr uh, framework to sell all of Australian Nationals' assets except the interstate mainline track. And AN, as previous speakers have said, uh, operates the interstate rail passenger service, uh, services as well as uh, the South Australian uh, freight uh, within South Australia and Tasrail uh, freight within, uh, within Tasmania. Uh, National Rail, which uh, handles the interstate uh, freight, uh, commenced operations in uh, February 1993. It was hived off uh, by the previous government which sort of set up AN as it exists today to fail. But we're going to hand it over to a new rail oper operator uh, completely free of debt. And it's interesting to look at the Brew report that was set up by the, uh, by the present minister after we came to government. Uh, the present minister has done a magnificent job, I might add, in this area. Uh, the Brew report uh, revealed uh, uh, that a, a scandal had taken place in this country uh, that had been covered up because we were left with massive debt and this story was hidden from the Australian people. Um, the, uh, the story of AN is a history of, uh, of mismanagement uh, by the minister as he's mismanaged the aviation industry in this country in the past, uh, the previous minister. Uh, and also ANL, our shipping line, and we've had to, uh, to start to sort out those areas as well. It just goes to show that the previous government uh, couldn't handle money, couldn't run a business. And uh, the Department of Transport had advised the previous minister in 1992 and 1995 to do something, and he did nothing. And we, we were landed on coming to government with debts in excess of a thousand million dollars. An outrageous situation. And uh, he told us that for the last year that AN would lose, that's for 1995, 96, would lose probably $25 million. Well, what did we find when the figures come in? A debt for that year alone of about $250 million. I mean, this is for an organisation that runs only three trains, uh, for heaven's sake, the Indian Pacific between Sydney and Perth, the GAN between Adelaide and Alice Springs, and the Overlander between Melbourne and Adelaide. And that's the sort of debt they've been clocking up. Uh, the Brew report showed that the average debt per employee uh, 
was about $30,000 per year. But if things were let to run as they were, uh, that debt would have amounted to about $220,000 per employee by the year 2000. Incredible. Already the accumulated losses per employee is of the order of $415,000. The workshops were overstaffed about tenfold. Uh, we have 500 people in some workshops with only work for 50. They had 230 carriages when they needed about 140. And the saddest situation of all was what had happened to jobs. When we handed over in 1983, there was about 10,500 employed uh, with Australian National. Today, it's about a third of that, about 3,500 people. So uh, a shocking situation all round. We have a declining workforce, a declining market share and a spiralling spiraling debt. And just on market share, if you look at the figures, go back a few years, 1971-72, the Sydney-Melbourne run, uh, they had 48 per cent of the freight. Today it's about 22 per cent. And on top of all that, we've had a series of inappropriate government interventions, which led to decisions being taken for short-term political ends, uh, rather than a long-term vision. And we've ended up with a monopolistic provider of service with inflexible practices, unresponsive to the needs of the customer, and an organisation which is starved of capital. Now, the solution to all that is to get the government out of, of both the passenger side as well as the freight side, which will come later, and get private enterprise in who can inject capital into the areas that need it, can bring in expertise can bring in new ideas and can bring in enthusiasm. And this is not uh, a pipe dream. It's been done in virtually every other continent of the world except possibly Africa and the Antarctica where they don't run trains. It's been done in Europe, been done in the United Kingdom, been done in the United States of America, Canada, Asia, South America, even our near neighbour New Zealand, you know, where you virtually can't get into second gear and you're, and, and you're running up against the second running up against the coastline because of the small size of the country there, they've turned a, a, a deficit of $150 million around to a profit of, of $50 million or more in a short few years since they've privatised it. So in those other areas, uh, private operators have taken over moribund rail operations and they've reopened up old lines, they've constructed new lines, freight tonnages are up. There's been a focus on, uh, on customer service and new jobs have been created. It's been done in New Zealand, it's been done elsewhere and we're going to do it in Australia. The previous government was there for 13 years. 7,000 jobs went, a $1 billion debt. There was no way to service the debt. 50% uh, of the South Australian rail network was ripped up or closed down. Uh, they closed a, quite a number of passenger rail services. I mean, one of them uh, ran into my electorate between Adelaide and Broken Hill. Uh, Indian Pacific services were wound down when they closed the Trans Australia Rail Service, which supplemented uh, the Indian Pacific. So, a sad story overall. And what we found uh, with AN when we took over was a bit like the Labor Party after 13 years bankrupt and moribund, bankrupt and moribund, an incredible legacy. So we have decided to pay off the debt, to bring in private enterprise, to create a single entity to control and manage access in a non-discriminatory way to the line and uh, virtually to operate interstate passenger and later on freight services similar to the way the roads run now, where the government owns the roads but anybody uh, who, who's got uh, proper licensing can, uh, can come on and have access to the roads. We've done it with roads, we've been doing it for hundreds of years, why can't we do it with rail? It's, it's an unremarkable thing to do in that sense. Now as far as paying off debt goes, there's quite a bit to pay off. Uh, the restructuring costs are going to amount to $344.4 million. There's an interest bill of $9.1 million. Uh, the regional assistance restructuring, uh, 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 regional assistance uh, 
Uh, we're injecting $20 million in there because of the restructuring that will take place. We're, we're going to upgrade the track at a cost of $175 million. We'll give AN a subsidy of $30.1 million. The sale management costs will amount to something of the order of $8 million. We're going to acquire uh, the AN debt of $779.4 million, so that figure has risen since then, and we'll pay, we'll pay out all the superannuation of $580 million, though that, that may have fallen somewhat since that figure was, was given out. But, but a total of over $1,900 million we've had to find over and above the black hole uh, figure that, that was in the budget to, to, get, uh, to get the federal rail system in this country uh, uh, up and in a respectable state to be handed over. Now, if we can get private operators into the system, it will be the lifeblood of the rail system in this country, and particularly AN that we're debating here today. We were worried about who would be interested in the passenger services. We were comp more confident of, of who would be interested in the freight services, and that's to come later. But despite that, there were 56 expressions of interest, serious expressions of interest that came in. And we've, we've narrowed those down to 16, and a decision on that is imminent uh, uh, within a matter of uh, weeks or a, or a short few months. And we believe that uh, uh, that the, the future operator or operators uh, will be much more responsive to customers and will be able to provide upmarket tourism. Uh, you know, for example, the Indian Pacific that runs through my electorate between Parks and Broken Hill, it can be promoted for the first time as a world-class tourist experience, the same as is done with the Orient Express in Asia and Europe. Uh, with, the, uh, with the Canadian uh, Rocky Mountain uh, uh, train, with the blue train in South Africa that's done in other areas of the world and should have been done in Australia many years ago. Uh, if private operators come in, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, a surge of confidence back into rail. Uh, we're already seeing it to some extent in freight now. I mean, we've got SCT. Uh, and TNT operating between Melbourne and Perth. Uh, we've got Patrick, I believe, have not long started up between Melbourne and Adelaide. And only the other day I had the great privilege of uh, an honour of opening the, uh, uh, the FCL uh, organise, uh, organisation who are going to operate uh, freight between Parks and Perth. And, and, and on that line between Sydney and Parks and Broken Hill and Crystal Brook north of Adelaide uh, through to Perth, uh, the, the uh, closest point to Sydney where you can double stack containers because of tunnels and bridges, etc., is Parks. And so FCL have come in there on the conjunction of the east west uh, rail line and the north south uh, road line, the Newell Highway between uh, Brisbane and, uh, and, uh, and Melbourne an ideal point to, uh, to uh, start this operation, and they're going to double stack containers, containers up to 48 feet long. And we saw the first loaded to go to Perth. That will be a service running uh, five days a week over and back. Uh, and uh, you put a container on the rail in parks, 60 hours later it's being unloaded in Perth. And I pay tribute to uh, the managing director of FCL, uh, Bill Gibbons, who started that company in 1974. I think he borrowed about $3,000 uh, from the State Bank of Victoria. I think he was one of the few who paid his debt back. But uh, it's grown to one of the biggest uh, freight container uh, services uh, today, and it's you know it, it's a great tribute in, in the traditional history of, uh, of some very colourful transport operators that we've had, uh, had in this country. But that east-west rail line is underutilised by a factor of about fourfold. I mean, it's the shortest, quickest uh, and flattest uh, rail journey between Sydney and Perth, and it should be used more. And I am delighted to see that it's being used in this manner. And, uh, I think the thing that, that, that tipped uh, the success 
in favour of FCL uh, using this operation was that they, they finally won the email contract to shift white goods. And they've taken white goods off road uh, for long distance and they're now putting them on rail, which is something that uh, we all want to see, I believe. I might add that that Newell Highway, which cuts through parks on a north-south direction, is 1,682 kilometres in length between Brisbane and Melbourne. And uh, uh, in the future, I, I think we'll see a lot of containers coming down by road uh, into parks to be loaded on uh, rail to go west to Perth. So there is tremendous pressure there, uh, 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 tremendous potential there. And I might add, we've only had 600 metre uh, uh, length trains in New South Wales in the past. They're stepping up in length now. 900 metre train is equivalent to, uh, to 45 semi-trailers or 24 B doubles, or 1,500 metre uh, uh, freight trains are equivalent to uh, 75 uh, semi-trailers or, or 40 B doubles. So we can get some of that uh, freight off our roads. Now, having said all that, there's a pressing need to get this legislation through. Everybody wants it. Everybody except, that is, the federal ALP government. They are so out of touch with the rest of Australia. Australian National wants it, the operator uh, that we're talking about here today. The users of the service want it, which includes the, the passengers, of course. Uh, the workers in Australian National want it. They've even presented a petition to Parliament, I believe. Uh, the Coalition Government wants it, of course. Uh, everybody wants it except the Labor Party. And uh, um, I have here some, some, some letters. Here's one from, uh, from Rail 2000. Uh, the, uh, the executive officer, uh, Mark Carter, says, we support the sale of AM. If we delay this process any further, what you are going to see is that there will be no rural rail services in South Australia. The same is true for Tasmania. That's what uh, Mark Carter says. The, uh, in South Australia, the Australian Wheat Board, the Australian Barley Board and the uh, Cooperative Bulk Handling uh, have written a letter which says, uh, our view is that the sale proceed as quickly as possible. Uh, so they're in favour of it. Uh, the South Australian uh, farmers have put out a press release which says primary producers are frustrated by ongoing delays in the sale of Australian National. AN has no future in its present form. The, state, uh, the slate has to be wiped clean and we need to move on. The Federation wants to see a sale within the next couple of months. And then I've got uh, a number of letters here from, uh, from Kim uh, Thomas who uh, represents the AN Port Augusta Rail Task Force and he's written to various people including uh, the one I have here to Kim Beasley and he says the workforce is concerned about continuing media reports in connection with your persistence this is the opposition leader with your persistence in blocking the sale of Australian National so so they're very much in favour of it I, I would have thought the, uh, the Labor Party uh, would have uh, paid uh, close heed to those letters. Uh, Mark Carter also, in, in giving evidence to the, uh, to the Senate uh, uh, Reference Committee, said that uh, uh, we support the sale of a AN. Rail 2000 believes many of these lines that have been closed could have remained open had the opportunity been given to alternative operators. Later on he says, a private operator would look at the situation differently and would be more responsive to their needs. Over the last decade or so, and, uh, and over 1,300 kilometres of track have been lifted. And uh, he, he makes various other statements in, in favour of, uh, of private operators uh, managing AN. Joy Baluk, the Mayor of Port Augusta, says, you would have to be deaf, dumb and blind and with a Labrador dog to suggest that AN should continue to be operated by government. She goes on further to say, we had Laurie Brereton here on a number of occasions and he lied to the workforce. What we need in this enterprise here in Port Augusta is people from the private sector who are entrepreneurial and who are not tunnelled vision and got blinkers on. Um, Ian McSporan, the city manager uh, of the corporation of the city of Port Augusta said, council favours the privatisation of Australian National. And, uh, and so it goes on. Uh, 
In Launceston, the Chamber of Commerce, Mr Peter Cooper says, it is our belief that the system would be better operated in private hands. Mr Scott uh, McLean, the Assistant uh, State Secretary of the CFMEU, says they, that's the former Labor government, use TASRAIL as a political football. It needs to change, otherwise the only option is that it will close because it will continually run itself into the ground. And, uh, uh, there is testimony after testimony saying that it should, uh, that it should uh, be sold as quickly as possible and handed over to private enterprise uh, to manage it in a far better way than it's being done now. Uh, the head of uh, National Rail, uh, Vince Graham, also agrees with that, as does uh, Jack Smorgan, uh, the head of Australian National. So in conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, all Australians are in favour except for the Labor Party. And I believe that if the Labor Party has a conscience, they should expedite this sale as soon as possible so that we can revitalise rail in this country and give it a confident future. The Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, sum up today, and I think uh, all members have participated, and I will uh, refer to them during the day. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it's probably uh, fair to say that uh, in the last uh, two hours uh, we've seen the candle of uh, political uh, convalescence snuffed out. Uh, new Labor has flickered and indeed failed, and it's quite obvious, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Labor Party simply has not learnt the lessons of March 96, and they are not listening, and they have their heads absolutely buried in the ground. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to uh, thank in particular uh, the members for Adelaide and Gray, uh, who are actively involved uh, in this question. Uh, the member for Parks has just spoken. I thank him for his, his contribution. But I just want to go through some of the contributions from the other side, and I'll, uh, I'll talk about the Shadow Minister uh, shortly. But I just want to speak about the, uh, uh, the member for Fraser. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, what, on what authority the member for Fraser is talking about matters in the regions is uh, absolutely beyond me. But I suppose we shouldn't be surprised, given that uh, after the Canberra by-election, uh, the uh, Leader of the Opposition said uh, this is a clear message from regional Australia. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thought you might want to know that uh, the Electoral Commission actually describes Fraser as in a metropolitan. So here we are. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the Labor Party uh, regional uh, members talking about it when they're coming from seats that are described as in a metropolitan, which is utter hypocrisy. I thought the other interesting comment from the member for Fraser was the fact that he uh, uh, talked about the need for a rail vision, for a rail policy. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, this government has been in power now for some 14, 15 months. We indeed have a rail policy. It's in this legislation. And I don't know where the member for Fraser was uh, over the past 13 years of his, uh, of his government, but they had no policy. They had no policy. And that's why we are in this, uh, this diabolical mess that we're now in, where it is affecting a very, very special group of Australians, and that's the workers involved in AM. The workers who were effectively over 13 years tossed onto this scrap heap by this government. We then had the uh, member for Shortland, um, who is probably better known as the Cabotage Kid. Now, how you can get that into a speech about rail? is absolutely beyond me, but I suppose I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't be surprised uh, because I'm sure he goes to bed muttering cabotage uh, before he goes off to sleep. But he talked about the US rail system and talked about what was being done and how successful it was. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, the US rail system is now predominantly run by the private sector. They've turned around a moribund rail system and made it successful, and that's exactly what this legislation is designed to do, to turn around a moribund situation. So I'm glad that he raised it, but he should hang his head in shame for not getting his facts right about who was doing what, where. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I suppose you could say there are none so blind as those who will not see. And I'd now like to turn to the, uh, uh, to the shadow minister. To be speaker, I suspect in seven and a half years, uh, although I've been here, and for other members who've been here for longer, I very much doubt whether anyone would have heard a speech about such 
a matter of importance to this country which lacked so much passion. And the member for Melbourne simply didn't have his heart in this debate. Simply did not have his heart in it. And I rather suspect, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that's because the troglodyte quads have got to him. Beasley, Evans, Crean and Ferguson, the ones that have destroyed the young braves. And he is very much in that category. And he put his head up, he put his head up with something that he thought was appropriate for New Labor, and they knocked him down. And they knocked him down with great passion. And of course, when you've got a leader of the opposition uh, who uh, is intent on, uh, on uh, muzzling uh, uh, young MPs and knocking those who pretend to have a bit of vision on the head, you can see why this flame has flickered and gone out. Now, the other alternative is, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the member for Melbourne actually didn't believe the, uh, the, the uh, things he put in his uh, paper, populism and rationalism. Now, if he didn't, he should say so. If he did, then the, the uh, troglodyte quads should apologise for someone who was trying to do something constructive. And the most disappointing aspect of the speech from the member for Melbourne was his lack of vision about the rail sector and his blatant attempt to blame every single person involved in this except the ones that are truly guilty, and that's the party that he represents. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll only talk about that today because that was all the member for Melbourne wanted to do, was apportion blame to everyone else. And the classic, the classic was to attack the author of the Brew Report. Mr Brew himself. Now, that, in my view, was a disgraceful attack, and it was a grubby attack on someone who did no more, no more than tell the facts of life about what the former government had done in relation to AM. And I'll just go through it again, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I think the, uh, the House should be aware of it. I know other members have, uh, have uh, made some reference to it. Seven thousand rail jobs in 13 years. Fifty per cent of the South Australian rail network closed and ripped up. A billion dollar debt, one thousand million dollar debt with absolutely no way of serving us. Passenger rail service to Mount Gambier, Borough, Peterborough, uh, Port Augusta, Wyala, Broken Hill, all closed. Sixteen lines in South Australia alone 1,300 kilometres of track ripped up. The Brew Report went on to talk about the level of liability and the subsidy by the Australian taxpayer, which currently stands at about 30,000 per annum, which increased to about 220 if nothing was done. Business levels were decreasing, and there was no way known that AN could cover its costs, Mr Deputy Speaker. It was technically bankrupt. And the report also revealed a very interesting fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it was NR and the way the Labor Party had set it up that caused AN's problems. NR was given all the best assets and the revenue generating infrastructure, and AN was left with the debt and no possible way of repaying it. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was quoted, someone was quoted as saying that AN was doomed from the day NR began. Now, was that the Minister for Transport? Or was it me or was it John Brew? Or was it one of the AN rail workers? Was it? Was it? Do you, know, do you want to know who it was? It was indeed Senator Collins. Senator Collins, as reporters uh, in uh, the Senate Reference Committee here in Adelaide and Port Augusta, saying that AN was doomed the day NR began. Now, we have announced a $2 billion reform program, Mr Deputy Speaker, to fix the problem. That's just part. That's just part of our rail policy, and the part of any policy must be to fix the problems up before you head into the future. And it's been said today, Mr Deputy, ah, the shadow minister has arrived. Has arrived. I'm looking forward to his his participation. Thank you very much. And looking forward to his participation order, later on, order. Mr Deputy Speaker. The only the only ones, the only ones who haven't supported the sale of AM are the Australian Labor Party. Now, I cannot believe 
that they have got their heads so badly buried in the sand that they can put themselves right out on a limb, right out from everyone else, from industry, from AN workers, from users. You name them, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have got pages of them. I mean, the grain, the, uh, the farmers of South Australia, South Australian Farmers uh, Federation. It goes on and on and on. But I think the important ones, Mr Deputy Speaker, are from the families themselves, the ones that at the end of the day our primary concern should be about. Now, I, I don't for one minute think that the member for Melbourne isn't concerned about families, but he needs to be acutely aware that by being rolled on this issue by the, by the uh, troglodyte quads, that he has left those very people that he should be supporting, he has left them in an incredible lurch. And it is they, Mr Deputy Speaker, you know, not, the, you know, not the, the multi million uh, industry people, not those with vested interests, but it's the workers themselves, Mr Deputy Speaker, who have pleaded with him, pleaded with him to do something about it and let the sale go on. Now, he's been up there. He's been up there. To Port Augusta, I think only once, twice. twice. He's been there twice. And it's interesting, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, that the workers have pleaded with the Leader of the Opposition to go to Port Augusta. I don't think the Leader of the Opposition has been to Port Augusta, has he? He, he? he has had 15 months to do something about this. 15 months to show his concern for the workers in Port Augusta. And where's the invisible man been? Nowhere. Nowhere. But he sits across here during question time and smiles and that stupid little giggle talking about Newcastle. Talking about what the government's doing in relation to Newcastle. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, in Newcastle, which can be equated very much to what's happening uh, with rail in South Australia and Tasmania, this government moved quickly and swiftly to get people on the ground into Newcastle, to see what people wanted. But where have they been? Absent. Absolutely absent. And I think it's uh, interesting, uh, Deputy Speaker, if you look at a, uh, um, an interview from uh, Radio 5CK uh, between uh, uh, Lou Hendricks interviewing Len uh, Scharenberg from the AWU. Not industry. The AWU. The representative of the workers. And what, and what did? Well, I'll tell you what. If he represents some of them, he's representing 100 per cent more than you people are at the moment. Now, if you look at what, uh, what, has been, what was said there, the reporter asked uh, to Mr Scharenberg, uh, do you think the meeting was worth the effort? Did you get any guarantees at all from the shadow minister? Scharenberg, no guarantees at all. That's what we pause. One of the things we were hoping to get by him coming up is that he guaranteed that if the sale was blocked, they'd guarantee the existing jobs. But I oh know no such guarantee at all. Reporter, do you think there was any point in his visit at all? Sharonberg, well, going on that, no. Well, as I said, after a fair bit of soul searching, the pause, the majority of the workers in Port Augusta had agreed to a sale. We uh, continue with the quote. We've seen that as the best way of keeping the workshops viable and then to pause, to see our own people coming up and pause and endorsing the blocking of the sale. It sort of left us with a bit of egg on our face. Left us with a bit of egg on our face. Not just that. No, no jobs, no hope, no future if they get their way. And the reporter went on. Now, did it take you a long time to actually decide that a sale was a good option? And as we've heard before, people have said it didn't matter whose name was on the gate as long as there were jobs, but now it seems that you might actually be worse off than you were before. Yeah, well, it took 18 months of soul searching to come to that decision. One of the things that was put to Lindsay was, where was he in that time? Absent. Absent, absent, absent when it counted, Mr Deputy Speaker, absent when it counted, the Labor Party, absent when jobs counted, absent 
when the rights of workers in this country were being hung out to dry, absent, absent, absent. And where was the Leader of the Opposition? Where was he? Absent, absent, absent. I'll go on. The report has said, and so how, how are the workers feeling, Mr Sharonberg, between a rock and a hard place? Reporter, is there likely to be any light at the end of the tunnel, Mr Sharonberg? Well, we can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I must say, as much as it hurts me that after Lindsay's visit, we were in even, wor we were in even worse than we were before. We are in even worse than we were before. Well, I think they should hang their heads in shame, Mr Deputy Speaker, with that. I'd like now to uh, refer to an interview that the Shadow Minister uh, uh, did on a, uh, a drive program. Now, it was indicated—oh, uh, I could probably get about 15 minutes if I go through all the stuff that, all the stuff that you said. Um, in fact, I might take 15 minutes. I didn't think you'd want me to speak about this, but if you want me to, I'm happy to. Order. Now, Deputy Speaker. It was uh, the the, uh, the shadow minister uh, very generously uh, conceded that it was indicated to him in advance that the, that the majority of the workers were of the view that the sale should now proceed. But he went on to say, uh, obviously Port Augusta was only one work site out of a substantial number of AM work sites, so there are differing views amongst workers across the network. Well, there certainly weren't differing views at Islington, and there certainly haven't been differing views at Port Pirie and across the board, so I'm interested to hear from him where he thinks these differing views are. The only differing views in this, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the workers towards the Labor Party, the only difference in view is whether they're really bad or absolutely appalling. That's the only difference in view between the workers in, uh, in AM. Now, the, uh, I'm interested that the, uh, uh, that the Shadow Minister said he'd visit all the work sites. Now, if he has, and I suppose I've got to accept if he says he has, that he has, if he has, I'm utterly amazed that he seems to have come out with a different message than everyone else, than everyone else involved in this, that he seems to have come out, so he is bragging about visiting, visiting these work sites, but he seems to have come out with a totally different message. I'll just give you, I'll just give you another quote, Mr Deputy Speaker. Compare. So, given what the workers have said to you today, that you'd like to see the sale proceed and get it over and done with, is that likely to change your opposition to the sale at this stage? Mr Tanner, no. It is a factor in our consideration, but, well, how incredibly generous. How, all right. But, dot, 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 compare. You are not inclined to pull back at all. That's what the transcript says. It is not a factor in our consideration. But, well, Mr Deputy Speaker, how incredibly, how incredibly generous that the views of the workers, the ones that he should be protecting, are only a factor. Are only a factor. Well, I would have thought, Mr Deputy Speaker, they're not just a factor. They are the be-all and end of where you should be going, the where you should be going. But I think, I think the answer, I think the answer, I think the answer might lie. A bit later on, so it might. I think it might lie a little bit further on now when he talks about the involvement of the Australian national unions, and I think this is where the truth lies in this, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The represent. Oh, well, they've done it. Well, they've done. Well, the represent. Well, thank you, thank you very, thank you very, very much. The representative of the workers. Well, what a mighty job they've done for the AN rail workers. What a mighty job they've done looking after the interest. What has happened? What has happened is that your little uh, foray into the brave new world has been snuffed out by the ACTU, who have told you or the troglodyte quads that they are not prepared to do anything except adopt a pure philosophical view of life and indeed go down the path where you are prepared to sacrifice the very people, the very people that you should be looking at. And I think it's disappointing, Mr Deputy Speaker, that there is no acknowledgement at all uh, from the Shadow Minister uh, today about some of the other uh, matters in, the, uh, in his amendments about what the future holds. Now, he is acutely aware of the fact that not only did his party not have a policy, not only did they rip 7,000 jobs out of this, 
Not only were they responsible for the demise of AM, not only was it that, but they still don't have a vision for rail. It was the most incredible. It was the most incredible 28 odd minutes of excuses, and I think that the workers in AN, who were bitterly disappointed about the Labor Party at the start of this process, will be bitterly disappointed with the Labor Party at the end of it. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the honourable member for Melbourne has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. gave you a plug.
Vaktoros. Order. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Adelaide and Riverina tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Fowler, Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong as tell us for the noes. Thirty-seven. <laughs> Order. The result of the division is ayes 78 and noes 42. The issue is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
All members should remain in the same seats unless they are leaving the chamber or changing their vote, in which case they should report to the tellers. Members who did not vote in the previous division should also report to the tellers. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Adelaide and Riverina, tellers for the ayes, and the members for Fowler, Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong, tellers for the noes. Order. Would members please remain in their seats? Lock the doors. Order. The result of the division is ayes 79, noes 42. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. Second reading. A bill for an act to amend the Australian National Railways Commission Act 1983 to repeal certain acts and for other purposes. I have received a message from his order. 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 I have received a message from His Excellency the Governor General recommending, in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution, an appropriation for the purposes of this bill. Members should leave the chamber quietly if they are departing. Order. The House will, nil, will now consider the bill in detail. I understand it is the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole. The Honourable Member for Melbourne. Oh, I ask Leave of the House to move amendments one to four as circulated in my name together, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, I move amendments one to four as circulated in my name. Mr. Deputy Speaker. I speak to them. Thank you. Honourable Member. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the amendments that I've moved uh, in detail with respect to this legislation relate to one particular issue, and that is the future track authority that is proposed by this government, which was also proposed by the previous government. The net effect of this legislation that's put before the Parliament today would allow the government to constitute that track authority to make decisions with respect to its operations, its functions, its activities, how it will be financed without any further reference to the parliament. This in effect means that a major Commonwealth statutory authority will be established with a new set of functions without any reference to this parliament. So the purpose of these amendments is to extract from the legislation 
the specific references in the legislation that would enable this to occur. So going through them item by item, you'll see that in effect what they do is take out any power with respect to the two ministers named in the legislation to take action either to amend legislation or repeal it in so much as that may refer to the prospective track authority or any dealings whatsoever in the interstate mainline track assets of Australian National. As I've indicated earlier, Mr Deputy Speaker, the opposition believes it's a, it is outrageous that the government has come to the parliament with a piece of legislation on such a major issue that simply states that the two ministers concerned, the Minister for Transport and the Minister for Finance, shall in effect have complete power to make all decisions with respect to dealing with that organisation, including the power to declare acts of this parliament repealed or amended. And it is particularly outrageous that this, as it currently stands, applies to the prospective track authority which was put in place, or the plans for which were put in place by the former government and have been continued by this current government, albeit with substantial reductions in funding. So the purpose of these amendments is to ensure that the future track authority, if the government can manage to get itself organised enough to proceed with it at some future time, we've seen a fair bit of delay already and the negotiations with the states seem to have uh, stalled, but if the government can manage to proceed with it at some future time, hopefully sooner rather than later, what these amendments will guarantee is that when that comes about, this parliament will be able to scrutinise the legislation, will be able to ensure that the very important issues dealing with the future of rail track infrastructure in this country will be dealt with by the parliament, including by the Senate and prospectively any uh, legislative order. committee reference in the Senate. 2 p.m. The debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour and the member will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. The Acting Prime Minister on Ministerial Arrangements. Uh, Mr Speaker, there are no ministerial arrangements to advise today. Uh, was not appraised of. Mr Speaker, I inform the House the Minister for Industry, Science and Tourism, the Honourable John Moore, will be absent from question time today. Mr Moore is participating in the Australian Tourism Order. Exchange in Melbourne. The Minister for Science and Technology, the Honourable Peter McGoran, will answer questions in Mr Moore's absence. The questions without notice. Are there any questions to the Honourable Leader of the Opposition? Mr Speaker, my question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Has the Acting Prime Minister seen reports today that the Prime Minister has likened the extremism of the member for Oxley's One Nation Party with that of the former Ku Klux Klan leader David Duke and the leader of France's far-right National Front Jean-Marie Le Pen. Isn't it a fact that neither the Klan nor the National Front have little chance of election under voting systems which apply in those countries, but that our Senate system affords minor parties a much better chance for election and influence? Accordingly, will the Prime Minister now follow up? Will the Prime Minister now follow up the Prime Minister's concern? to marginalise the One Nation Party by giving a guarantee that his party will join with the Labor Party in refusing to give preferences to One Nation and request his coalition partner to do the same. The Acting Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to respond to the question asked by the Leader of the Opposition. I would advise him that in the recent uh, French elections, of course, Le Pen uh, grouping polled in the first round 14.9 per cent of the votes and went on in the second round. Uh, to in fact gain uh, a seat, a seat, uh, but nevertheless a seat in the parliament. Pauline Hanson, one seat, Federal Parliament, Australia. Uh, I might add that uh, the state. Uh, Order, members on my left. I might add that uh, this is an important matter. It is an extremely important matter. And, and I therefore would like to advise the House of another development this day in relation to this matter. In another place, at 12.45 this day, uh, the Leader of the Nationals in the Senate gave a very positive, powerful and persuasive speech with regard to the future and the Hanson agenda. And I commend the uh, contents of the speech because I have done it on many occasions, my friend. And, uh, I'm glad the Leader of the Opposition has corrected his front bencher with regard to this matter. Uh, and in fact, uh, last year and this year, I have repeatedly said the Hanson agenda is a dumb and divisive agenda for our jobs here in Australia and boosting, boosting our trade exports. With regard, with regard to uh, preferences, these are matters 
best finalised closer to an election date. Order. The, order. The, uh, order. Order. There is too much chatter across the too much chat across the benches. The honourable member for Fisher. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the minister representing the minister for Social Security. Is it a fact that young people are concerned that they can get more money being on the dole than they could from study or training? Minister, does the government or how does the government's new youth allowance address this perverse disincentive against study? And what other benefits will the youth allowance have for young people? The honourable minister representing the minister for social security. I wrote it. A member for Batman. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, the first point that I think needs to be made, uh, particularly to those who have been uh, fairly free with their interjections, is that in Labor's last year in office, youth unemployment was a staggering 32.3 per cent. Now, now, and uh, order. And, and this government's members on my right. And this and this government's priority is about members to give young left. people the opportunity Member of obtaining Denison. a job, and we're making changes to the system that are designed to achieve just that. And this will be a uniform set of arrangements for all young people that involves Member the amalgamation of payments. And this is a matter that's been long called for by a large number of welfare organisations. And I welcome particularly the support of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, who today have said that we've been asking for better support for this group of young people for many years, and finally their needs are starting to be recognised. And it makes the further point, and I quote, homeless young people are often forced to drop out of school or training simply because financial pressures are too great. 16 and 17 year olds who come to our services uh, have to meet the same costs as other young people living independently and the extra $12 a week are much needed. Um, and so uh, that uh, change, the amalgamation of payments, is something that has been long supported and sought. It was a matter that the former government uh, decided not to address. Uh, I don't know the reasons for that. The change, the change will mean that the majority of young people will be unaffected as a result of the change, and 137,000 will be better off. The uh, proposals, the changes, remove the disincentive to study, which saw the, uh, the dollars of the unemployed. Um, well, I mean that's what was happening in your electorate, and uh, this change will ensure this change will ensure that those young people will be in a position to uh, undertake studies. This is not about putting the unemployed down; it's about bringing students up. It's designed to encourage the maximum skills possible. We know that it's to encourage the maximum skills possible. The fact is that three times, uh, or young people were three times more likely to be unemployed if they left school at uh, the year 10 level than if they leave school at the year 12. And so this is about keeping them in education. It's about giving them vocational skills as well as the opportunity to study for degrees. And uh, if I can just, uh, just tell you of the, uh, of the nature of the change, 41,000 students will benefit from the abolition of the 1,000 per annum or study minimum entitlement requirement. 16,600 students will benefit from the independence criteria, which are more lenient than those which are currently apply under OS study. 19,900 former students will gain from the abolition of the education waiver period. Around 15,000 unemployed and 19,500 students most of them under 18 who are living away from home and or are independent will benefit from receiving an increased rate of payment. 9,300 continuing students aged 25 and over will benefit from the alignment of rates with the youth allowance. All youth allowance recipients will have access to the $500 loan advance currently available to the New Start allowance recipients. And for the first time, uh, young people will be entitled to rent assistance, and this will be up to $75 a fortnight. Um, if, uh, uh, in, well, it is true. It is true. Uh, particularly, uh, and, uh, and around 70,000 students will benefit from the extension of rent assistance, with an estimated average gain uh, of $31, $31 per fortnight. Uh, it's important for those in rural areas uh, because very often they have to, uh, they have to. Uh, travel away from home uh, to study, and it will be very important in assisting them. 
These are changes that are substantially beneficial to young people and, and are recognised as such. And that's why the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, amongst others, are applauding the government for being prepared to undertake these changes. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister on the same subject. Does the Acting Prime Minister recall the Prime Minister's Fair Australia speech delivered shortly before the last election to ACOS when he said, and I quote, it is not an acceptable response to the youth unemployment crisis to tell young people to stay at school. <laughs> Yesterday, the Minister for Social Security says it was, and indeed her counterpart in this House seemed to say the same, and she said, not legitimate to aspire to be a full-time worker at 16 or 17 and that young people should be in school or training until 18. Acting Prime Minister, why did you wait for the Prime Minister to fly off to Britain before announcing the comprehensive betrayal of that commitment? Is it because over there he doesn't have to look young people in Australia in the eye? The yeah. Acting Prime Minister. Ooh, how order. insincere. That, that jibe does you little credit, Leader of the Opposition. Little credit indeed. In fact, uh, the announcement was done by my ministerial colleague, the Minister for Social Security, in conjunction with other ministers. It uh, was done with the full approval of the Prime Minister, who is involved with every aspect of that decision. And why wouldn't he be? And why wouldn't he be proud of the fact that, in fact, the announcement is actually in accord with the very quote you've uh, read from? Uh, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. What you forget is what this coalition is doing as part of and paralleling the youth package, we're providing 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships next financial year. And so there are other alternatives there. Yes, they can go back and stay in school, or they can go out and get apprenticeships and traineeships. We are providing incentive, whereas all you provided was an encouragement to go on the dole and do nothing. The Honourable Member for the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, I uh, and It goes back to the heart of that question. Oh, Do you agree with the Prime Minister when he said it is not an acceptable response to the youth unemployment crisis to tell young people to go to stay at school? The question is in order. The Acting Prime Minister. More alternatives than just staying at school. The Honourable Member for Sturt. Uh, thank order. you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Young people in my electorate of Sturt Order. who leave school early are most at risk of joining the unemployment queues that are a feature of Labor's legacy. What will be the benefits of the Common Youth Allowance a for young for people will. of school age? The Honourable Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Here, here. Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for his question. The Youth Allowance is uh, another major reform that the government is putting in place to Absolutely. help young people uh, get jobs. And uh, perhaps its most important feature, which clearly the Leader of the Opposition does not appreciate, is that it gives young people a very clear message, a very positive message, that if they, if they want to go on and get jobs, they need education and training. The fact is that if you look at the 30,000, if you look at the 30,000 <coughs> hardcore unemployed young people in this country today, left as a result of your policies, 64% of that 30,000 30, unemployed young people who were shut out of the labour market left school before year 12. Left school before year 12. The, syst the, system, the, the system which the Labor Party supported gave young people the message that it was a viable and sensible alternative to education and training to go on the dole. You, 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 supported, a system, you, you supported a system which provided financial incentives for young people to leave school and go on the dole. You, you, those young people have now become have now become the most disadvantaged group in this community, and you are shutting your face. You're shutting your face against the fact that people who deal with young people all the time, like the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, know that this is a measure which is going to provide young people 
with opportunities that they never had under your policy. The minister will resume his place. On a point of order, Mr Speaker, the Minister for Schools and Vocational Training continues to defy your direction that all comments be directed through you. He is doing it now. No, I, I ask you to draw I him the to order. order. I thank the honourable member for Hotham. The minister is aware of the conventions of the House, and I invite him to address all his responses Whoa. through the chair. Mr. Speaker, the, the system supported by the Labor Party gave young people a order. very damaging message. A damaging message which the community understands and which parents understand that it was all right it was all right to go on the dole as an alternative to school or training it was okay to throw up school and, and it was okay to live on the dole now that is the message that the government is not accepting and we are giving young people a new and very clear message that what they should do to secure their own future is to get the skills to get the training to get the education that will actually allow them to secure the job they want. Even, even, the, even the member for Sydney admitted, admitted that the Labor Party failed those 70 per cent of young people who are, who are not going the, on to university. Has the minister concluded his answer? The minister concluded his answer? Contemptuously at the end again. The uh, honourable member for Jagger Jagger. He knows he has to throw it in at the last line now. We'll be awake to him next time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Can he confirm that an unemployed young adult aged 19 and living at home in a family with a total income of $36,000 a year will lose $121.10 a fortnight under the government's youth allowance? The Honourable Speaker, Acting Prime Minister. Advise the House is two things. Firstly, everyone on a new start allowance or sickness benefit the member for will have their payments grandfathered under the announcement. Member for Jagger, and Jagger that in respect of means tests, which is what the nub of your question is, we are in fact uh, being more generous and increasing Labor's cut off from 37,000 to 41,000 in relation to a family with one child at home. I would add one other thing. because. I am prepared to have uh, officials examine each case you might put up, because at the end of the day people are going to be far better placed under the Youth Allowance Scheme. And that is reflected in the Daily Telegraph editorial today, which has said that taxpayer-funded holidays that the young and comfortably directionless have taken between school and adulthood are now over. The Youth Allowance is, and I quote, an astute and practical recognition that the notion teenagers can drop schooling as soon as the law allows and still be confident of getting good jobs has long been discredited. I salute the Daily Telegraph editorial. It is absolutely correct in endorsing this incentive-building scheme which will help provide job opportunities for the young people of Australia. Order. The Honourable Member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Minister, what measures has the government introduced to improve quality training opportunities for young people, and what positive effect will these measures have on the employment prospects for young Australians? The Honourable Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Riverina for his question. The government is in the process of implementing the most extensive vocational education and training program for young Australians in this country's history. The, the, days, the, days, the, days when young people, the days when young people could easily pick up an unskilled job are gone. The structure of the economy has changed dramatically since the early 1980s. The tragedy for young Australians is that the Labor Party, in its 13 years of office, did nothing, did nothing to address the needs of these the young people. The minister will resume his uh, goes to relevance. The, uh, leader of the On this on particular the occasion, the question that was directed at him did not invite compare and contrast or anything else that was out there in the market. It merely sought his own government's response, a response which I might say at, at its best merely built on what we did and in generality cut it. I, uh, but no, no uh, point the point is relevance, Mr the, Speaker. 
I'm listening very carefully to the ministerial response. The question revolved around opportunity, creating opportunities for the young, and the minister is addressing that question. Minister. Mr Speaker, the, the government is filling the void that the Labor Party left for young students by providing young people in this country with quality training and incentives to do training instead of going on the dole. As the Deputy Prime Minister said, the government next year is funding 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships funded through the May budget. These will be apprenticeships and traineeships in industries where job growth is occurring in tourism, hospitality, finance, sport and recreation, as well as in the traditional trades. This year there will be an additional 55,000 places in TAFE as a result of the government's policies, and uh, 43,000 of these places will be funded through the Commonwealth. The Australian National Training Authority has identified over $300 million already going to TAFE which can be the basis for providing further job growth, up to 100,000 extra places a year in TAFE uh, in uh, the next five years. The Jobs Pathway, the Jobs Pathway Program is providing opportunities for schools and others in the community to, pro to provide uh, jobs for their young school leavers. For the first time, the government is putting into place programs that will provide school students with the opportunity to do extensive vocational education in industry endorsed courses in schools with part-time traineeships and part-time apprenticeships based in schools. How different is this, Mr Speaker, from the short-term training programs through which the Labor Party attempted to recycle young people and, and the program of support for young people on the dole, which actually encouraged them to leave school and to stay out of education and training because the financial incentives were all the other way. This government is committed to giving young Australians a positive future. The incentives are being put in place by the Common Youth Allowance and the reforms we are making to the apprenticeship and training system and to vocational education in schools will provide opportunities which they were denied under the previous government. The honourable member for more. Here, here. <laughs> Does the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs stand by his assertion that we are winning the war against drugs when experts like the police commissioners of Victoria, Western Australia and Queensland the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence, crime fighter Bob Bottom and others are saying the country is awash in heroin. Now that heroin is openly being sold at $7 a pop on the street by 12 to 14 year olds, does the minister now concede that cutbacks to customs have debilitated the fight against the importation of drugs? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Oh, that's a fine Who said that? You ask him to Mr. Mr. Speaker, I demand that be withdrawn. Yeah, you've got to withdraw it. Come I on, ask on, withdraw it. A point of order, order uh, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the House on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you may not have heard it, but uh, the uh, member for Batman accused, uh, made, an act, made, made an allegation about the minister of the dispatch box in respect of what is sold in, out of his shops. That is a totally offensive remark, and he should do the right thing and withdraw it. I, uh, order. In the, in the normal hubbub of uh, question time, uh, the, the Minister is right. I did not actually hear the comment, but uh, if the comment, as alleged, was made, then I ask the honourable member for Batman to withdraw. Mr. Speaker, order. Yeah. Order. Yeah. order. Yeah. on my right. Mr. Speaker, there was no suggestion we are going to debate. There was no suggestion that the minister was showing him the shopping centres. We're not going if to he takes offence, then, then I withdraw it. Allegation, then I the suggestion was that the reduction in expenditure on the police may result in people is withdrawing not it. Listening. I the warn the member for Batman. No. No. Well, Mr. Speaker, with respect, the minister. My point of order, Mr. Speaker, I did not hear. You may have, but I did not hear an unqualified withdrawal, which is what is required. Well, as I said earlier, there is a lot of hubbub, and the. Debating chamber is increasingly disorderly. I ask the 
Honourable Member for Batman to withdraw. I thank the Honourable Member for Batman. The Minister for Small Business uh, and Mr. Consumer Speaker, Affairs. Mr. Speaker, in regard to the uh, question that was asked by the Minister for uh, the uh, Member for Moore, in regard to, uh, of course, customs, there have not been there have not been any staff cutbacks at all in the uh, border control area. Indeed, what uh, we have done is last Order. year we uh, we increased the amount uh, to some $26 million over four years to go towards new technology for the customs service. That equipment will go towards extra uh, equipment, backscatter X-ray, uh, CCTV, to enhance customs' role in the war against drugs. Member for Prospect. Now, Mr. Speaker, some of the uh, the benefits of that uh, new equipment is already uh, feeding through. The member may well be aware that recently a substantial seizure involving heroin, the, the street uh, value uh, up to uh, 100 million dollars, was as a result of that new technology. Mr Speaker, it is a combined effort between the enforcement agencies in this area, combined uh, with the uh, effort and the commitment the that we are uh, giving to the Customs Service. This year's budget uh, also contained measures to increase the Customs Marine Fleet. That will increase from six to eight the vessels and increase the, size of the, uh, the, uh, the fleet size from 25 metres generally, a fleet designed in the days when uh, Customs had uh, had uh, control to the 12 nautical uh, mile limit, and customs now, of course, have control to the 200 nautical mile EEZ. Uh, the new fleet, when it comes on stream, will give <coughs> customs the ability to respond with larger, more appropriate vessels to stay at uh, uh, sea longer. The new uh, Coast Watch contract, Mr. Speaker, increased the capacity of flight surveillance uh, last year by 190 per cent. So we are not taking uh, for granted our commitment to our war against uh, drugs, and I uh, note that the, uh, the member's uh, uh, interest, long-held interest in this particular area. But customs at the border control uh, have, with the new equipment, uh, been very successful to date in our border control area, together with the other enforcement agencies in trying to stop drugs coming into this country. I might add, to date, the seizures for um, compressed cannabis amount to some 25 tonnes, for uh, cocaine 66 uh, kilograms and heroin to date this year 152 kilograms. The Honourable Member for Petrie. Thank you Mr Speaker. Order. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. What are the benefits of the government's policies for debt reduction and budget repair for young Australians in my electorate of Petrie? The Honourable Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Petrie for her question. Uh, as, the Deputy, as the Acting Prime Minister uh, has already indicated, this government's policies in relation to apprenticeships and traineeships in relation to the Green Corps have been very pro-young Australians. And the introduction of the youth allowance is but another measure to encourage young Australians and to give them incentive to go into education and to get the skills that they will need throughout their life. But Mr Speaker, I want to place this in another economic context, and it's this. Nothing could be more anti the young people of Australia than the policy of deficit and debt of the Labor Party. The policy of deficit and debt of the Labor Party was a selfish policy. What it essentially said is that the Labor Party would use funds it didn't have today to try and buy votes and send the bill to the young Australians of tomorrow. And it's the policy of this government to rescue the young Australians of tomorrow from that crushing burden of Labor Party debt. Mr Speaker, in the five years from 1990, the Labor Party ran up cumulative deficits of $58 billion, $58 billion for a cumulative, cumulative loss of 50,000 jobs. A cumulative loss of 50,000 jobs over five years on nearly $60 billion of borrowed money. Mr Speaker, that borrowed money didn't just go away. That borrowed money has to be serviced year in, year out by the Australians of today, by the Australians of tomorrow, who will be paying taxes to fund Mr Beasley, the finance minister who presided over that economic malaise. As a result of his failure as a finance minister, generations of young Australians are going to be servicing the debts 
that the Keating Labor Party and the now Keating Labor opposition have visited on them. Mr. Speaker, it is the policy of this government, first of all, to get government living within its means and during the course of the next financial year not to borrow, not to borrow, but to repay Commonwealth debt. For the first time in a decade, the burden on future generations will be lessened in the forthcoming financial year as opposed to the Labor Party policy. Mr. Speaker, these are the government's efforts, first of all, to balance the Australian accounts, secondly, to reduce interest rates, thirdly, to reduce government debt and fourthly, to give the young people in future Australia a go. Mr Speaker, make no mistake, the Labor policy of deficit, debt, high interest rates was an anti-youth policy. An anti-youth policy. Mr Speaker, it was condemning future generations to a crushing burden of debt and taxation from which they would not have escaped had it not been this government's determination to turn it around. And I suppose, Mr Speaker, having created the problem, the Labor opposition then sat around and took every step they could to try and prevent the solution to the problem. They came in here, Mr Speaker. They voted against measure after measure. They were determined to inflict a continuing deficit and debt misery on future Australians. And the best thing that can be said, Mr Speaker, is that they were unsuccessful in their efforts. The Australian economy is back on track. The fiscal accounts will be balanced. Debt will be repaid, and young people will be the great beneficiaries of that economic program. The honourable member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Can he confirm that the coalition's youth allowance will mean that 16 and 17-year-olds who have not finished year 12 and who are not in full-time post-school education will get no income support and will have no access to labour market programs which might help them get a job? Isn't it a fact that these young Australians won't even be eligible to participate in the government's apology for a labour market program, the Work for the Doll scheme? The Honourable Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Mr Speaker, the, the, the uh, youth allowance uh, is designed to provide uh, an incentive for young people, 16 and 17 year olds, to go back into school. We are not giving them the message <coughs> or, to, or to get accredited training. We, we, are, we are not oh, going to give them Dennis. the message that the Labor Party gave them that it is an acceptable alternative to go minister, the minister, on the dole. Minister will resume his seat. The on the point of order, order, the question went to the people who had finished year 12, not those who had yet to complete it. And I would ask you to direct the minister to answer that yes, question. I'm listening very carefully to the answer. At this stage of the game, there is no point of order, Minister. <laughs> Members on my right. The, the question, as I heard it, Mr. Speaker, order. related to 16 and 17-year-olds who are not in school, and, 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 and who, who, are, who, are, who are not in school, uh, or in training, or in training. Now, those, those, those young people, those young people, uh, if there is education or training available to them, will will, will not Bell. receive will not receive the dole, because the incentive is that they must go back and get the skills they need to get them jobs. If they are not receiving, if they are in receipt, if they are not receiving, if they are not receiving. If they are not receiving uh, a full uh, allowance or benefit on youth allowance when they have left school, they are not eligible for work for the dole. They do have the opportunity, they do have the opportunity to access the, uh, the job search assistance that is provided by the government. All young people, all young people have that opportunity. But for the first time, and if, if they are are unable to access education or training because of exceptional circumstances such as sickness uh, or homelessness uh, or if there are traumatic job circumstances uh, or if there is no education or training available, 
Uh, they, they, will be a, they will be able to access the youth allowance, but they will be required, they will be required to undertake uh, activity under an activity agreement. The point is that the dole, as a single, simple alternative to education or training, is no longer going to be available to those 16 or 17 year olds. The honourable member for Red, Red order. order, the leader of the opposition. The honourable Thanks, member Mr. For Speaker. Herbert. My question is addressed to the minister for primary industries and energy. Does Australia now enjoy the prospect of a new market for the export of live cattle into China, minister? What actions are being taken to exploit this market opportunity for the benefit of cattle producers in my electorate of Herbert and across Australia? The Honourable Minister for Primary Industry and Energy. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Herbert, who has a real interest in this matter, for his question. He's a constant battler uh, in his quest uh, for uh, a better performance for Australia's uh, uh, meat industry and its exports. And uh, I am very pleased indeed to be able to announce that after detailed negotiations with their Chinese counterparts, the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service officers in this country have successfully concluded a very important agreement on health conditions for the export of slaughter cattle to China. It's the beginnings of what will, I think, develop into a potentially very, very significant export trade. It effectively opens a door for large numbers of our cattle to enter the Chinese market. It should result in a major boost to trade. And I'm advised that the Chinese plan to import 60,000 head each year for the first three years of the agreement, after which an expansion to 100,000 head per year is likely. And this represents a deal worth potentially hundreds of millions of dollars. Hard-pressed beef producers from the southern areas of Australia will particularly benefit, but right across the nation there will be increased support for prices in a sector that at the moment is experiencing real difficulties. And, Mr Speaker, as the trade builds, it will reinforce Chinese confidence in Australia's health status, potentially open direct opportunities for live cattle exports from other geographical areas as well, uh, and is in general terms very good news for uh, rural Australia. Last night, too, we signed a memorandum of understanding with China over anthrax designed to avoid disruption to trade in the event of disease outbreaks here. This is very important indeed. Uh, people have to have security in our capacity to handle these things. Both agreements, I should say, Mr. Speaker, demonstrate the government's commitment to opening Asian markets to Australian agricultural products and keeping them open, uh, having opened them in the first place under the Prime Minister's Supermarket to Asia plan, and reinforced, if I may say so, Mr. Speaker, very ably and in a very committed way, not only by the Minister for Trade but also by the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Now, it should be made, the point should also be made that these exports are absolutely essential for jobs especially where we really need jobs, and that's out in the regions, uh, where unemployment has been very, very high indeed. And the point can also, I think, be usefully made that you know, we could, with perhaps just one out of three or four of our farmers, produce enough food and fibre for our domestic markets. All the other farm sector and the uh, industries and the employment in those industries that support the farm sector depend upon export markets for their livelihoods, for their jobs. And so the opportunities of the sort that I've just outlined give us a real chance not only to preserve jobs but to create new jobs in rural and regional Australia, especially for young people, given the very high levels of unemployment we inherited amongst young Australians from the previous administration. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Does the minister recall telling the House that he was not involved in, quote, the daily work of any business, unquote, as set out in the Prime Minister's Code of Ministerial Conduct? Does he also recall on the 18th of May this year being asked about taxation reform on the Channel 9 small business program? And he replied, one thing I can say is that I still employ people myself. I see the forms that governments send through. I still see those sorts of things come through. Do you still stand by the answer you gave yesterday? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. 
Mr Speaker, I comply with the Prime Minister's ministerial guidelines. The Honourable Member for Bradfield. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Could the Treasurer inform the House which, which section of the community is carrying the heaviest taxation burden? Does the structure of the current taxation system provide disincentives for work, productivity and employment? If so, how? The Honourable Treasurer. The uh, uh, Mr. Treasurer will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Court will on a point of order. Uh, the question he asked for an opinion and is out of order. No, the, the question is in order. I do not uphold it. Mr. Treasurer. <laughs> Members on my right. Uh, I, I thank the honourable member for Corwell for his interest, and uh, and I hope uh, that uh, I can. Uh, I think I hope that I can answer the question to uh, to his satisfaction, Mr. Speaker. He was uh, he was my second year politics tutor at Monash University many years ago. <laughs> I hope, that, I hope the treasurer is not what? trying to damn with faint praise. Oh, no. <laughs> I owe him, a, Mr. Order. Mr. Order. Mr. Speaker. I owe him a lot. Uh, he put me off left-wing politics for life. <laughs> Order. Uh, the subject was the morality of power, Mr. Speaker. Um, Anyway, the member for Bradfield has asked me about uh, has asked me about the income tax system, and uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it is true that the uh, the Australian uh, taxation system uh, does not <coughs> equitably share the burden between uh, the various bases that uh, are used to collect tax in Australia. In Australia, by international standards, the indirect tax base is a narrow base and is a declining base. Conversely, the income tax base has borne more than its fair share in relation to the raising of revenue uh, in Australia. Australia's top marginal tax rate of 47 per cent cuts in at about one and a half times average earnings. And the second top marginal tax rate of 43 per cent is also very high and cuts in at a little over average earnings itself. Mr. Speaker, they are the marginal tax rates, notwithstanding the relief given by the coalition to families under the family tax initiative, which of course was vigorously opposed by the Australian Labor Party uh, and uh, in particular by the member for uh, Werriwa, who interjects now uh, because he was of course opposed to the family tax initiative and reducing the tax burden for families. <laughs> Mr Speaker, that means that uh, whilst Australia's top marginal tax rates are quite high by international standards, they cut in at very low multiples of average earnings. Part of the reason is, of course, Mr. Speaker, that our indirect tax base is a declining tax base. The Australian indirect tax base is uh, principally focused on goods and in modern economies, of course. It is the services sector of those economies that is growing uh, the fastest and taking an increasing share of gross domestic product. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, you will often hear manufacturers in this country complain. Uh, that the indirect tax system features so heavily on goods, uh, and because it features so heavily on goods, the indirect tax system is a special disadvantage for manufacturing industry, and obviously those uh, who have an interest in manufacturing uh, industry would support uh, a broadening in relation to the indirect tax system, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, of course. Uh, one can't overlook uh, the difficulties in relation to the income tax system and because of the way in which it impacts the incentives that there are to try and avoid the application of the income tax system and the level of advising and costs that go into avoiding the operation of the income tax system in Australia. It's important, Mr Speaker, for any government to constantly attend as well to closing down loopholes in relation to the income tax system and broaden the base of the income tax system in Australia. Uh, Mr Speaker, this government has a very proud record of achievement in relation to this. Uh, it was this government that closed down the R&D syndicates. 
which had closed down the R&D syndicates, which had become an absolute hemorrhage in relation to the income tax system. Mr Speaker, you'll hear the Leader of the Opposition interjecting because the Leader of the Opposition wanted to preserve R&D syndicates. He wanted to preserve R&D a CJO that thought if they could offer a way of avoiding income tax that was being closed down by this government, they would go to those people who were using them and, in an effort to try and buy cheap votes, oppose the closing down of R&D syndicates. Mr. Speaker, and well may he turn his back at this point, a matter of shame by the Australian Labor Party, which was not prepared to support measures to widen the income tax base. Nor could we forget, Mr Speaker, it was the Australian Labor Party that was opposed to the superannuation surcharge. Great concern in the Australian Labor Party to income earners over $85,000, whose tax concession had changed from 33 per cent the, uh, under the Treasurer, ALP Treasurer policy. Will resume his seat. The honourable member for Newcastle. The, the on a, point of order. a point of order. The question was about which groups and other disincentives. On May 26, you wrote to us. On May 26, you wrote to us. You wrote to us saying the seat. point. Mr. I'm allowed to make a point. You've, you've made a point of order point? on which I have ruled. Can I please make on it first? Can you've, I finish it first? You've, you've made the point. I haven't made it. You are debating the issue. I haven't. Resume Mr. Speaker, your I'm not seat. the Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, and of course one of the groups that bears the heaviest burden of income tax in Australia yeah, are PAYE PAYE uh, taxpayers. You have taken on board, I hope, my comments about I have. points of order. You're, on You're, May twenty sixth, my point to you is uh, on the point of order is you wrote to us saying I intend to require that a minister does not digress from the point of the question directed. The question from the point of the question was, directed, I'm, not the general issue. I listened very carefully to the question asked. I'm listening very, question, very uh, carefully to the response by the Treasurer, and it is completely within order. The Treasurer, the Honourable Member for Bradfield. Yeah, point of point order. order, Mr. Speaker. It, it was the, quest, the question was asked no, by me. There is no point. I want, I I've, want to I've ruled on this. The Treasurer will respond. Uh, and Mr Speaker, as the honourable member for Bradfield asked me about those sections of the community carrying the heaviest taxation burden, one of, one of the reasons why the PAYE taxpayer carries such a heavy burden of income tax was the amount of avenues that were open for high income earners to avoid their fair share. That's, that's, that's one of the reasons why the PAYE <laughs> taxpayer carries such a heavy burden. Now, what were, what were the chief mechanisms for high income earners to avoid their, to avoid their fair share of income taxation? R&D syndicates was a ripper. It was a ripper. It made, it, it, made, it made paying income tax quite voluntary. The superannuation surcharge for somebody over $85,000 gave you a 33 per cent tax concession if your salary sacrificed, and the Labor Party opposed reducing the tax concessionality. The Labor Party opposed it. Infrastructure borrowings, if you were over $135,000 of annual income, infrastructure borrowings made it voluntary to pay tax if you got into the right scheme. Who introduced it? The infrastructure borrowings were introduced by the Australian Labor Party, now crying crocodile tears as a result of this government's efforts to clean up the income tax system. Mr Speaker, this government has taken a very robust view to making sure that we protect the PAYE taxpayers and, again, CJO, cheap jack opportunism. The Australian Labor Party opposed those measures. Opposed those measures. The friends of the tax schemes, the Australian Labor Party, which opposed the measures. Now, as I said before, Mr Speaker, if you are looking at improving the Australian taxation system, of course it is important to widen the indirect tax base. But it is also important, Mr Speaker, to make sure that the income tax base is wide and is not easily avoidable. That is very much a part of this government's approach to taxation. Very much a part of this government's approach to taxation. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker the only regret that we have is when we do do it, you cannot rely on the Australian Labor Party for any help whatsoever. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Order. I refer the Minister to his Bunbury Various Lots pecuniary interest return, 
Does the minister have any franchisees as tenants in his shopping centres? If so, given he still has responsibility for implementing the recommendations of the Fair Trading Inquiry on franchising, and in particular recommendation 3.1, is this a not another conflict of interest? If not, why not? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs will resume his seat. The Right Honourable Member for New England. Mr. On a point Speaker, of order. there is a problem in terms of our standing orders and the responsibilities of members of this place. I don't know how many members of the Labor Party worry about privacy, but I suggest to you that there are obligations within the standing order. orders of this place, and with the law passed regarding pecuniary declarations, and this question is out of order because it requires an answer of a member beyond his ministerial responsibilities and beyond the legislation order. Order. There is no, no point of order. beyond the said. legislation which requires a defined specification order. only is, of pecuniary interests. There is I no would point suggest of order. The, the question is out of order. There is no point of order. The minister Mr. Uh, Speaker, um, my uh, register of uh, uh, members' interest is on the House of Representatives' um, uh, register. On the second part of the question, the government will respond to the House of Representatives' inquiry in due course. The Honourable Member for Metro. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Administrative Services. And the I ask the Minister, order, can the Minister. Order. I'll, I'll hear the point of order. Would you resume, the Mr. honourable Mr. member for cutting on the point of order? Mr. Speaker, I go again to your um, uh, letter to each of us in this place about questions and responses from ministers. Quite clearly, the question that I put to the minister asked about tenants and franchisees in his shopping centres. That was not responded to. And, second, and secondly, it, uh, it went to the issue of conflict of interest because the Fair Trading Inquiry specifically makes recommendations I, I, about franchising. I'm listening very carefully to the Honourable Member for Cunningham. You, you are debating an issue without coming to a specific point of order. The Minister feels that he has completed his answer, and I have called the Honourable Member for Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my, my question is right. addressed order. to the Minister order. for Administrative Services. Can the minister advise the, the House? Uh, Honourable Member for Mitchell, begin uh, his question again. Yes, sir, Mr. Speaker. My question is directed to the Minister for Administrative Services, and I ask the minister: Can he advise the House why the government strongly supports a voluntary ballot to elect delegates to the Constitutional Convention? The Honourable Minister for yes. Administrative Services. We didn't ask you for your opinion. We're asking the minister. The member for O'Connor. <laughs> Mr Speaker, could I prefix my answer by extending my uh, congratulations to the Right Honourable Member for New England and the Member for Lawler on their appointment as the, uh, the Chairman of the Constitutional Convention. And may I say, Mr Speaker, that this convention is not to decide whether or not Australia is to become a republic, because that can only be done at a full referendum, which of course would require a compulsory attendance uh, ballot by all registered voters. And the vote is not compulsory because, unlike parliamentary elections, it's not about determining governments and the ballot will not confer any obligations or any particular powers. And frankly, we were not prepared to impose a law which would make Australians guilty of an offence if, if they chose not to vote uh, for delegates to this convention, particularly when a lot of Australians really have yet to come to grips with the complex and difficult issues in this particular debate. In developing the system, the government set out to design an election process which was fair and convenient and, importantly, it was to be cost-effective. We started from the proposition that the voting system should be broadly based on the Senate system, provide proportional representation, and that would be uh, uh, allowing the uh, independent groups and uh, individuals to have a fair chance of being represented there. Can I also say that the system will be similar to uh, the Senate process in as much as people will be able to vote above the line for uh, the particular groups uh, or the groups of independents or below the line if they want to go through the full preferential system. And quite frankly, contrary to the assertions of the ALP, the election is going to be open and accessible to all electors, regardless of their background and experience. 
Mr Speaker, the government does remain firmly committed to a voluntary vote for the election of half the delegates to this convention. And we do want all Australians to vote. We will encourage them to do so, but we are not going to force them to participate. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I again refer my question to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Minister, is franchising part of your ministerial responsibilities? And if so, do you have any franchises in your shopping centres? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, Order. I will be handling the government's response. Order. I will be handling the government's response uh, to the Fair Trade Inquiry on the question of uh, franchising. The Honourable Member for Broome. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice. Order. A member for Denison. Mr Speaker, my question without notice is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. My question without notice is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I refer the Minister to reports coming out of Bali yesterday. A trip a member for Burke. I'll start again, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Is the Minister aware of reports coming out of Bali yesterday attributed to a high-profile Indonesian businessman who contended that Indonesia does not need Australia in a geopolitical sense? Would the minister please indicate uh, to, to the House the importance for both countries of that bilateral relationship? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm happy to uh, happy to respond to the honourable member's question, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, remarks were made by one of the Indonesian participants at the conference yesterday of the Indonesia Australia Business Council. Um, to the effect that um, Australia needs Indonesia more than in Indonesia needs Australia. But as both the Indonesian ambassador um, uh, to Australia and the Australian ambassador to uh, Indonesia, as well as I said later on in the day, the fact is that both countries are of great importance to each other and are of mutual importance to each other. Indonesia is, uh, Australia is clearly important to Indonesia as a source of uh, technology as a very important trading partner. It's uh, an important country to Indonesia uh, um, in uh, a whole range of very specific commodity areas. And uh, frankly, Mr Speaker, I don't think there is any doubt that, uh, as was pointed out yesterday, Australia is a country which is, in geopolitical terms, very There's important too much to Indonesia. Noise on my left. Uh, we've given a very, um, uh, a very uh, heavy emphasis to a strong relationship between each other, between Australia and Indonesia, and uh, of course the strength of that relationship simply reflects not only the geopolitical importance to Australia of Indonesia, but the other way around, the importance of Australia to Indonesia. That's well recognised by the Indonesians, and it's well. Uh, recognised uh, both here in Australia. So, Mr Speaker, can I just take the opportunity to add that during the course of the, uh, during the, course of the meeting in Bali, I had the opportunity to discuss at some length the bilateral relationship between Australia and Indonesia with co the coordinating minister for, Pro for production and distribution, Mr Hartato, and uh, it was an opportunity for us to discuss issues in the trade area, such as uh, developing synergies between the Australian and Indonesian automotive industries. Um, I think there are very good opportunities to develop that relationship um, further than uh, is currently the case. And uh, I'm glad to say that um, uh, Mr Hartato responded very positively to uh, the representations I made in terms of developing a relationship between the Australian and Indonesian automotive industries. Um, so I think, Mr Speaker, um, that um, uh, the relationship with Indonesia in broad terms, in economic terms, in terms of uh, cooperation in the security field, um, in terms of education exchanges, which are growing all the time and quite dramatically, I think, uh, and of course above all at the political level, the relationship is one that uh, is extremely strong and one that both sides recognise despite some differences from time to time and despite uh, difficulties from time to time, is one very much of mutual benefit. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the minister made any approach to or had contact with any director of Coles Meyer or with Western Australian planning ministers, both past or present, or their departments, in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer minister. Affairs. The Minister will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for North Sydney on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I, I fail to see how that's related to the ministerial responsibility of the minister. It's a specific question about his personal interests and is unrelated to his ministerial responsibilities. I uphold the point of order. The question is out of order. The Honourable Member for Aston. Mr Speaker. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour, say no. no, no, right no, no. Right. 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 Mr. Speaker, we have. Uh, no. No. We'll give them. No. Mr. Speaker, no. I move no. that this House no. dissents from the Speaker's uh, ruling. Did you get, did you get that right? You'll do anything to protect him. Mr Speaker, there is no more important function performed by this chamber than it holds ministers accountable. That is absolutely the central feature of this question time process. Absolutely the central feature of this question time process. The question that was just asked of this minister goes to business relationships that he conducts at the point of time that he happens to be a minister. That is what the question was about. It dealt with the minister's uh, position as far as uh, his business involvements were concerned in relation to those three shopping centres, which he has manifestly, and I would say too, in breach of the standing orders of this place and the requirements of this place, manifestly refused or failed to place within his register of interests. And that's another matter that this House will have to deal with, I believe, at some point of time. But what is, uh, and perhaps it would have been a bit easier to deal with it now in, question to this, in regard to this dissent from your ruling, had there been an honest return from this minister in this statement of his interests uh, in this place. Because had there been an honest return from this minister, there could have been no question that this was front and centre within the rights of this House, members' rights in this House, to ask ministers, the minister question about, questions about his situation. Now, the guide or the code of conduct which every minister signs up to in this place, which uh, is honoured more in the breach these days than it is in the undertaking, but as the Prime Minister admitted, was a code of, a code of conduct which was effectively replicated while we were in office and for ministers subsequent prior to our, appoint, uh, our, our appointment to government, requires that, among other things, a minister shall not conduct the affairs of his businesses. Uh, when he happens to hold a ministerial position. Right. And it, is, it is not just a question of appearance, it is also a question of absolute propriety. But appearance is important in that regard as well. But when you go over from <coughs> simply the statement of whether or not those interests do exist to active promotion of business concerns as far as, the, uh, as, as far as the minister's portfolio is concerned, you are getting right at the heart, right at the heart of whether or not disinterested government is run in this country, whether or not disinterested government. How can it possibly not be relevant? How can it possibly not be relevant for the Minister for Small Business Affairs, who is conducting the, uh, an inquiry into both the situation of people with franchises and also the situation of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, people in tenancies and the po possibilities of oppressive conduct, who has answered an array of questions in this House on this, that place, who has referred those matters to a parliamentary committee, who has had a report on those matters, who is handling those matters for the government, and he had just responded earlier on, I might say, to a question on uh, uh, the c conduct in relation to franchisees, conduct in relation to franchisees, that he was still responsible for the development of government policy in that matter, even though in regard to the question of oppressive conduct in relation to tenants, he is, while he is developing the policy, evidently the Prime Minister, evidently the Prime Minister has removed uh, that particular uh, uh, authority from him. 
And uh, he now finds himself in a situation where he has a question directed to the heart of his propriety on this. Has he conducted with the West Australian government, indirectly or directly, in, uh, verbally or in writing, uh, a uh, lobbying or pressure or whatever on behalf of his business interests? Has he had any discussions with a director of the Colesmeyer board in relation to uh, any of the, uh, uh, the tenancies uh, in in, uh, uh, for, his, uh, for his particular holdings? And you rule that matter out of order. Frankly, Mr Speaker, there is no logic in that ruling. None. If there is logic in that ruling, Mr Speaker, then this House cannot query ministers as the propriety of their conduct on anything, on anything at all. And let me just go through, because I, because I had not had before me, not having for, the, for one minute, for one minute expected that I'd have to stand in this place and challenge a Speaker's ruling on this matter. For one minute I didn't actually have the code of conduct with me. But let me, uh, let me read, this, uh, read this out. Ministers are required to resign directorships in uh, public companies and may retain directorships in private, com private companies only if such company operates, for example, a family farm, business or portfolio of, of, of investments, and if retention of the directorship is not likely to conflict with the minister's duty. Uh, ministers uh, uh, must uh, not accept retainers. Ministers must be honest in their dealings and must not mislead. Ministers are required to divest themselves of all shares and similar interests in any company or business involved in the area of their portfolio or responsibilities. The transfer of interest to a family member or to a nominee trust is not acceptable. Uh, ministers should not exercise any influence obtained from their public office or use official information to obtain any improper benefit for themselves or another. I mean, it goes on and on. Ministers must, uh, should not accept any benefit where acceptance uh, uh, might give an appearance that they should be subject to improper inf influence. Uh, ministers are required to make statements of interest in accordance with the arrangements determined by the Prime Minister. The, uh, and, uh, and every single one of these has, in one way or another, Every single one of these has, in one way or another, been breached by this minister at some point of time in the course of the last year. That's what he's supposed to be and to come for. down to a position now where it is not possible to question this minister on the conduct of his portfolio and the relationship of the conduct of his portfolio to his private business interests denies any validity to the role of this parliament in holding accountable a minister both for his standards and for the conduct of his portfolio. Now, I never expected to get up and have to get up in this place and rule a dissent from your ruling, because I never expected that we would have a situation here where you have upheld standards in this place and have tried your very best to uphold standards would so comprehensively collapse at the barrier would so comprehensively collapse at the barrier. And uh, I do think, Mr Speaker, that you ought to think about this ruling very carefully. I don't know why you arrived at this conclusion, having, persist having permitted a whole series of questions which went to precisely this. What particular error in your hearing or whatever that there was in regard to what was put to you by, um, uh, by the member for Cunningham? But, uh, and I, I might read out one other of these particular standards, because this absolutely, absolutely goes to the heart of this. Ministers, this and subsequent references to ministers should be read as including parliamentary secretaries, must not engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. I stress that, or in the daily work of any business the central guideline. They must not engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. Now, Mr Speaker, if the minister has had discussions in relation to tenancies in his shopping centres, if he has had discussions in relation to them, if he has approached directors who have in their control some capacity to determine whether or not somebody will take up a tenancy, if he has approached a state government with regard to any planning authorities that are associated with uh, his business activities, if he is handling on a routine basis employment issues that pass across his desk—and I remind you 
that earlier on a question was asked on that in which he in fact openly said that he is handling those employment, uh, uh, employment considerations. There can be simply no question, no question at all, that what the minister is doing is engaging in the daily work of his business. What else is the daily work of a business of a person who owns shopping centres other than the question of who tenants the place, uh, the terms and conditions in which those tenants go in, the terms and conditions laid down for the expansion or development of those places, the terms and conditions that are associated with the employees, what is daily work? What is daily work if that is not daily work associated yeah. with a business? Yeah. And what does pri pri proprietorial standards mean in this place if there is no relationship or no capacity to identify a relationship between decisions being taken by a minister and the business practices of that minister. No, that daily activity, that daily activity I might, uh, 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 that I refer to, of course, uh, would preclude the minister from involvement no matter what his portfolio was. That is a prohibition not simply against a minister's role as a minister and what his business interests might be. So it would not be, if that were going on, it would not be required of us as an opposition to establish, in fact, a direct relationship between the two. It would not be required of us to do so. In this case, of course, we can. In this case, we can because the ministerial portfolio covers the sorts of business arrangements that he is directly engaged in his daily work. Were he to be the Treasurer, were he to be the Attorney-General, were he to be the Minister for Defence, it would still be possible for us to question him in this regard, because this prohibition doesn't simply go to direct relationships to the Minister's duties, it, also, it goes to the activities of a Minister generally. But in this particular instance, it does go. So it is doubly culpable, culpable of a minister, doubly culpable of a minister, that he should confront this issue, and that he should be asked, uh, and he should be capable of being questioned about it. And if you rule that out in this place, Mr. Speaker, uh, then there is a uh, then there is a deal of trouble for all of us. Now the Prime Minister frequently defends his positions now, and in words that. Uh, I remember Charlie Court once saying that uh, he didn't want a minister to have the seat out of his pants. The Prime Minister says further it's a good thing for him to have uh, uh, ministers in this place who have had business interests and the experience. Member for Burke. I would not dispute that. I don't think it's a bad thing at all that members of this House should have had business experience. Uh, but there is a point of time when choices have to be made. When you become a minister, choices have to be made. You either make a decision that you are going to be able to uphold your ministerial duties to the highest standards that are imposed upon you, or you're going to do something else. These are issues that ministers have to con confront continually. Sometimes the appropriate response of a minister is to absent himself from cabinet if there's a clash, and a clash that is not likely to be regular. Sometimes there's a necessity to hand the responsibility for a particular portfolio's conduct over to another minister on a narrow area of, uh, of that minister's position. But sometimes it's necessary for a minister to make a choice and to decide that he will either divest himself or put himself at, at demonstrable arm's length from a particular activity, demonstrable arm's length, if he is going to be able to do his affairs appropriately. But one thing a minister cannot do under any circumstances on, these, on a, reading, a proper reading of these particular uh, circumstances, one thing that minister cannot do under any circumstances at all, and this is not a question of standing aside from a particular decision every now and then, one thing a minister cannot do under any circumstances is engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. The daily work of any business. Now, I know, Mr Speaker, that you would have trouble discerning what the government's intentions are in regard to the operation of the Code of Conduct, and this would be to some extent mitigating you, uh, in your, uh, what we believe to be an incorrect ruling, because this government has absolutely no standards when it comes to enforcing its standards. This government has, uh, has, run, away, has run away from it repeatedly 
when questioned in this place, and it has to be said that the, these ministerial standards remain under review 15 months after this government has been appointed. We still do not have them finalised. But nevertheless, the Prime Minister made clear that why, why he nevertheless, while they are nevertheless going down the road of, um, the, of uh, revising those ministerial standards, these ministerial standards would continue to apply. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, so they should. And I can recollect, Mr. Speaker, and I've actually had the numbers uh, asked of him, that when the Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, Mr. Keating, was on the other side of the chamber and in this place, he was subject to 14 questions in relation to his priggery from Hewson, McLaughlin, and all at those uh, at that particular point of time. Not one of them ruled out. Right. Not one of those oh, questions ruled opinion. out, and, not, and the Prime Minister's defence was consistently, insofar as that piggery was concerned, is that he had absolutely no contact absolutely. with the day-to-day -day conduct of that exactly. business. No contact whatsoever question with the day-to-day -day conduct of that business. Quip, and question after question was trying to establish whether or not he had. Questions were asked as to whether or not he had intervened with the New South Wales government in terms of environmental processes that have been put in place. Questions were asked as to whether or not he had intervened with consumer affairs in relation to New South Wales on some other aspects of it. Questions were asked whether or not he had actually tried to influence local authorities in relation to the conduct of his piggery. You will recollect those, Mr Speaker, because you were in the chamber when those questions were asked. All of them. All of them asked directly to the Prime Minister at that, uh, at that point of time. Fourteen questions. questions in all, not one ruled out. Fourteen questions. Now, what has been asked of the Minister directly by the uh, member for Cunningham is simply this. Minister, have you had contact with a, uh, a director of Coles Meyer? Have you had contact with uh, any person in the West Australian government related to the conduct of your businesses in Bunbury? It's a simple, pro it's a simple question. A simple question that goes to the very heart of his personal accountability. Now, it has to be said. It has to be said that if you did not actually sit down and, uh, if you had had indeed sat down and worked your way through the uh, the particular propositions uh, that are related to his declaration. You could be excused from thinking that maybe this wasn't entirely relevant, but uh, by now I think it should be entirely obvious to you that one of the most misleading documents currently circulating in the uh, chamber at the moment is the Register of Members' Interests, yeah. insofar as it affects uh, the conduct of this particular minister. Yeah, yeah. Where we have three shopping centres and I think also a petrol station, three shopping centres and a petrol station with 80 tenants in those shop shopping centres as described as Bunbury. Dash various lots. <laughs> Perhaps it ought to have been a little more accurate if it had been Bunbury, comma, various, comma, lots. Full stop. That might have been a more accurate description, but it would still oblige the minister to put those uh, put those questions, those positions down. Now, the common way in which this has been handled in the past, the common way in which this has been handled in the past has been for not the value of any particular shareholding to be uh, outlined, not the value of any particular property obtained or, or owned to be outlined, uh, nor necessarily its address, but an accurate description of what is owned. That is what has generally been required, and members conform. They usually say we have uh, a holiday home or a, uh, or a block of flats or, a, uh, or whatever it is. They don't put down Bunbury various lots for three shopping centres. An accurate rendition of this would have been three shopping centres. That would have been an accurate rendition and one petrol station would have been an accurate rendition probably, uh, insofar as we know it thus far, the, uh, of the members' interests. Uh, but uh, that has not appeared here. But the fact that it has not appeared here and therefore alerted you as a person who is a diligent student of these particular returns on, uh, on people's interests, as the Speaker must be, a diligent student as the Speaker must be, uh, you by now will have nevertheless have had it firmly revealed to you by us that there is inadequacies here and that there is a potential area of a conflict of interest. Enough of it. 
enough of it for the Prime Minister at the beginning of this week to take responsibility off him. Off him. To take responsibility off him. The Prime Minister certainly now thinks this is relevant. That's why he took responsibility for one area of presentation to Cabinet off him and handed it to the Minister for Industry and uh, Tourism. Unfortunately, not much of it, just that part that deals with the Cabinet submission uh, process in Cabinet itself. The, de the development of those codes of conduct, however, remain within his hands and have been within his hands up until the beginning of this, uh, and indeed the presentation to government, up until the beginning of, uh, of this week. And so anything that is historical in that regard is relevant as far as accountability is concerned. And a new front is opened up here now with its responsibilities in relation to franchising arrangements and the potentiality of particular franchisees, both at his petrol station and of course in his shopping centres, to uh, produce for him a conflict of interest in this regard. Mr Speaker, I conclude in this dissent motion, which I move with very great reluctance and considerable surprise. You must, as Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uphold the capacity of this House to query the government and the government's minister's handling of all aspects of their portfolios. You must, above all, permit this House to be able to query a minister about a clash between personal private interests and ministerial duties. This is the only place in which these queries can be made on behalf of the Australian people. The only place where confidence can be, have be established for the Australian people that they are impartially governed. If the opposition is denied it in this place, it will be a precedent. No opposition has been denied it by, before, certainly not by us in 13 years in government, and you should act now to reverse your decision. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I second the motion. Mr Speaker, I have to admit, when uh, this question was actually put to you today. I was somewhat staggered when you ruled it out of order. And uh, perhaps I, along with the member, member for Watson and your good self, would probably be in a better position to know about these sorts of issues, not to forget, of course, the member for Flinders, because, quite frankly, uh, the question that was put here and the reason that we've uh, dissented from your ruling did nothing more than endeavour to elicit questions and answers from the Minister for Small Business about issues which have been the subject of some discussion and concern in this place for a period of time now. And uh, it struck me as somewhat odd that past history in this parliament, when your predecessors allowed questions on a variety of issues, which the Leader of the Opposition has already referred to, that a question of this nature should be <coughs> ruled out. And as the Leader of the Opposition pointed out, at uh, different times during the course of the last parliament, something like 14 questions Mr. Speaker, were allowed to the Prime Minister about his private interests in terms of the piggery, and it could well have been suggested then that it had nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities and ruled out. But the learned Speaker of the time allowed it to pass. And I'm sure those that are now in government thought it was a great idea at the time. And secondly, of course, we had examples of when the honourable member for Fremantle was under a degree of questioning in the last parliament. The same thing applied when questions were put to her about the Labor Party, nothing to do with her ministerial responsibilities, and again allowed to pass. So, Mr. Speaker, I have to say we find it rather strange that this particular ruling has been handed down, and we do so also, sir, for a number of other reasons. The first is that it has been clearly established, clearly established in this place that the Minister for Small Business has a conflict of interest when it comes to his ownership of property and his responsibility to develop small business policy on behalf of the government. Now, we have ascertained that that is the case from no other source than the fact that the Prime Minister has removed from his responsibility responding to the retail tenancy issues contained in the Fair Trading Committee report. He has been removed from that and John Moore, the Minister for Industry, given that responsibility. Now We still haven't worked out when it happened because in question time on Monday the Minister and the Prime Minister in here were still saying that the Minister for Small Business had that responsibility. So by 3.30 that was still the go. By 7.30 that night on the 7.30 report, the Minister for Small Business owned up and said, oh, that's now gone to John Moore, the Minister for Industry. They've taken it off me 
because there's a conflict of interest. Well, interestingly, of course, Mr. Speaker, and again one of the reasons why we've taken uh, exception to your ruling on the question that was put, is because another area of conflict of interest has been exposed to this minister, and that is in the question of franchises. Because if one looks at the fair trading inquiry again, you see in recommendations in section 3, particularly 3.1, dealing with franchising, it goes directly to his own personal interests, because in his own shopping centres there are franchisees that occupy positions there. Cash converters, uh, chicken treat and farmer jacks— order. The honourable member for Cunningham will resume his seat. Uh, the minister Mr. on a point of order. Well, Mr Speaker, I mean, it is quite clear that on a motion which is to um, dissent from your ruling that the speakers must keep you know within sort of some parameters of that now we 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 were a mate we were a mate i remained silent in the first presentation which also which also Order. which also Remember strayed but this uh the honorable member for cunningham is is clearly well and truly beyond uh the requirements of a motion of this sort in terms of relevance i thank the, uh, the minister the honorable member for Kalgoorlie on a further point of order Mr Speaker, it would seem to me that your ruling would have, I, I'm, I'm seeking advice because it will influence how I vote. Had the opposition framed their question to ask had he had any contact while he was a minister, it seemed to me it would have been order, but they didn't in fact do that. They asked at any time. Would that, would that actually influence your judgment? The simple answer is yes, uh, but there is no point of order. Uh, I call the. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Paul Speaker. Cunningham Mr. Speaker, again, and, and I go to the simple fact in linking and encourage him to stay. In linking why we have dissented, why we have dissented from your ruling in respect of that question, is because you have allowed other questions that go to eliciting information from this minister, or at least attempting to elicit information from this minister about his dealings. And the simple fact is, when we put questions to him today about franchising and whether there were an existing franchisees in his own stores and his own shopping centres, he said, I'm complying with the guidelines. And we're dissenting from your view that further questions about franchising, about his private dealings in shopping centres, about whether he has been talking with representatives Coal Myers board or talking to planning ministers in Western Australia to get some advantage for his own business interests in Western Australia really means that you have, sir, taken the right option to rule questions of that nature out of order. And we would simply argue that's not the case. Now, the point that needs to be made again, Mr Speaker, is this. If this minister does not have <coughs> any conflicts of interest, and if you therefore have to subsequently rule further questions to him about his business dealings out of order, why then did the Prime Minister remove him from responsibility in retail tenancy issues? Yeah. And as a, as a logical extension of my question as to whether or not you will continue to permit questions for this minister on other issues, the fact that he does have this interest with, with, uh, with franchising again raises the question about who now, on behalf of the government, will respond to the Fair Trading Inquiry report in terms of those recommendations. And if, in fact, Mr Speaker, this minister is removed, the question then goes, who do we then continue to ask questions of in this place, given the Prime Minister is not here to give us some satisfactory answers? And it goes again to the fact, sir, whether you would rule out those sorts of questions if we address them to the Minister for Industry, Science and Tourism as the Portfolio Minister and has now been given some responsibility, whether we address them to the absent Prime Minister, whether we address them to the acting Prime Minister, because I'm sure he would have an interest in this as well. But the simple fact is, if there was no problem, Mr. Speaker, about this minister and his pecuniary interest declarations and the Prime Minister's code of ministerial conduct, we would not have asked these questions. And we not, would not therefore be in this position where you have ruled one question asked by this side of the parliament out of order. Now, the Leader of the Opposition simply, again, went to some very fundamental but basic points in support as to why you should rever re reverse your ruling on this matter. He went, of course, to the Minister's registration of members' interests and his real estate and, 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 and noting, as we have all seen before, Bunbury various lots. And if this minister is to be believed, if this minister is to be taken seriously by this place and by retail tenants 
and by retailers in Australia and their associations as being dispassionate, as being an advocate on their behalf, why did he not list him here that he was a landlord? Why is it that he's gone out three days after, Mr Speaker? This report was tabled and said in terms of franchising he doesn't agree with any of those recommendations and always wanted voluntary codes. Why is it that this minister in last year's budget cut the funding for the Franchising Code Council? Now, you could ask a few questions like that, just as retailers have been doing. And, uh, uh, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, many of these retailers in his own shopping centres have been doing that. They've been asking the questions. We're trying to ask the questions here, and you're knocking them out. One of the questions that one of his own uh, his retailers said, uh, a Mrs. Oh, no, I better not identify, because you know he's a landlord. But uh, uh, he shouldn't be the federal minister for small business and such a major landlord. She was reported to say in the media. We have a number of franchises in our centre, I've named those, and I don't know how Jeff can be making decisions about what happens to franchises either. Well, Mr Speaker, either do we. Either do we. And that's why we are putting questions that go to this minister's direct responsibilities. Now, the other matter, of course, links his hands-on daily work and his hands-on approach to his businesses while still being a minister of the Crown. And the Prime Minister, in bringing down his ministerial guidelines, which, quite frankly, I think the Prime Minister set now so low in terms of the high jump bar that they're not even worth worrying about. These ministers walk through them as if they don't exist. The member for Cunningham will resume his seat. The honourable member for O'Connor. The process of dissent to your ruling relates to the standing orders, not the prime ministerial edict on any matter whatsoever. And it is it is incumbent on those speaking to the dissent motion to do so, pointing out where your ruling has failed the standing orders. And I would draw your attention to 142, where it says. Questions must be maybe put to a minister relating to public affairs, but I would ask that uh, you ask the member to get think, back to uh, the standing. The honourable member for uh, O'Connor, I have uh, encouraged the honourable member for Cunningham to address the specifics of the dissent motion. <laughs> Absolutely, I Mr. Speaker. I, I will intend comment. to. I, I intend to do just that. And as I said to you earlier, Mr. Speaker, we are. But, we have a right and a duty in this place to put questions to ministers about their responsibility. We have a right and a duty on behalf of constituents around this country to say to ministers, do you have conflicts of interest? If you do, what does that mean in terms of the Prime Minister's guidelines for, for ministers? And it means nothing. And if we can't put questions in this place for fear that they are going to be ruled out of order by yourself, then we are indeed in a great deal of trouble. And Mr Speaker, we've all seen the editorial in The Australian today where it concludes that this minister should go because there is a conflict of interest. And we have said that. We have established that. And retailers around this country are saying just that. They want us, on their behalf, to put questions to this minister about his dealings on a daily basis. Does he see the tax forms come into his companies? Do those people that are managers of these shopping centres, does that impact on our ability to ask him questions about whether that conflicts with the Prime Minister's code of conduct? And they do. They do. His manager of one of his shopping centres, Colin over there, is reported as having to say, well, you know, I have to go and have a chat to Jeff occasionally to find out what we should do. Now, is that part of the Prime Minister's guidelines for being divorced in a day-to-day -day, day -day basis in looking after shopping centres? And what about the West Australian Retailers Federation Mr. Mr. Uh, Association, Mr Speaker? They want questions asked because what they've said in a letter to the Prime Minister is that given you've already demonstrated your leadership in issues of conflict of interest, integrity and probity, in particular that of the banking vested interest, we so no, see no reason why Minister Prosser should not be treated similarly to his colleague Mr Short. Well, dead right. Mr Short's going to Europe to a banking job. Maybe the Minister for Small Business has to go back to Bunbury to put a full hands-on approach to his own business interests. But, Mr Speaker, the questions that we wish to put in this place and which we wish to put on retail tenancy issues, on the questions of franchising, on the questions of the Minister's hands-on day-to-day 
dealings with his business interests, in the questions of whether or not there has been in, uh, in some way an approach by this minister, now or at some stage when he's had responsibility for small business, about each and every one of his shopping centre developments, whether in the past or proposed, we would like to be able to do that without fear, sir, of you saying to this side of the place they are out of order. And we would ask you to go back and look at, uh, at, look at the Balin book and look at some past history there to get the historic Hansards, look at what was allowed by your predecessors in terms of prime ministers and their, their activities. Look, sir, what happened in the Senate in respect of some senators when they were asked questions about distant related cousins in faraway islands of the South Pacific and whether or not that was ministerial responsibility at the time, and whether those sorts of questions were allowed. Of course they were. But when it's this side of the parliament, when it's the Labor Party asking questions about ministers who have dealings on a day-to-day -day basis, when there is a clear conflict of interest, Mr Speaker, inexplicably, they seem to be ruled out of order. Now, why is this so? We would say to you, sir, it is incumbent upon you, having listened to the argument for the Leader of the Opposition and myself, to reverse your ruling, allow that question to stand, allow the Minister for Small Business and Customs and Consumer Affairs to come to the dispatch box and to tell us once again how he hasn't breached the Prime Minister's guidelines, how he should remain in control of responding to the Fair Trading Inquiry report and why the retailers of Australia should have every confidence in him as a landlord that he'll do the right thing by them. We wait for the answer, Minister. We look forward to that answer, Minister. Here is your opportunity. Don't fob it off to the Leader of the House. Don't fob it off to him. Come to the dispatch box, answer those questions and tell the people out there that you represent that you'll do the right thing by them. The question and motion be agreed to the Leader of the House. Order. Order. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, uh, the government will oppose Order. the. The member for Watson. Mr. Speaker, the, the government opposes the uh, dissent motion moved by the leader of the opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the opposition, quite frankly, they were too quick. Uh, they were too impatient. Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, can I remind honourable members? Can I remind honourable members that the question, which is the subject of the dissent motion, was not the first question to the minister today. In fact, it was the fifth question. The fifth question to this minister today. Uh, there was a question from one of the independent members. Uh, he was. Uh, the question was put to him. He answered it. Uh, there were. There were then. There were then three questions. There were then three the questions, Mr. Banks. Speaker, which were put to the uh, member, which were generally on the subject matter, uh, which uh, is now in the dispute. For uh, he answered each and every one of those questions. In fact, Mr. Speaker, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the right honourable member for New England, in fact, rose on a point of order on a claim that one of those questions was out of order, and you ruled the question in order, and you required the minister to answer it. Now, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a very technical issue. This is a very technical issue. The question is whether or not the question that was asked was in fact within the uh, requirements of the standing orders. And before I answer that in that in detail, the simple facts are, Mr. Speaker, the simple facts are this: uh, from a practical point of view, you, roll, you ruled the question out of order. If the if the question had then been uh, the opportunity to ask a question that would then have gone to the government, and then it would have been the opposition's turn, and they then could have asked a question which was within order. So this claim, this claim that you know this uh, ruling of yours has prevented them asking questions of the minister is clearly false. One, he's been asked three questions which he answered, and furthermore, he would have he would have been answering further questions on this very issue if only. If only, Mr. Speaker, if only those on the other side, with all the experience of sitting in your seat and running tactics on the other side, had only been smart enough to understand, as the member for Kalgoorlie pointed out to them in his, uh, uh, in his uh, engaging question to you, 
as the point he made it to you was, well, if the question had been properly drafted, would you have allowed it to have been asked? And the answer obviously is. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, so they were just too quick. Too the quick. And as for as uh, I've seen the Leader of the Opposition make many presentations, I'd have to say today's was one of those rather more lacklustre presentations, which, is, which betrays that he doesn't have his heart in it, because as a former Leader of the House, he well knows that on any fair reading of the standing orders, Mr Speaker, the ruling that you gave Member was entirely, entirely consistent with many previous rulings by uh, uh, speakers in this house well no I will answer the question I will answer that question in some uh, in some detail but let me let me just uh, before I go to the technical arguments say mr. speaker you acted fairly you acted properly and furthermore you acted consistently during question time and uh, uh, it is uh, it says a lot about this opposition. They don't even understand how to use the standing orders to run an attack on a government minister. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, my uh, uh, understanding of the question is now it's interesting that neither of the two speakers on the other side actually stood up in the House and repeated the question. Didn't repeat the question. And in fact, I read over. I read. I, I lent over the. I lent over the uh, bar table during the uh, debate, and I said, "Would you bar table?" And I said. Would you give me a Lord. copy of the question? Would you give me a copy of the question? Oh no, we're not going to give you a copy of the question. And I'll tell you why you wouldn't want to give us a copy of the question. And that is because when you read it, it's so obvious how so out of order it was. This is the question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the Minister made any approach to or had contact with No no, no. Oh, now this, I love this. I love this. Order. I love this. Order. I love this. You know, they, as soon as I start to read out the question, it's immediately obvious to them now that it left out a couple of words, so they're trying to put them in by interjection. I mean, talk about CJO, CJO. Now, I will read it out. I will read it out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the Minister made any approach to or had contact with any director of Colesmire or with Western Australian planning ministers, both past or present, or their departments, in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest? That was the question. Now, why is that uh, question uh, clearly defective and therefore why is your ruling uh, clearly uh, should, why should it be supported by the House? Well, firstly, Mr. Speaker, the first and obvious thing to say about this question is uh, that uh, it is not an issue, it does not raise an issue of whether the minister can be asked questions about conflict of interest. In other words, it does not go to conflict of interest per se on the face of the question. It, no, no, you left the words out. Listen, you know, your tactics committee is going to have to sort of get up earlier and think a bit harder about its questions. Uh, you left that out. The second thing is that. that that you made no, apart from, the, apart from the fact that you referred to the minister, you know, minister, this is the question for you. Apart from that, there was no nexus with the minister's ministerial duties. No nexus with, on the face of the question, as, as, a, as clearly on the face of the question, no direct nexus, no nexus with the minister's duties whatsoever. In fact, in fact, Mr. Speaker. Not only was there no direct reference, when you look at the last words of the question in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest, in fact those words qualify the question and limit it to personal business matters only. In other words, nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities. Now, Mr Speaker, what are the rules? Those are the facts. Those are the facts. What are the rules? Well, the rules on this, the rules on this are very, very clear. If, you, if I direct members to House of Reps practice. Uh, page 509 on questions. This is what it says. The underlying principle is that ministers are required to answer questions only on matters for which they are responsible to the parliament. Consequently, speakers have ruled out of order questions to ministers which concern, for example, a number of examples are given, statements, actions or decisions of the minister's own party or of its conferences or officials or of those of other parties, including opposition parties. Well, it's not that one. Um, statements by people outside the House, including other members, notably opposition members. No, not that one. Not that one. No. Um, statements in the House by other members. No, not that one. No, it's it's all the practice barracking for the bombers, and we're getting a bit hoarse in the throat this year. Uh, but you know, I tell you, there, there, 
against North Melbourne? That's a very good question. Now, as a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, that's a question that would be in order, provided it was properly uh, in a nexus Sorry, to the minister's uh, ministerial responsibilities. Uh, then uh, the other one is, and this is uh, just to uh, keep people's attention on the issue. Consequently, speakers have ruled out of order questions to ministers which concern, for example, anything of order. I'll read it slowly for you, Simon. I'll read it slowly, slowly and clearly. Anything of a private nature that is not related to the public duties of a minister. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, I had an interjection before which said, "Oh, you know, has anybody ever made such a ruling before?" For heaven's sakes, read the House of Ref practice. It's there in black and white. There in black and white, you had no nexus, nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities, and the question and the question was clearly to the financial for, personal thanks. interest of the minister. Uh, let me say, uh, go on and say, because this is an interesting little point that uh, comes up in the House of Reps practice. They say, as mentioned in the cases above, it's not in order for the personal conduct or private affairs of a minister to be criticised by way of a question. A charge of a personal nature can only be raised by way of a direct and substantive motion. This fundamental parliamentary rule was reiterated by Speaker Snedden, and he then goes on to give the quote. Now, I'd say there's another sort of clue in this about the tactics, you see, because we had a number of questions on this issue yesterday, and we sit here on the front bench and we're saying we get notes from our colleagues saying, you know, what's going to happen next? Are they going to do this? Are they going to do that? And, and what was clear at the end of question time yesterday that they didn't have enough for a censure motion. So we got no censure motion. What we got today was in the tactics meeting. Now you see, so admission, admission, admission out of your tactics committee. No, nothing, nothing to run for a censure motion. And then today they pick up the papers. They see the Australian editorial and they say, "Oh, Whippy, we'll give it another run." Do they run a censure motion? Oh no, oh no. In fact, they, they must. I would say, Mr. Speaker, I would say, Mr. Speaker, I would say that in their tactics meeting this morning, the view would have been that it's quite clear that they didn't have enough to run on a censure. The opportunity was provided today, an excuse used. You didn't have anything for a censure motion. So what do you think you do? You're going to run an attack on the Speaker. Run an attack on the Speaker on the basis of a, of a ruling which has, is as clear, as clear a ruling within the standing orders as I have ever seen in the whole time that I've been in this parliament. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the fact of the matter is there is no substantive motion. The fact of the matter is that if you hadn't been so uh, uh, impatient, you would have been able to ask that question to the minister if you had properly worded it. I mean that is the position. That is the position. The member for Kalgoorlie, what an embarrassment he's been to you over the years. But what an acute embarrassment he was when he today asked the speaker a question on a uh, basically on a point of order in which it said, well, if the question had been properly drafted, Mr. Speaker, would you have allowed? The question to have been asked and therefore required it to be answered. And what did you say, Mr. Speaker? Perhaps uh, uh, not uh, in any way attempting to uh, involve you in this debate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that would be improper to do so. But, Mr. Speaker, knowing you well, uh, knowing you well, in your response, uh, the, uh, the sense of uh, accommodation you are prepared to afford the member for Kalgoorlie makes it quite clear, Mr Speaker, you actually do know about what the standing orders mean when it comes to questions of this sort. And, uh, Mr Speaker, you had no hesitation in ruling the question out of order. You had been considering the issues because the right honourable member for New England had put the issue to you quite uh, squarely in the previous question. Uh, you had clearly had it in your mind that this was an issue that you might have to address during question time today. I thought, I thought in respect, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, without canvassing uh, your views, but I did think that it was an option for you in response to the member for New England to in fact say, well, part of the question was in order and part of it was out of order. But you, in your wisdom, Mr Speaker, you said, no, the question was fair enough. We accepted that. We accepted that ruling. We accepted that ruling. Uh, that, was, uh, that was in the hurly-burly, Mr Speaker, of, uh, uh, of the House. You have discretion. You have a discretion in the uh, handling of these matters. You exercised the discretion in what you believed was a manner fair and consistent with the standing orders and reasonable in all the circumstances for the, matter to have, uh, for the House to have these matters properly before it. Uh, so on that matter, Mr Speaker, we accepted your ruling. There was, 
I wasn't up on my feet saying, oh, you know, the second part's out of order. You ought to support the member for New England. None of this nonsense. Why wasn't I? Because the minister was more than happy to answer the questions. He's got nothing to hide. No, he's, got, he's, been, he's, he's, complied, he's complied with the ministerial uh, uh, requirements. He's, uh, he's complied with the requirements of disclosure. We've had a lot of talk about this uh, disclosure of the ministers, uh, which says apparently I haven't even read the thing, but what does it say? Bunbury, uh, various lots. That's in his own personal name. And the, the other allegation is, is that he didn't list certain properties, but those properties were held by the company. There's no requirement for him to go into the assets of the company of which he is a proprietor. And I tell you what, if there was, we would have had the piggery. We would have had the piggery. Every last little piglet would have been on the disclosure form. Uh, was that the requirement then? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. So old CJO is putting up a new form of, of, of pecuniary interest declaration, which of course he wants now but never wanted when the piglets were in charge. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, we, re we reject this. Well, we reject this uh, on uh, we reject this on a very uh, uh, substantial basis, and that is, this is a motion to dissent from your ruling, uh, Mr. Speaker. We don't like all of your rulings. Let me say we don't like them all, and we would be dishonest if we said anything otherwise. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, if I couldn't say that, then you wouldn't be an independent speaker. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, you exercise your discretion. Uh, you do so in conformity with the standing orders and on an independent basis. And you've done so, you've done so today. You've done so today. And as I've just, as I've shown, Mr. Speaker, as a matter of logic, as a matter of precedent, as a matter of common sense, as a matter of consistency, in every possible way, the ruling that you gave, Mr. Speaker, uh, was entirely a correct order. On that basis, uh, we have no hesitation in rejecting this motion of dissent. And we reject, we reject the, the, this opposition that has used this motion as a means to attack one of, uh, one of, an excellent minister, a person who has done a first-class job Order. as the Minister the for Small Business. The Honourable time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to the Honourable— Mr Speaker, I support the dispent motion because what you have ruled out as Speaker, you allowed in as whip. The question is that the motion be put. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No, it's have it. Division. Division required. Ring the bell.
You got, a, you got about a minute. In order, lock the doors. The question is that the motion be put. The ayes will move to the right of the chamber, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Carragamite, Adelaide and Riverina for the ayes and the honourable members for Fowler, Meribanong and Bruce for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 86, noes 43. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler. Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler, Meribinong and Bruce for the ayes, the honourable members for Caragamite, Adelaide and Riverina for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 43, noes 87. The resolution is therefore resolved in the negative. Would members quickly and quietly resume their places or remove themselves from the chamber forthwith? The Ask the further questions to be placed on the notice oh, paper. The, the, I think the honourable minister for immigration and multicultural affairs wishes to add to an answer. Yes, Would Mr. Members, quickly resume their seats or remove themselves from the chamber. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Yesterday, the member for Kalgoorlie asked me a series of questions concerning the recent arrival in the Torres Strait of a vessel with 139 people aboard and I undertook to provide further information when I was in a position to do so, I can now advise the honourable member that the group uh, has told my department that they are from China's Fujian province and that the steel hulled boat left China on the 18th of May this year. Departmental records indicate that this is indeed the largest single group of unauthorised arrivals to reach Australia for at least the last 10 years or so. And, uh, the second largest arrival was a group of 118 Sino-Vietnamese from China who arrived in Darwin in November 1994. All of the 139 people have now been flown to the Port Hedland Detention Centre where the facilities enable, uh, enable that group to be properly dealt with. That transport cost sorry, $337 and I do acknowledge that that's a very significant amount of money. $337,000. Thank you. Um, the, initial, the, initial, for Watson. the initial interviews have, have been conducted. Their claims and their motives for travelling to Australia and any possible connections are still being investigated. And I'd add that uh, we have to assess uh, their claims uh, in a bona fide way and, uh, and ensure that they're heard and we don't prejudge them. And regardless of the circumstances of their, their arrival, the law requires proper procedures to be followed. And of course, this is being done, and I will report further to the House when my department's investigations are completed. The Honourable Member for Chifley with a question. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I have a question to you. <coughs> May I have your permission to circulate your answer to my question about a clipping service? And further to your answer, what is the cost of producing the House of Reps media clipping service? Who is it distributed to and in what capacity do they receive it? What would be the additional cost and time of producing sufficient copies so that each member of the House might also receive a copy? I thank the honourable member for Chifley for his question. I will take uh, the balance of your question on notice and until I resolve that question, the answer about circulation of my former answer uh, we will put on hold. The Honourable Member for Hunter with a question to me. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The House of Representatives Standing Committee on Industry, Science and Technology recently re released its Fair Trading Inquiry report. I hope to copy parts of the report and distribute them among chambers of commerce in my electorate. But when I contacted the Committee Secretariat, I was for a copy of, uh, for an electronic copy of the document. I was advised that if carried out, my intentions would uh, constitute a breach of copyright. Can you seek advice as to whether this hurdle can be overcome, so that members in this place can properly disseminate that very important information into their local communities? I thank the honourable member for Hunter for his uh, question, uh, which I think is a very good one. Uh, I will take it on notice and uh, report to you or the House later. The Honourable Member for Newcastle. Uh, Mr Speaker, a question to you which you may respond to subsequently. And I refer to your letter of the 26th of May and I quote from that when you say, I intend to require that a minister does not unduly digress from the point of the question directed to him or her, nor should the response be un unreasonably long. It seems to me in recent weeks what you've been saying is that the question, for example, was about taxation the minister is answering about taxation. In other words, you seem to have been interpreting it in the broadness of the question, not the point of the question. I would ask you if you would, would examine 
those interpretations over the last fortnight in the light of that letter, <coughs> because because I'm certainly not uh, not certain. Uh, and what, what one goes then further to the points of order you raised further well, on. I, th I they, think they the, then becomes uh, very relevant. The honourable member for Newcastle, and I know you have a, a continuing deep interest in these matters. As I said on a number of occasions, the uh, the new guidelines are taking some little time to uh, bed down. I think the bedding down process is now uh, reasonably successful, but I'll take your question on notice and I'll talk to you about it privately. The, uh, I have one report from the Auditor General. I present the Auditor General's audit report number 37-1996-97 entitled Performance Audit Risk Management Australian Taxation Office. Minister. I ask leave of the House to move a motion to authorise the publication and printing of the report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, speaking as quietly Order. and as politely as I can, I move that one, this House authorises the publication of the Auditor General's Audit Report number 37 of 96 97 and two, the report be printed. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, without yelling and screaming to show my commitment to this item, papers are tabled as listed on the schedule circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in the votes and proceedings and hand so. I've received a letter from the honourable member for Jagger Jagger proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the consequences for low and middle income families of, go of the government's unfair changes to financial support for young unemployed people. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their places yeah. and call the honourable member for Jagger Jagger. Hey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I've come off it. We always say <laughs> this is because we've looked after you. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Another vote from Prosser. There are some uh, good things in this youth allowance change that uh, the government has announced yesterday, and I think it is important to recognise the uh, positive things that are in this youth allowance package. Uh, unlike those uh, who are, have commented in the paper today, in the Sydney Morning Herald today, Ross Gitton says that Labor has reverted to default setting for oppositions, merely opposing anything the government does. Well, that in fact is not the case, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and we do welcome some things in this package uh, that has been uh, announced by the government yesterday. For example, there are increased rates of payment for some people, for 16 and 17-year-olds living away from home, uh, so long as, of course, they live away from home for work or study purposes and for singles with children. And we do welcome, Mr Deputy Speaker, the increased flexibility allowing people to combine part-time study and part-time work or looking for work. We also uh, think that it is a very good thing to extend rent assistance to all study recipients. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, of course, as with everything this government does, that has a real sting in the tail. Because, of course, let's remember what happened in last year's budget, something that's going to, in fact, come into place on 1 July. Last year, this government decided to cut rent assistance for people who share accommodation, for people who share private rental accommodation. And we know, Mr Deputy Speaker, that most students in fact do share their accommodation to cut down on costs, and so of course they're going to face an increase in their rent as a result of this government's miserly approach to rent assistance. But the agreement with the government stops there because, of course, there are some very, very serious problems with what's been announced by this government yesterday with the youth allowance. Let's first of all look at those uh, young people aged 16 and 17 and their families, Mr Deputy Speaker, because, of course, it is not just the 16 and 17-year-olds that, that are going to be the big losers from this package. It's also going to be their families. For those 16 and 17 year olds who haven't finished school and who aren't in full time education elsewhere, we understand about 30,000 uh, young people in this category, they will no longer get any assistance. These young people, uh, of course, come from families, by definition, Mr. Deputy Speaker, who are not wealthy. 
because there is already a means test on the youth allowance for these young people. So it's, it's families with incomes as low as $25,000 that are going to be facing a reduction in their family budgets of $145 a fortnight, $145 a fortnight because their young person, their 16 or 17-year-old in their family, can't go to school for whatever reason and cannot find a job. That's a lot of money, Mr Deputy Speaker, a lot of money for low- and middle-income families that don't have that sort of money, that don't have $145 a fortnight around to give to their young people, to pay for food, to pay for travel, to pay for all the things that young people need. We do agree that it is very important to encourage as many young people as possible to stay at school. Of course we want as many Australians as possible to finish year 12 or to go on to further education because we know that their job prospects are much better if they do. But we do think that these young adults should be encouraged to stay at school, not have the big stick taken to them, as it, which is the approach of this government, encouraged, not forced against their will because they have no other option. Can you imagine what it's going to be like for those young people at school who don't want to be there? They are not going to succeed at school. Unlike the government, we actually recognise that staying at school and finishing year 12 or doing some other form of post-school education or training isn't an option for every 16 or 17-year-old. I'm sure, Mr Deputy Speaker, everybody in this House knows a 17-year-old who is just not going to finish year 12. We are not ever going to have 100 per cent of our young people finishing year 12, no matter how nasty this government gets. We know for those people that their best option is, in fact, to get out in the workforce and to get a job as soon as possible, because that's what they want to do. We, what we won't know about them anymore, of course, is what happens to them, because, of course, they won't be counted as unemployed anymore. As far as, as, far as this government's concerned, they're just invisible. They don't exist. Then the government's not going to care about them. They're just going to be written off. That's, that's the attitude of this that's government, just swept under the carpet, as the honourable member for Banks says. Of course, these young Australians will have no choices as a result of these, this government's changes. Looking, looking for a job will not be an option for them, unless their parents, of course, are able to afford to support their job search. So those families that have got the money to help them find a job will, of course, be able to have a better chance. So the families that can pay for the housing and the food and clothing, paying the phone bill, paying the money for bus fares, they'll be, they'll be OK. But for the ones who have no money, for the families that can't afford that, there'll be no help from this government to help those young people find a job. Those uh, families and their children's life chances, of, of course, are going to be much diminished. And this government, of course, as we discovered from uh, question time from uh, the Minister for uh, Schools, Education and Training, this government's not going to give them any assistance whatsoever with labour market programs because, of course, they're going to be written out of the system. They're no longer considered as unemployed, so they can't get any help with a labour market program and they can't even get any assistance from the pathetic Work for the Dole program. Let's not be taken in by the government's other response on 16- and 17-year-olds. What the government's saying is that there's going to be 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships. Well, let's have a look at the truth. In fact, what we expect will happen is that there'll only be a marginal increase in the number of traineeships uh, in, in the number of apprenticeships and traineeships this year, maybe 3,000 places at most. And under this government, Mr Deputy Speaker, government apprenticeships, growth in government apprenticeships has actually declined. It's been cut by two-thirds. That's not what you hear from the Honourable Minister opposite. And as for the $4 billion, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we heard a lot about, that the uh, government's going to put into technical and further education. Well, what's the truth about that? 
That, of course, is the money that was already allocated, allocated by Labor, allocated by Labor for technical and further education. And that's right. And then they cut it in this most recent budget by $72 million. $72 million. And what, of course, do these states think about this? What the state ministers have said to uh, Minister Kemp is this is a betrayal of trust over plans to expand the number of tertiary places. A betrayal of trust, Mr Deputy Speaker. The states don't trust him. You can be sure that the unemployed people certainly won't trust him. And the reason the states don't trust him is because they know that the $4 billion is not one cent extra. They know that, in fact, it is $72 million less than they would have otherwise got. What they also know, Mr Deputy Speaker, and the minister knows this because he has put it on the public record, is that 60,000 people missed out on going to TAFE last year. 60,000 people missed out on going, and yet all these young people who are currently on the dole are being expected to find a place yeah, in TAFE. Right. How on earth are they going to find a place in TAFE when they've got 60,000 others in front of them and absolutely no support from this uh, government? They don't care. That's exactly right. As for families uh, who have young adults, 18 to 20-year-old adults living in their homes, these families too are going to be subject to considerable hardship because unemployed young adults, unemployed young adults, and don't let's forget what the unemployment rate is for young people, 27.5 per cent under this government, 27.5 per cent under this government, under this government, when you came table. into government, when you came in, it was less, and now it's more. What in fact is going to happen is that these young people will be subject to a, per, to a parental income test. Let's just have a look at a few examples. Let's look at one example where, a, where you might have a female single parent with a young 19-year-old adult, no other children. She's learning. The, the mother is earning. $28,000 as a clerk. What that family will lose a fortnight, what they'll lose a fortnight, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is $50. $50 a fortnight out of that out of that family's budget. Another one, <clears throat> the father is a tradesperson, $36,000 a year. The mother stays at home. This family will lose $121 a fortnight, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Another example, the father is a tradesperson on 36,000. The mother works part-time as a salesperson on nearly $10,000 a year. This family will lose $210 a fortnight. These are not wealthy families, Mr Deputy Speaker. These are low to middle income families who are having a hard time under this government. At every turn they face increases in their costs. And what they're now being told is that if they have a young adult living at home trying to find a job, trying to find a job, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because if they want, because of course they want to find a job, what's going to happen to them is that they're going to have money taken out of their family budgets. They're the families that are going to have to now pay for everything for their young people. The, uh, the sense of self-respect by these young people, of course, will be taken away as they are going to have to front up to mum and dad and say, I need the pocket money. Here I am, 19, 20 years old. I need the pocket money to pay, to go on the yeah, bus, to the go money. to the pictures, the to try and compassion. find a job. The now, now let's just remember that we do have 27.5 per cent unemployment in, in the 15 to 19 year old category. That's exactly right. They don't care about families and they certainly don't care about the young unemployed. This was going to be the big issue before the election that this government was going to address. Well, what, what was the unemployment rate for this group before this government came to power? In fact, it was slightly less, 27.4 per cent. The minister might like to actually address the facts. And of course, what's going to happen as a result of the cuts to the youth allowance to, to these young adults is that uh, we're really basically going to say to these young adults, your lives and your family's lives are just going to be that much worse. 
Bad luck to you. Bad luck that you can't get a job. Bad luck that, uh, that this government has done nothing to improve the state of the economy. Bad luck. Bad luck, Mr Deputy Speaker, that your family faces a whole range of other increases in costs as a result of its budget cuts. We know what they're going to have to pay for their medicines. We know what they're going to have to pay for childcare. We know what they're going to have to pay if one of their elderly family members has to get into a nursing home. And now we know what they're going to have to pay if they have a young adult living at home who cannot find a job who cannot find a job because of this government's ineptitude, because this government has no idea about how to fix youth unemployment. The only way it thinks that you can fix youth unemployment is by taking the big stick to the young unemployed Inviting and them. saying to them, You're, you just get out of the way. Of the way. Don't, don't be seen out on the sight. unemployment out statistics. Member Banks, but for Banks will be out of sight if he doesn't watch it. And if you are 18 or 19 years old or 20 years old and you are still counted on the unemployment statistics, well, we'll basically take away your capacity to, to have a bit of self-respect to stand up in and make a contribution to your family. What this government is doing is taking the big stick to families, to low and middle income families, not to wealthy families, to low and middle income families who cannot afford to lose $60 a fortnight, $120 a fortnight or $210 a fortnight. And that's exactly what this government is uh, saying, to, uh, to, saying to Australian families. It is giving them no hope. It is just taking out the big stick. I call the Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Order. I'm surprised that those who are so vocal want to leave so quickly. Very surprised. Very surprised. The minister should not encourage them. I remember the day when he was a wet. <laughs> the honourable minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I just say that I, I did welcome I the first couple of sentences of the honourable member's speech. I thought it may have been a reasonable. Uh, Discussion, a reasonable discussion of the uh, matters that are before us, um, because she uh, indicated that she didn't want to be seen as uh, carping and negative in relation to this matter. Um, there were some positive aspects to it, and then she proceeded to give a very negative speech. Um, it was uh, a very negative speech, um, and I will uh, I will spend some time on just pointing out those who do gain. That's the balance. Remember That's, for the, Jagger, balance. Jagger That's has the balance. That's the balance. Um, but the fact is, the fact is, it is important, I think, to uh, first deal with one or two um, inaccuracies that were included in the speech of the honourable member. Uh, the first point uh, of, uh, I thought that she was trying to make uh, about the uh, way in which this issue was being dealt with was that there was some manipulation um, of uh, employment statistics by this measure. Now, let me make it, let me make it, let me make it very clear. Um, there is no manipulation of the sort that the Labor Party was familiar with uh, when they were in office. Um, they, they, were about, they were about the manipulation of, uh, of these figures by churning people in and out of programs over a long period of time. Well, that's the way in which it operated. And um, the, fact is, the fact is that if people are unemployed, if people are unemployed, the Australian Bureau of Census and Statistics will be, will be counting them. Uh, we, are not, we are not in any way altering the basis upon which those statistics are kept. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, there, is, there, is, there is the basis upon which the statistics are kept, um, and if a person is uh, surveyed and found to be unemployed, they will be detailed as unemployed. There is no manipulation of the statistics. Um, we are about meaningful change, and what needs to be understood is uh, what this measure has undertaken. This measure ensures that from the 1st of July we will have a single youth allowance which will provide income support to young people, including students, those who are looking for work and those who are sick. It replaces five different program payments which were in place now. I study for 16 to 24-year-olds and certain 15-year-olds, a new start allowance for 16 to 20-year-olds and certain 15-year-olds, new training allowance for 16 to 17-year-olds and certain 15-year-olds, 
um, and uh, the sickness allowance for 16 to 20-year-olds uh, and certain 15-year-olds, and the more than minimum rate family payment for secondary students aged 16 to 18 not obtaining Ausstudy. Now, these were the range of payments that were in place, um, which had been severely criticised, and I think constitute the very reason why the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, in its statement today, says, and I quote, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence has welcomed the news that young people forced to live away from their families would be better supported to stay at school or in training under the new youth allowance. Um, the executive director, Bishop Michael Challen, said, we've been asking for better support for this group of young people for years, and finally their need is starting to be recognised. He went on to quote, um, and I quote, homeless young people are often forced to drop out of school or training simply because the financial pressures are too great. 16 to 17-year-olds who come to our services to meet the same costs as other young people living independently. The extra $12 a week are much needed. And other positive aspects of the allowance that are noted by them are to allow young people to undertake more complicated mixes of work, training and study without loss of payments and to reduce some of the apparent disincentives to study and to better assist students in meeting their housing costs. No, I think you picked up the items that were mentioned by them, but let me just go through um, and deal with the further matters that are involved. And uh, It's important to note that this is not a savings measure, you would think, from the honourable member's speech, and that we were, about, we were about reducing government expenditure by these changes. What we have done is to introduce a youth allowance uh, in which the government is helping young people by making uh, income support arrangements simpler and more flexible. So we've got a, a situation where we reduce the five payments to one and we reduce 13 different rates of payment to five. Customers will no longer be cancelled and have to reclaim different payments for minor changes in circumstances. It will be more effective in responding to the changing labour market by taking into account the full range of training and employment activities available for young people. The youth allowance removes the disincentive to study caused by differences in income support arrangements for young people under 21 years of age. For younger students in particular, it creates a real incentive to complete year 12 or the equivalent qualification before they look for work. It reinforces the government's message that families should support young people until they've achieved financial independence. It provides more assistance to young people who need to live away from home to study or to look for work, especially from rural areas. And as I mentioned earlier in question time, there are numbers of people who gain very significantly, and it's important. It's important. It's important to uh, well, what it's important to note in relation to this matter is that most people will not be facing changed circumstances, and over 100,000 people benefit as a result of the changes that are made. Um, full-time students, full-time students currently are study recipients. Around about 70% of the youth allowance population will gain. 70% uh, of students who have to live away from home will qualify for rent assistance. 17,000 students um, will benefit from a more lenient independent assessment criteria uh, than uh, is now applied under our study. 41,000 will gain from abolition of the minimum entitlement requirement of over $1,000 per annum. Young people aged under 18 years living away from home will receive a higher rate of payment and rent assistance will be available. And this would include young people who are exempt from the requirement to be in full-time study or training. And all students who now have access uh, will now have access to the $500 loan advance currently available under NewStart. Now, these are very significant and uh, very beneficial changes, um, which, uh, uh, in overall effect, um, leave the vast majority of young people, 378,000 unaffected and 137,000 better off. Um, and if we look at those who are receiving reduced amounts, um, the numbers pale into, into insignificance in comparison. Now, this, this is the situation, um, and uh, if young people are not able to access uh, other forms of uh, education, um, I mean, some comments were made about the extent to which uh, educational opportunities may be available. Um, the point is uh, that if it's shown that those opportunities are not available, um, the young people will still be able to continue to access the range of benefits. So, uh, uh, without even without even questioning without even without even questioning um, whether or not uh, the honourable member is uh, right in relation to the allegations that she makes, um, the, well, the allegations against the uh, the, uh, the honourable minister for uh, school education and uh, and his comments in relation to what is happening in relation to TAFE, um, we don't accept. We don't accept the assertions you make 
um, there are there are additional funds available to uh, create uh, over the next several years 100,000 additional places per year, um, and that and that point has been made by by the uh, by the uh, by the minister, and there are the uh, additional places that will be available um, through the arrangements in relation to uh, in relation to. Uh, in relation to uh, the uh, uh, apprenticeship regime that is being put in place. I mean, this government's highest priority is to provide young people with jobs. We've made that point. Um, the youth allowance is designed to achieve this by changing the incentives to make it more attractive for young people to study uh, than just to obtain uh, an unemployment benefits. And uh, as I mentioned earlier in the day, uh, early school leavers are three times more likely to be unemployed um, as a result of having left school earlier. Um, and that is an important matter. And what we've got with the Labor Party is that they're opposing incentives for young people to improve their skills. Uh, well, I mean, that's what it's about when you suggest that these matters ought to be brought into question. Um, and uh, the point that uh, I have been making in relation, to, uh, in relation to these matters are that they obtain very substantial benefits, something that the Labor Party couldn't deliver. But it needed to be part of a holistic approach to reviewing the system. You would not be able to get the benefits. You would not be able to get the benefits that we are proposing unless you are prepared to make the changes in relation to the way in which the system operates. What we are doing is not a stick. It is changing the incentives. And the incentives that are in place at the moment are for people to opt out of school and to go and sit on the beach and to be able to obtain employment and unemployment benefits which are intended for those who are genuinely unemployed. Now, the Honourable uh, Member in her comments uh, was endeavouring to suggest that in some way this government was not interested in families. Now, let me make it very clear um, that this government is interested in families and we've put a great deal of emphasis uh, in assisting families. And if you look at the last budget, we saw our family tax initiative in which uh, eligible families, including, uh, including couples and single families, will receive a $1,000 additional increase in the tax free threshold for each dependent child aged under 18. Families with one child are eligible if their incomes uh, are, is up to uh, $70,000 with each extra dependent child under 18. The income limit rises by $3,000. In short, a typical single income family with three kids of whom one is under five will be better off by over $1,100 a year than they were under labour. And, and if you go through and look at the range of other programs in which the government has been involved in, they are about supporting families. I mean, this contrasts with the sort of speeches that I was making in this House uh, while Labor was in office, uh, in which the rich got richer and the poor got poorer, where families went back backwards. And that was, that was the outcome. They went, that, was the outcome, that was the outcome under the former government. And we have the studies which demonstrate that that was the case. We had the Henderson, uh, we've had Henderson, uh, the Henderson work on welfare and inequality. We had the social policy research uh, centre work by Henderson and Jensen. We had the OECD study on social and economic inequalities. And we had the National Centre for Social and Economic Modelling. And all of these studies that came out around about the year 93, 90, in the years between 93 and 95, focused on the Labor Party's period of tenure, and they found an increasing inequality of income between the poorest and richest Australians. And this work is, uh, is confirmed by Professor Gregory at the Australian National University, who analysed data from, 97, uh, from 1976 and 1991. And uh, that's uh, largely a period in which the former government had been in office, and he found that in that time, the richest suburbs and household incomes had increased by 23 per cent in the poorest suburbs. Household incomes had fallen by 23 per cent. Now, this was the neglect uh, that we saw under the former government, and uh, this government has been about redressing those matters, and we've had positive changes in a wide range of areas. It's not a band-aid approach. It's a holistic approach, focusing on the problems um, and, uh, and not trying to simply cure them in the way in which the former Labor Party sought to do so. Uh, this government's taking a broader view um, and uh, what we've seen is a range of areas uh, in which uh, changes have occurred which impact directly uh, on supporting and maintaining families. There's the Youth Homeless Pilot Project, there's the Parenting Education Program, and the Youth Activity Services and the National Youth Suicide Prevention Program. Now, I could spend time going through each of those, uh, outlining them in a very positive way, uh, but I think in this context of this debate, um, it is important, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, um, that I take the opportunities again to reiterate uh, what it is that we're talking about. 
This is a very significant change that we have announced. It is one that is uh, bringing about change that the Labor Party uh, and I was on committees when they were asked to focus on these issues, focus on these issues over and over again, where you would have a single payment with a similar range of uh, payments for people, whether they were in the social security system or in the education system. And, uh, and well, the honourable member says that is fine. Um, it was not so fine that the Labor Party in office could find a way of achieving it. The Labor, Party, the, yes, the Labor Party were not prepared to put in place a balanced program. They preferred to have young people, young people, young people, young people on unemployment benefits, not accessing employment, not able to get available jobs, uh, and simply, simply languishing because of that situation. And what we have is a situation now where the overall question that needs to be looked at. Um, and which the, yes we have we've, we've dealt with we are dealing with the circumstances the circumstances in which uh, in which these um, in which these uh, in which these young people will have better and enhanced opportunities in the future um, yet young people will have these enhanced opportunities in the future and what we have is a situation in which in which they will be able to upgrade their skills through the school system and through the vocational employment opportunities that do exist here in Australia and which will be expanded under this government. And it will operate within a simpler, more effective system in which the benefits and the way in which they are paid will not discourage people from using those opportunities. And the fact is that under the Labor Party you had a range of social security opportunities for which there were no educational benefits attached, available which simply encouraged people to opt out of the system. It was the worst possible Order. outcome. It is something that was totally indefensible, and I am very surprised that members opposite, whom I know well and greatly admire on a personal Order. basis, are prepared to attack these very positive has things. has expired. Order. Order. The honourable member for Franklin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I've heard some bland departmental responses, but uh, that, that was one, one of the better ones. Soulless, soulless, bland departmental response. By these measures, this government has sold out the young people living in the most socially disadvantaged suburbs of this country. And why? To appease the affluent middle class voters of the major cities who wrongly believe that there is a simplistic view when it comes to solving youth unemployment, falling retention rates, and the young homeless problems facing this nation. This view, espoused by those on the other side, now formulated in government policy and soon to be put into legislation, is going to be another kick in the guts for the young people and their families, the low and the middle income families of Australia. This government appears to operate on the premise that what's best for the majority will suffice and damn the rest. The overall effect of this proposal to introduce a youth allowance from the 1st of July next year will see 378,000 young people remain on the same benefits. 137,000 receive slightly more money, and for this I congratulate them. And the part that really gets up my nose, and the nose of many people who have a social justice streak in them, the f it's all right for you over there, just listen. 46,000 young people will lose their welfare payment or have it greatly reduced, while nearly 30,000 under 18s will lose their dole. The minister, in her bland, uncaring manner, simply stated, and I quote, Applying the parental means test to dependent young people under 21, not in full-time education, reinforces the message that families should support, should support young people until they have achieved financial independence. What a load of rubbish. This is fine if, if, if Australia consisted of 100 per cent functional families, where mum and dad were deeply in love and the relationship had a solid foundation, where parents had the financial wherewithal to cater for their children's needs where education was valued and children were fully supported to continue on to year 12. These families, these families might have been in the majority years gone by, but those op opposite must be smoking the weed if they honestly believe that this is the way Australian society is in 1997. If you're really honest, you'll know that dysfunctional families are an ever-increasing reality, and those I mentioned earlier are under threat. As I said earlier, this proposed legislation 
is yet further evidence of the mean bastardry of those in power in Canberra, people who have lost touch with the reality of what's really happening in the suburbs of the low- and middle-income families of Australia. And who is leading the charge in depriving Tasmania's youth of benefits and placing Tasmanian low- and middle-income families really under the hammer? None other than Senator Jocelyn Newman, a Tasmanian. When I heard of this draconian measure, my mind immediately turned to the dozens of families of former students of mine who would be hurt, and cruelly so, by this legislation. And this is what it's all about. Individual young people, real teenagers, who, because of circumstances beyond their control and that of their parents, are now being punished by this uncaring and poll-driven Liberal government. All of us, in honesty, must be able to recount numerous examples that are being dealt with daily by our electorate staff of families and their teenage children under extreme pressure. Imagine what trials and tribulations they are going to face in the coming 12 months as a result of this draconian legislation. And what does the minister want to see happen in Tasmania? All the 16 and 17 year olds currently receiving the dole to re enter the education system. Sounds fine in theory, but examine it closely to see what a nightmare they are about to unleash on the Tasmanian education system. It would be fine if those teenagers were keen and enthusiastic about returning to senior secondary college or enter it for the first time. But all of us know that the reason many of them have quit the education system is because of the stresses already facing their families. Imagine, if you will, having 500 that's the number in my electorate at the moment who are going to be disadvantaged 500 of these teenagers turn up at Rosney, Hobart, Claremont or Elizabeth College. We're here because we, unless we stay here for two years, the benefits from the federal government will cease. And we don't qualify for work for the dole and there are no opportunities for us to gain meaningful employment. Here we are. These colleges, as you all know, are flat chat trying to cope with ensuring that the students currently enrolled are able to fully benefit from the courses offered. I spoke today with one of Australia's leading educators, Greg Souter, principal of Elizabeth College in Hobart, and asked him, asked him briefly on his views that are proposed by the minister. He was absolutely appalled. And he believes that the moves will be not only very detrimental for the educational outcome of the children in his care, he said that his college and the others in Tasmania are bursting at the seams. And having more students enrolled, especially many that clearly don't want to be at college, will create more behavioural problems and more conflict in his and the other educational institutions. Not only that, but there will be a devalu devaluation of education as teachers attempt to come to terms with providing educational programs for these new students as well as serving those already under the system. And I'm amazed that the minister, if she's really concerned with the educational outcomes of these teenagers who are currently outside the system, why would you introduce such a move in the middle of a school year? Where's the logic in this? It's unbelievable. Has the minister and her department so little contact with the real world that they've forgotten when schools actually function? This, ref this reflects the truth behind what this measure is all about, punishing low- and middle-income families. Tasmania has an appalling retention rate in the high 50s, the worst unemployment rate in the country and one of the highest youth unemployment rates. Our young people are leaving in droves. For the first time since 1941, Tasmania has a negative population growth. In order for, to, for people to enter for the first time, or in many cases re-enter the secondary college system, there has to be some incentive, some benefit at the end. The honourable member for Goldstein would have you believe that everything will be rosy. He, he keeps replaying his CD single, setting the conditions. Rather than the cruel and heartless coercion formulated by this government, which will really have a devastating impact on the many low- and middle-income families in Franklin and throughout, to, uh, throughout Australia, we need a, a more fair and equitable approach to this complex issue. It's interesting that those opposite have trotted out the Brotherhood of St Lawrence as a justification for the positive aspects of this, this uh, new proposal. But in the press release, underneath are the negative aspects. And these are interesting to listen to. Many, two, two dot points. Many young people who are living with their parents will receive no allowance, and this will add pressures on their families. And 
Secondly, a more co coercive attitude towards younger age groups in that they will only be able to get the allowance if they are undertaking approved education or training, without any reciprocal requirement by the government to ensure that sufficient places exist. They also haven't mentioned the Anglican Home Missionary Society and their, their press release of the 18th of June. And this makes interesting reading, especially what I've stated in, in my speech earlier. These changes will put substantial financial, emotional and relational pressures onto families who are already doing it tough. The executive director of Anglican Home Mission, Reverend Howard Dillon, said today, parents will be forced to turn to leading charities such as Anglican Home Mission. They will not be able to support young family members who in the past were able to support themselves with some government assistance. We are disturbed, they say, by the growing level of unemployment, especially the lack of opportunities that exist for young people and the effect that this has on individuals and families. But we, not, but we do not believe that artificially excluding young people from the unemployment figures solves the problem. Charities can expect a surge in requests for help, but many charities have had their donations cut Listen to this. as registered clubs reacted to the news that they would have to carry new taxes. Now, this government, this government has to be applauded for some of the positives, but to exclude the 30,000 young people and to place those families under enormous pressure is an indictment on an uncaring government. Order the honourable member for Dunkley. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I uh, welcome following the member for Franklin. I, in deference to himself, I, I hope that wasn't all his own work, uh, because he'd probably be a bit disappointed back in his electorate with what he had to offer. The point behind that, though, is that. There's very little being said about the allowance. I mean, those opposite seek to try and have a shot at a range of measures that the government's introduced, while ignoring the fact that this government's actually trying to solve problems rather than redirect, restretch, and or reapply band-aids. Band-aids to symptoms of problems that generally had their genesis during the ALP's administration in this country. It's interesting. Uh, it was someone from our side of politics, Mr. Deputy Speaker, who coined the phrase "a week's a long time in politics." And the interesting thing about that, he was referring to the dynamic of the environment, not the horizon which, with, with which policy development should be constrained to. Those opposite, they basically look at every issue that comes up and wonder what would tomorrow's headlines best look like? What sort of campaign could we want? That's the ALP approach of today, when they're in opposition and when they're addressing important social policy reforms such as this one, social policy reforms that seek to address the problems, the underlying causes of many of the difficult situations facing young people within our country. And the member for Banks can't help himself but interject. He, with a penchant for apologies, perhaps could start by talking to some of the young people in our country about the situation he left them in. You might recall that the ALP started their election campaign in my electorate in the electorate of Dunkley, and they had a, a big launch at the Cultural Centre, and about the only highlight of that was that the then Prime Minister, Mr Keating, just about ran over one of my constituents riding a skateboard. So I mean, that was the highlight of the big launch of the ALP campaign at the last election in Dunkley. Labor's opposition is, is again carping about changes. It wants to flame uncertainty. It wants to extend the bewilderment Order. that people Order. experience the with the current plethora of could arrangements. I just interrupt the honourable member for Banks has had quite considerable time yeah, in this debate without getting the call. Up. He will remain silent. The honourable member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, the, those opposite want to extend the bewilderment that the current plethora of payments to young people present. Re where this proposal is about replacing five payments with one, 13 different payment levels with five. Those opposite want to preserve the financial disincentive in the current system for young people to pursue schooling and training, to prepare themselves to develop the tools within themselves for a more positive outlook for their future. I mean, that's about building capacity within themselves so that they can enjoy the opportunities that this country will undoubtedly offer in continuing volumes under a coalition government. Under Labor, it was more attractive for a young person to be on the dole than to spend some time investing in themselves through study or training, by, through access to unemployment benefits, rent assistance and advances. Now, we've sought to address that 
but Labor wants to deny young people working toward their future the advantages of this package, and it's just <laughs> disgraceful. On average, we're talking about up to $100 per fortnight advantage from this package for rural and regional young Australians, and those opposite stand there and try and tell us that we're not interested in young Australians doing it hard in this community. Mr Deputy Speaker, Labor opposes incentives for young people to improve their skills. They're the champions of churning young people through a system without offering them any great hope. The member for Jagger Jagger talks about youth unemployment. Need I remind her that thanks to the Keating Beasley recession, youth unemployment rose to a staggering 34.9 per cent, rising from 27 per cent when they came into office. Under Labor, the apprenticeships and the traineeship level fell to the lowest level as a percentage of the workforce in three decades. And, and the member for Franklin talks about his staff talking to his constituents. Well, I actually talk to mine directly because I find that the best way of, of being in touch with what they're doing. And let me share with you one of the things they were saying. I had a parent come into my office saying, Bruce, could you help me? Could you help me talk to my son? This, this constituent of mine ran their own business and had an apprenticeship opportunity for their son, but the son wasn't interested. The son was saying, I'm better off basically being unemployed than taking up your apprenticeship. Now, the reason for that was the salary that was available under that apprenticeship couldn't match the unemployment benefits. And the parents said to me, Bruce, what can we do to, to encourage our young people to think about their futures? To stop for a minute and appreciate that perhaps foregoing a little bit of income or perhaps foregoing some comfort in the short term is well worth it in the long term. And that's something I understand, Mr Deputy Speaker, because you know where I started? I started emptying parking metres in the city of Frankston just to get a start in life because that was a start, that was an opportunity and I thought while that was going on I could study and invest in my future. Now that's the sort of signal, the sort of message that this package sends to young Australians and that's something that's being lost entirely by those opposite. This is about principle, this is about policy, good policy and this is about programs to support its implementation. The member for Jagger seems more, Jagger Jagger seems more worried about the incomes of people in pinball parlours and others who benefit from young directionless people wondering what to do with the money in their pocket and the time on their hands. And what we're interested in is the future of young people and giving them a structure that they can work within to invest in their future. Contrast Labor's headline hunting with the coalition's plans for young people. This government has principles, policy and the programs and is putting those in place to give young people more confidence about their future. We're seeking to address the failings of the current system and encourage young people to invest in their future, focusing on the causes of problems facing young people, not just the, the symptoms. Now, I think the government has clearly demonstrated its highest priority is for, towards young people and finding them work and in giving them an opportunity for a brighter future. This youth allowance is designed to change the incentives that made investing in your future less attractive than being unemployed. Early school leavers who leave secondary education at year 10 are three times more likely to be unemployed than somebody who finishes their secondary education. Just think about that. Three times more likely to be unemployed. And what we're saying to people is think about your futures and send the right signals through the, the policy structure that we're implementing. The youth allowance is an important social reform, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's tackling the concerns that have been expressed to coalition members and ministers from young people, from families and the general community about the inefficiencies and the confusing messages the current system sends. It's about income support for young Australians who need that support. It's about those who are investing time in education training who, are, who are, through no fault of their own, have opportunities denied to them. We're saying let's reinvest in your future and young people, I think, will respond positively to this. But it's just part of a comprehensive plan about young people in our country. This isn't just one issue. This is another part of a comprehensive plan this government's putting in place for young people in this country. We've got a youth suicide initiative, $31 million towards the Nat National Youth Suicide Prevention Strategy. We've got Green Corps. We've got the JPEP, Job Placement, Employment and Training Program that Minister Vanstone launched in my electorate, which tackles some of those most disadvantaged people in our community. Those opposite, including the member for Jagger Jagger, likes to just talk about this as if nothing else is going on in the world. What a ridiculous way to approach government, where you've got a comprehensive program 
that the coalition is offering for young people that includes specific programs targeted to the needs of young people whose circumstances make them less able to take advantage of the opportunities available to them. We have a youth homelessness pilot program. There's National Youth Week on its way. We've got a, a, in, we're investing in youth culture through the Loud program. We've got the Work for the Doll initiative. Youth, young offenders have got some support through this government. We've got the Family Tax Initiative. We've invested in family and relationship counselling, which the member for Frank alluded to about the causes of breakdown in, in relationships and families. Well, we're investing in that as well. We've got additional money going into schools. And those opposite want to talk about people who, who, who aren't of a mind to go into education, but they did nothing about them. We've got the school to work apprenticeship opportunities. We've got opportunities for people to study and get some vocational training. Because it might be 60 per cent of young people who don't go on to tertiary education, but it's higher than that in my electorate. It's higher in Dunkley, and they really appreciate that we're putting some effort into the, those young people who aren't scholastically minded, who, but who quite rightly believe that the government should be helping them with their start in life. So you've got a comprehensive program that the coalition is offering, and this is just part of it. 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships in the coming year. We've got more places in TAFE. We've got over-enrolment in universities. I mean, this is an exciting time for young people, and this again is a, pack, a part of a package that they can look toward a better future from. Now, everyone on New Start Allowance and Sickness Benefits yesterday won't have their we payments affected. I mean, that seems to be lost on those opposite. They talk about the means test that we're implementing. Well, it's actually more generous than the Labor Party had. I mean, they're just a bit confused about fact and about chasing headlines. And it's quite distressing that the best thing the member for Jagger Jag can do is carp, carp, carp. I mean, it's like retro Jagger. Jagger. You know, you sort of think about the past, look backwards, even when she said this is a sting in the tail again. Looking backwards at your tail, looking around for bees, we're actually trying to illuminate a path where you can avoid the bees in the first place. Now let me just close by one simple message to the young people through you, Mr Speaker. I encourage you to think about your futures. The government is Minister Vanstone, Kemp and Newman are, and they're putting in place programs Order. to help young people. Think carefully about the choices you make expired. because you carry them with the rest of your life, and this is a very good part the of a comprehensive program. Time has expired. Uh, the time allocated for this discussion has now concluded. Um, the, I have to report that the Wall International Amendment Bill 1997 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill. Um, I understand it is wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. Is that correct? Uh, the question is that this bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, of the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. The bill has been agreed to. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, I ask the Leader of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Of course leave is granted. Uh, the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, it just helps if I know. I, I move this bill be now read a third time. The, the question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Wool International Act 1993 and for related purposes. I have to report that the International Monetary Agreements Amendment Bill 1997 has been fully considered by the main committee. A Governor-General's message recommending an appropriation for the purpose of the bill has been reported, and the bill has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill, and I understand that it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. The question is that this bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask the Leader of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Yes. Yes. Leave is granted. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the International Monetary Agreements Act 1947. 
Uh, I have to report that the, that the Commonwealth Vehicles Registration and Exemption from Taxation Bill 1997 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill and I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. Is that agreeable? Um, the question is that this bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. This bill has been agreed to. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I ask the Leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is the leave granted? Well done. Leave is granted. I, the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Deputy Speaker, I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to provide for the registration of and to exempt from taxation certain transactions relating to vehicles owned by or leased to the Commonwealth or Commonwealth authorities and for related purposes. I have to report that the Commonwealth Motor Vehicles Liability Amendment Bill 1997 has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill and I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the bill forthwith. Right. The question is that this bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, this bill has been agreed to. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I ask the Leave of the House to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave yes. is granted. The Honourable the Parliamentary yes. Secretary. Yes. Your Honour, roll. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move this uh, bill be narrowed a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Motor Vehicles Liability Act 1959. Um, the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Australian National Railways Commission sale bill. Further consideration in detail. Um, I understand that when consideration was interrupted at 2pm, the House had agreed to take the bill as a whole and the member for Melbourne was speaking to amendments number one to four as circulated in his name and to which he has moved, um, whatever you have moved, that the question is that the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable the, the Member for Melbourne. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'd just uh, like to conclude uh, the remarks that I made in, earlier on prior to question time with respect to this group of amendments. Uh, what they relate to is the fact that, at, as the bill stands at the moment, the government would be able to proceed with the establishment of the track authority with respect to the interstate mainline track without further reference to this parliament and leaving aside all of the other matters that the opposition has raised with respect to the proposed privatisation of Australian National it is very clear in our view that the parliament needs to be able to properly consider and establish a legislative base for the proposed track authority. It involves the expenditure of hundreds of millions of dollars of Commonwealth money. At this stage, we do not have any details of the proposed nature of the authority, the framework with which it will operate within, or indeed the arrangements that it will put in place with respect to access to the track, with respect to the maintenance of the track, with respect to the way that it conducts its operations. So the opposition has moved four amendments that all have the net effect of removing the track from within the purview of this particular legislation so that unlike the other aspects of the bill which as the bill stands would ensure that the minister or two ministers can deal with those parts of Australian national and, and the various legisl legislative instruments which uh, give effect to them in any way that they think fit what in uh, the op what the opposition's amendments do here is remove the track from within the ambit of the legislation so that the government is therefore obliged to return to the parliament at the appropriate time with legislation to establish the track authority with, uh, with respect to the maintenance, operation uh, and upgrading of that track. Uh, so I'd only again, Mr Deputy Speaker, reiterate my concern uh, with respect to the broader framework of this legislation and that is that it seeks to essentially delegate all of the parliament's legislative powers to the executive. It really does raise some interesting questions about the relationship between the executive and the legislature and the separation of powers because what it seeks to do is in effect 
to abrogate all of the legislature's involvement in decision making with respect to a major part of Commonwealth power, to hand it all intact to the executive, namely to the two ministers nominated in the bill. And it's interesting to speculate what would occur if this principle were to spread. We could conceivably get to a situation where the attendance of members of this parliament became less than relevant because there was very little business for the parliament to deal with because all of the powers to legislate with respect to the matters that are commonly dealt with by this parliament have in had in fact been handed over to ministers. It sets, in my view, a particularly bad precedent and it stands in stark contrast to the approach that was taken by the government with respect to the privatisation of Australia's major airports, where we had very detailed legislation put in place with a whole range of issues dealt with, uh, including the regulatory framework and arrangements with respect to the future operation of those airports. So this is the most specific aspect of the legislation, Mr Deputy Speaker, which requires excision, but the opposition maintains its opposition to the broad principle of the legislation as well. Thanks, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, uh, speaking of these amendments, the uh, government is committed to establishing a national rail infrastructure entity to control and manage access to the national to state rail network. Uh, this commitment is clear from the rail reform package announcement, uh, from the second reading speech for this legislation and from the significant long-term budget provision for capital up upgrading of the track which is $185.2 million to the year 2001. Deputy Speaker, the State support the entity and discussions with them on the nature of the entity and its establishment are continuing. Uh, the Transport Industry has made uh, representations to the Minister supporting the urgent need for the establishment of the entity. Uh, the sale bill provides the Minister with the powers and flexibility to move quickly to establish an interstate track entity following agreement with the States. He has provided a co commitment that he will keep Parliament informed of progress in the establishment. The ALP amendment would reduce this flexibility, leading to potential delays until further legislation is introduced and passed by Parliament. These delays will result in continuing uncertainty and instability for participants in the rail industry, delaying private sector take-up of rail opportunities and industry jobs growth. Uh, simply, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, we, do, we, do not, uh, we, sorry, we believe that these amendments are designed to further obstruct the reform process. On that basis, we do not accept them. And just in uh, summary, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, can I again urge uh, the Labor Party uh, to review their decision in relation to this AN sale. Uh, there is $20 million uh, of money that is going into Tasmania and South Australia uh, to try and help those communities, help those displaced workers, uh, help everyone involved in this, uh, in this industry uh, get back on the, uh, get back on the uh, track again. Uh, they are important projects, they will be widespread projects, and they are projects uh, that have uh, been put together and are, where consultations are taking place with the communities, the relevant communities. Well, the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The, uh, of the country, no. no. I think the no's have no, it. No. Division required? No, <laughs> Division being required, ring the bells.
lock the doors. The, the question is that the amendments moved by the Honourable Member for Melbourne be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint tellers for the ayes, the Honourable Members for Fowler, Bruce and Maribyrnong, and for the noes, the Honourable Members for Corangamite, Adelaide and Riverina. The result of the division, the result of the division is eyes 41, nose 80. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. The question now is that this bill be agreed to. The question now is that this bill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. 
I think the eyes have it. This bill has now been agreed to. The House to move the, the third. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, I leave the House to move the third reading forthwith. The is leave granted to move the third reading? Leave is granted. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Australian National Railways Commission Act 1983 to repeal certain acts and for other purposes. The clerk. Government business, order of the day number two, telecommunications interception and listening device amendment bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable the Member for Banks. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, there will be some amendments circulating. There are some 38 uh, that I can indicate at this stage that I will be moving to the bill on behalf of the Australian Labor Party. Those amendments all go to one thing. The, uh, the bill in its, in its present form, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, seeks to amend um, the Telecommunications Interception and Listening uh, Device Act to allow non-judicial officers to um, basically uh, allow warrants to be issued. It basically is that part of this bill that the opposition opposes. We support the other parts of the bill. So the 38 amendments, when they're distributed, really go to that one issue. Um, the opposition will be pursuing um, this issue. We will divide on this matter and we will strenuously argue the matter in the Senate should the government not accept these amendments. In his second reading speech, um, the Attorney-General had the following to say. I quote, he said, at present, interception warrants may be issued by an eligible judge of a court created by this parliament. An eligible judge is one who has been nominated by the responsible minister after having consented to perform the function. And further on, the bill proposes to provide for categories of persons in addition to judges who may be authorised to issue warrants. These amendments are necessary because the eligible judges of the federal court have decided that they should no longer perform this function. I understand the judges have expressed a quite proper concern that the workload involved should not interfere with the performance of their judicial duties. In addition, there is a more fundamental issue involved. The High Court has recently indicated that the use of judges as designated officials to perform certain administrative functions may be incompatible with the judicial function as it can undermine public confidence in the independence and integrity of the judiciary. The High Court has also specifically advised some judges against agreeing to issue interception warrants because of the risk that the judge may subsequently be involved in a related proceeding. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, what concerns me is that, uh, on the face of it, the Attorney-General in his second reading speech seems to indicate that this is coming from the judges themselves. Now, this matter was decided in terms of the validity of the legislation in a recent High Court case of Bruno Grollo, who was the applicant, and Michael John Palmer, the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police and others, who were the respondents. And that was a, a, a case that was, uh, where judgment was delivered in the High Court on the 21st of September 1995. And I've got um, the unreported judgment in front of me, and that's the judgment I'll be quoting from. Because when you actually go to the judgment of uh, the majority judges, it was a a court of six with Chief Justice Brennan, Justices Dean Dawson, Tui McHugh and Gummo. There was a, a judgment uh, issued uh, by Chief Justice Brennan and Justices Dean Dawson and Tui, Tui joined in that judgment. And I think it's worthwhile to go to that judgment because what it does is it actually nails 
the misconceptions that I think the Attorney General is putting into the marketplace as to the need and necessity for these amendments. And it really goes to the crux of why we in the opposition are moving these amendments. Now, as it is at the moment, um, the position is that um, the powers that are now in the Act are now expressed to be conferred not on all judges of the federal court, but only on a person who is a judge of a court created by the parliament and who has consented to be nominated as an eligible judge and who has been declared by the minister to be an eligible judge. See, the Act was amended, and in section 6D1 of the current Act, and it reads, in this Act, unless the contrary intention appears, eligible judge means a judge in relation to whom a consent under subsection 2 and a declaration under subsection 3 are in force. Judge means a person who is a judge of a court created by the parliament. Subsection 2, a judge may by writing consent to be nominated by the minister under subsection 3. And in subsection 3, the minister may by writing declare judges in relation to whom consents are in force under subsection 2 to be eligible judges for the purposes of this Act. And that's important because they're amendments that were introduced and went through the parliament as a result of earlier cases. And the judgment reveals that in practice the system of eligible judges has resulted in the conferring of power to issue warrants on 30 of the 35 judges of the federal court. But it's when you go to page 17 of the joint judgment, which I'll now quote from extensively, Mr Deputy Speaker, because it lays it all out, that joint judgment uh, at page 17 through to page 20 basically encapsulates all the concerns and puts into proper perspective why we are moving the amendments that we're moving and why the situation should remain the same. The joint judgment says, the argument can be met by the adoption of an appropriate practice. A judge who has issued a warrant in a particular matter can ensure that he or she does not sit on any case to which the warrant relates. That is the practice followed when a judge has received information extra curially which might prove embarrassing to the impartial hearing and determination of a case. Of course, the risk of such a situation arising, and in particular of a judge discovering late in the day that he or she had issued a warrant on the basis of which evidence is to be tendered, is increased when there are but few judges appointed to a court. Now, I depart from the text there. The answer is, is to appoint more judges. If that's a problem, then create more judges. In the Australian Capital Territory, for example, it would be prudent for a res resident judge of the Supreme Court of the Australian Capital Territory not to accept an appointment. But that is a matter for individual judges, and the legislation allows for that, Mr Deputy Speaker. However, as in Miss Stretter, and that's at 1989, 488 US at 407, and I quote, from that judgment, we are somewhat more troubled by the argument that the judiciary's entanglement in the political work of the Commission undermines public confidence in the, in the disinterestedness of the judicial branch. The legitimacy of the judicial branch ultimately depends on its reputation for impartiality and non-partisanship. That reputation may not be borrowed by the political branches to cloak their work in the neutral colours of judicial action." End quote. The joint judgment then goes on. If the issuing of interception warrants were reasonably to be regarded as a judicial participation in criminal investigation, it would be a function which could not be conferred on a judge without compromising the judiciary's essential separation from the executive government. The judicial method of deciding questions in controversy has no application in exercising the power to issue an interception warrant. Not only is the application for an interception warrant made ex parte, the very issue of a warrant and the identity of the judge who issued it are not disclosed. Unlike a warrant to enter, search and seize, its ex execution may go undetected by the person against whom or against whose interests the warrant is executed. Unlike a warrant to enter, search and seize, there is no return made on the execution of the warrant which permits a determination of its lawfulness, a review of its due execution and a disposition of the fruit of the execution. Because of the secrecy necessarily involved in applying for and obtaining the issue of an interception warrant, no records are kept which would permit judicial review of a judge's decision to issue a warrant, nor are reasons given for such a decision. 
The decision to issue a warrant is, for all practical purposes, an unreviewable in-camera exercise of executive power to authorise a future clandestine gathering of information. Understandably, a view might be taken that this is no business for a judge to be involved in, much less the large majority of the judges of the federal court. But here's the crux, Mr Deputy Speaker, and this is what the judgment goes on to say. Yet it is precisely because of the intrusive and clandestine nature of interception warrants and the necessity to use them in today's continuing battle against serious crime that some impartial authority, accustomed to the dispassionate assessment of evidence and sensitive to the common law's protection of privacy and property brackets both real and personal, be authorised to control the official interception of communications. In other words, the professional experience and cast of mind of a judge is a desirable guarantee that the appropriate balance will be kept between the law enforcement agencies on the one hand and criminal suspects or suspected sources of information about crime on the other. It is an eligible judge's function of deciding independently of the applicant agency whether an interception warrant should issue that separates the eligible judge from the executive function of law enforcement. It is the recognition of that independent role that preserves public confidence in the judiciary as an institution. In other countries, the same view has been taken of the desirability, if not the necessity, for judicial issuing of a warrant to authorise secret surveillance of suspects in criminal cases. In such cases, the European Court of Human Rights said in class versus the Federal Republic of Germany, and the citation is 1978 to EHRR 214 of 235, quote, the court considers that in a field where abuse is potentially so easy in individual cases and could have such harmful consequences for democratic society as a whole, it is in principle desirable to entrust supervisory control to a judge. And it, the judgment goes on further. In the United States, the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures has been held to require prior judicial warrant authorising electronic surveillance. In United States versus the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan, the court said, and the citation is 1972 407 US 297 at 317, the Fourth Amendment contemplates a prior judicial judgment, not the risk that, it is, that executive discretion may be reasonably exercised. The court used the word judicial to connote the traditional Fourth Amendment requirement of a neutral and detached magistrate. And further on, the judgment goes on, in Canada, SDJ referred to the vitality of the role of the court in the legislative plan as the guardian of the public interest when discussing the legislation which authorised interception of communications. The statute law of New Zealand provides for judicial warrants for the interception of private communications. So do the laws of most of the Australian states and territories. The function conferred on judges of the federal court under the Act, being similar in nature to the function conferred on judges of the federal court under the Act prior to the 1987 amendment, is not incompatible with their status and independence or inconsistent with the exercise of their judicial power, nor is their present function inconsistent with the maintenance of public confidence in the discharge by the judiciary of its responsibilities in the exercise of the, of the judicial power of the Commonwealth. So what we say, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that when you look at the judgment in, of the High Court in Grollo, and there was the joint judgment of four, and then there was a, uh, separate judgments by Justice McHugh, who dissented, who thought it was inappropriate, and then Justice Gummo did a separate uh, judgment as well. He went with the majority. The court decided 5-1 that it is appropriate that judges do this. Now, we understand that there's a bit of a problem in the sense that the workload, but you can overcome that by appointing extra judges. Alternatively, you don't need extra judges. The way the legislation has been amended and is currently framed, 
you can designate particular judges to perform this duty so that you can have a panel of judges within the federal court who consent to do this. And that way you won't have a conflict, you won't have a situation where you know, they should be doing the trials in particular instances. But it retains the confidence of the community because of judicial involvement, as the majority judgment, the joint judgment that I just read out, pointed out. It is because of the intrusive nature of this power and the potential for abuse that we are moving the amendments to say, no, we in the Labor Party will not support the further watering down of this power. We want judges to perform this role. It's been tested in the High Court of Australia and resolved. The legislation has been upheld. So the, the, the Attorney General, with respect, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think was being a bit disingenuous in his second reading speech. So by going to the materials, to the primary source, to Grollo's case, we see where the joint judgment points out and frankly endorses, I would say, more than points out, endorses. And I'll go back to the particular paragraph at page 18 and repeat it because it's important. Yet it is precisely because of the intrusive and clandestine nature of interception warrants and the necessity to use them in today's continuing battle against serious crime that some impartial authority, accustomed to the dispassionate assessment of evidence and sensitive to the common law's protection of privacy and property, both real and personal, be authorised to control the official interception of communications. In other words, the professional experience and cast of mind of a judge is a desirable guarantee that the appropriate ballot balance will be kept between the law enforcement agencies on the one hand and criminal suspects or suspected sources of information about crime on the other. And that's the case in other countries as well. So that's why we will fight this to the last clause when it comes to a vote in this House, but in the Senate in particular. Because we think the government's wrong. It's unnecessary. We know it's a you know, it's not necessarily convenient, and judges of the federal court might not like doing it, but the legislation as presently drafted requires their consent. And so we think that's the appropriate way to go. The other parts of the Act we're not unhappy with. We, we support the spirit of the other parts of the Act, and the opposition will support those other sections of the Act that are designed to, in effect, um, deal with the New South Wales Police Integrity uh, Commission and also go to the, permiss to the permitted uses of intercepted information. Now, what's interesting is uh, in, the, in the Senate hearing, there was a Senate hearing recently, and uh, it's worth quoting from the Senate hearing, because in the Senate Legislation Committee, on Tuesday, the 10th of June, in 1997, there were some officials before the Senate committee, and Senator Bolkus asked some questions. And at page 97, it was a legal and constitutional committee. Uh, I would like to start, Senator Bolkus. I would like to start off with a telecommunications interception bill question. I noted when he introduced the legislation, the attorney said. The High Court has recently indicated that the use of judges as designated officials to perform certain administrative functions may be incompatible with the judicial function, as it can undermine public confidence in the independence and integrity of the judiciary. Can you tell us what cases he was referring to when he referred to the High Court indicating that? Mr Rayburn, Grollo. When the truth is, Mr Deputy Speaker, when you go to Grollo, it indicated exactly the reverse of what the attorney said in his second reading speech. And Mr Senator Bolkus further on, Senator Bolkus in the next sentence he stated that the High Court has also specifically advised some judges against agreeing to use interception warrants because of the risk that the judge may be subsequently involved in a related proceeding. 
Was that also Grollo? Mr Rayburn, also Grollo, and the judges were the judges in the ACTU. Now, that is not what the High Court said in Grollo at all. It recognised that there could be problems in those jurisdictions, but there are procedural ways to overcome those problems. So the, you know, whoever prepared the speech for the Attorney General, again, is stretching it, because that's not what Grollo decided. But it's, it, it pointed out that these problems can be overcome, and that is why this power in the current Act is not conferred on all federal court judges. That's why there's section D there with its subsections. And that's why we say the problems that the government say are inherent in the system can be overcome by designating specific judges. And if there's not enough judges, then appoint extra judges. Because there's no price in this country, nor should there be, on justice being done, but also being seen to be done. And that's why this intrusive element that the government wants to now pass on to non-judicial officers will be resisted by the opposition. Now, even Mr Rayburn, at page 98, says, I quote, the High Court had some concerns, but not about validity. It was not a question of validity, they just had some concerns. The High Court expressed concerns that in particular instances the action of choosing to be involved in the issuing of warrants could be incompatible in various ways with the exercise of judicial office. Those remarks were remarks that were made in the course of the judgments in Grollo in which the overall result was to say that the scheme for having judicial officers granting warrants of that kind was constitutionally valid. That is not what they said in Grollo. A proper reading of Grollo shows that what the court acknowledged was that the amendments that we introduced were adequate and that this was a valid exercise of power under the separation of powers. And they did point out that in terms of administrative matters, there could be some problems, but what they did say was that they could be overcome. They could be overcome. And they are overcome by the amendments, by the recent 1980s—I'm um, sure it's the 1987 amendments—to um, the Act. Um, because what we did was repeal Section 18 and inserted Section 6D in 1987. The parliament then eliminated the indiscriminate conferral of power on all judges of the federal court and thereby sought to overcome a factor which Mason and Dean Jays had regarded as a source of invalidity. The 1987 amendment also repealed section 20 and inserted in its place a number of provisions which conferred on an eligible judge as defined by section 6D powers to issue warrants authorising inter alia intercept interceptions of communications, and that's on page 11 of the judgment. So let's not, let it not be said that the previous Labor government was impervious to criticisms or problems that might arise in this area. What we did was we refined the Act and we brought in amendments, and we say we improved it. And there were earlier cases of, um, I think it was Hilton and Wells. And so this argument about constitutionality was raised squarely in Grollo's case. But the court decided 5-1. And I think in the joint judgment, Madam Deputy Speaker, is compelling material as to why the situation should remain the same. Because frankly, what is happening is it is as a result of inconvenience or some perceived inconvenience that these amendments are being brought into the parliament. That's not the way to run a judicial system. That's not the way to maintain integrity in the system. These are intrusive powers that need to be exercised very cautiously. And that's why we on the, in the Labor Party say we are not going to support those amendments that allow non-judicial officers to exercise those functions. And the position is that um, you know, the short 
appearance before the Senate Legal Committee and a proper reading of Grollo give no comfort and no um, support for what the government is doing. No comfort or no support for indeed what the Attorney General said in his second reading speech. And I'm not saying it's a deliberate overstatement. We in the opposition understand that some people are not happy with the current arrangement. The question is, is it constitutional? Is it a proper exercise of powers? The High Court's already decided that, Madam Deputy Speaker. And what we say to the government is if you go down this path, if you further water it down to allow non-judicial officers, then the system itself will be subject to further attack, will bring itself into disrepute, and you will lend comfort to those who say that it is an abuse of power. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, as I say, there, is, there are 38 amendments. It just goes to that aspect of the bill. Now, I repeat, in relation to other amendments um, to, to the Act, we on the opposition support um, those other parts of the amendment bill, because we believe that the, the government has made out a case and that there is a case for those, for those other amendments. And briefly, I'll repeat what they are. Um, overall, it, the Police Integrity Commission, which was established by the Police Integrity Commission Act of 1996 in New South Wales, to prevent and investigate police min misconduct. The Commission will take over responsibilities in relation to police corruption that are presently performed by the New South Wales Police Service and the Independent Commission Against Corruption. So the Interception Act already permits the Police Service and ICAC to obtain and use, use intercepted in information. The amendments will permit the Commission to receive intercepted information that was originally obtained by another agency where that information appears to relate to police conduct that the Commission may investigate. And to use intercepted information for investigating police misconduct and, provided the Attorney-General first issues a declaration under Section 34 of the Interception Act, to obtain warrants to intercept telecommunications. Now, there are further amendments, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that add to or clarify the categories of proceeding in which intercepted information can be given in evidence. These proceedings are a bail application which relates to a proceeding by way of prosecution for a prescribed offence, a coronial inquest where the event being examined may have been caused by the commission of a prescribed offence, and an application for a restraining order preventing the disposal of property pending the outcome of proceedings connected to the commission of a prescribed offence. And basically, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm reading from the explanatory memorandum. The amendments will also permit intercepted information to be used in making a decision whether to appoint, reappoint, uh, dismiss or retire a member of, or staff member of the police service, um, of a police service. This amendment is intended to assist police commissioners to deal uh, with serious police misconduct and is a response to the decision in Tassiak versus the Commissioner of Australian Federal Police 1995 131 ALR uh, at 319. The uh, amendments to the FTR Act will give the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence and the Police Integrity Commission access to FTR information held by Austrac, provided that the Bureau and Commission have undertaken to comply with the information privacy principles in section 14 of the Privacy Act of 1988. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, you know, we should be taking the lead from what the High Court has done. It is an authoritative judgment. It's a very, you know, it's, it's not a split decision. 5-1 is pretty much an overwhelming uh, majority. It is a considered joint judgment. It's a joint judgment that, if you go to it, you know, draws out what's happening in other countries. And if we go down this path, you'll find that we'll be out of step with other countries. And so, what, you know, I mean. We're the ones. I mean, we should be. Ha we shouldn't be catering to the lowest common denominator. I'm quite proud of the system of justice 
that we have in this country. It certainly can be improved, but these amendments don't go at improving it. You see, I don't want to go back to the situation where a mere accusation can see someone wrongly imprisoned or convicted. We have to have standards. We have to have a situation you know, where there's a certain level of confidence in the system. And that's where the judiciary comes into it. And that's why the functions that they've had under the current Act that have been tested were given to them in the first place. Because what we want is integrity. We want people to, you know, to be confident that these powers are being exercised properly. And that's why they should remain with the judiciary. And this government shouldn't seek to, in effect, water down the standards. So I commend uh, the amendments, which I will move in the committee stages, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I can indicate Order. that uh, Order. I'll ask that they be dealt with the, as a whole. Um, the Honourable Member's time has expired. The question is Telecommunications Interception and Listening Devices Amendment Bill 1997 be read a second time. The Member for Maribyrnong. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the uh, remarks of the Member for Banks uh, in relation to this bill and to uh, support the amendments that uh, he intends to deal with in uh, the committee stage. This uh, particular legislation, like most other items of legislation that go to issues um, of policy in the criminal justice system, uh, deals essentially with extremely complex and difficult balances uh, that uh, our criminal justice system needs to strike between competing public interests. Uh, there's clearly a public interest in the deterrence of crime. There's a public interest in uh, assisting, uh, to the maximum, our law enforcement organisations uh, with a capacity to, det to uh, detect crime and to obtain convictions. That set of uh, public interests, though, uh, need to be balanced up very obviously with the uh, fundamental importance of civil liberties of our citizens uh, to prevent unreasonable intrusions on, uh, on the rights of citizens and uh, to prevent as much as possible the abuse of, uh, of powers that uh, all too frequently uh, can arise. As I said, those balances are no easy matters and they're not balances that are stuck in concrete for all time. They're balances that need to be reworked and, uh, and redeveloped and clarified as circumstances emerge. Uh, issues such as community expectations are matters that have got to be weighed up in these sorts of considerations. Uh, a good example of uh, changes in community expectations on these issues, I suppose, was graphically given last year in the way in which, uh, on a bipartisan basis, uh, a much more rational system of firearms legislation uh, occurred in this country. Uh, things develop in terms of technological change. Uh, the very rapid advances over recent times in forensic science, for example, mean that uh, there's a whole set of additional challenges uh, uh, in terms of striking these balances, and these were matters that some of us uh, spoke on in the recent uh, in the recent debate uh, on the Crimes uh, Forensic Bill. Uh, the capacity of uh, criminals uh, changes over time and moves with technological uh, development apart from everything else, and that's why uh, this parliament needs to be continually monitoring the way in which the uh, financial transactions report legislation operates and proceeds of crime uh, legislation operates, as an example. We also fundamentally need, however, in the emerging in, in keeping in touch with the balances that are required uh, need to be confident in the administration of uh, uh, our law enforcement effort. We need to be certain that the, uh, uh, the intrusions into citizens' lives and the potential for abuse that I referred to before are adequately balanced up. So that's why, Madam Deputy Speaker, the points that are made uh, by the member for banks are, are so fundamentally important uh, in, uh, in this debate. As the member for Banks indicated, uh, the bill deals with a range of matters other than, uh, other than the proposition of uh, allowing uh, persons other than federal court judges to issue interception warrants, the proposal, of course, being to permit uh, deputy presidents and senior members of the uh, Administrative Appeals Tribunal to issue those warrants. Uh, as he's indicated, there are a range of amendments that, uh, uh, <coughs> that support access by the New South Wales Police 
Integrity Commission to the Financial Transaction Reports uh, Act uh, established database through AUSTRAC and also enables the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence access to those, uh, uh, those reportable transactions. Uh, as he indicated, I think uh, there's amendments to the Customs Act which will permit the AFP and the NCA uh, to communicate uh, information to agencies uh, uh, that they have in fact obtained by the use of listening devices. Uh, and there's a range of uh, a range of amendments that uh, relate to um, <clears throat> relate to the use of intercepted information in bail app bail applications, uh, in relation to proceedings in coronial uh, inquiries, and also in relation to uh, in relation to the operation of the uh, com the Commonwealth and State Proceeds of Crime legislation. Just uh, by way of uh, a slight diversion, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think uh, uh, the Proceeds of Crime Act is one which is, I think, increasingly giving evidence of concern to some of our law enforcement agencies uh, uh, operating at a Commonwealth level. Uh, uh, the Commonwealth Act requires the conviction of a person, the charging of a person, or the imminent laying of charges uh, in respect of an indictable offence before an application. For a restraining order can be made. Um, in recent investigations, uh, the National Crime Authority apparently had, was advised by the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions uh, that it was not possible to apply for a restraining order under the Commonwealth Act, but they ought to go off and uh, make an application under the New South Wales drug trafficking legislation. That's clearly a, an absurd situation that this Parliament ought to tidy up. Uh, uh, as early as possible, uh, given that the Attorney General seems to have a bit of a penchant for, uh, uh, for introducing all sorts of bits and pieces of amendments to legislation when he's dealing with uh, this sort of telecommunications interception legislation and other matters. He really ought to, I think, put his mind to the importance of uh, some amendments to the proceeds of crime legislation in relation to uh, tidying up the problems that uh, Commonwealth agencies are having at the present time. Uh, as I've indicated, the most uh, substantial change that the opposition supports, other than the relatively minor ones that I've already referred to, uh, of course, are the changes uh, or, or the proposal to uh, uh, arising out of the Royal Commission to the New South Wales Police uh, Service, the Woods Royal Commission, in relation to the Police Integrity Commission uh, obtaining uh, a capacity to uh, get telephone interception. Uh, I think all sides of this House get a bit of a spray, uh, I might say, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker from the Royal Commissioner, uh, in relation to this matter. Uh, he, does, uh, he does in his report indicate uh, that he was uh, particularly cheesed off with the, uh, the length of time it's taken for uh, this particular matter to arise, and he vents his spleen at the uh, uh, inability to obtain in ways that he regarded as adequate uh, access to uh, interception material um, in the context of his inquiries, but, not, but one would hope that as a result of this legislation uh, those matters have now been put behind us and, and uh, uh, the <coughs> capacity uh, of this new commission in New South Wales to uh, address the problems that seem endemic in the New South Wales Police Service with respect to corruption can in fact be assisted uh, by, uh, by this parliament. Uh, uh, authorising the, uh, the capacity of that commission to obtain uh, the, advantages of, uh, the advantages associated with telecommunications interception. Having said all that, uh, in the areas that the opposition supports, I just want to come back to the uh, principal themes uh, that the member for Banks referred to, and I don't want to uh, go over, in, uh, uh, as inevitably I would in less elegant terms than him, uh, the arguments uh, that relate to uh, relate to why uh, this parliament ought not to confer on people other than federal court judges the, uh, the power to issue interception warrants. I would, uh, however, quote uh, some evidence that was given by Mr Rosines, um, the Office of Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, last year, I think, in evidence he gave to the Senate Legal and Constitutional uh, Committee, where that committee was dealing with uh, uh, considering uh, Crimes Amendment Controlled Operations Bill 1996, and Mr Rosines had the following uh, to say, I quote, There is no comparison, in my view, between the role that is required to be performed by
by the grantor of the certificate in this investigative pro exercise, that is, he was referring obviously to the controlled operations legislation, which in fact authorises a senior police officer to authorise. And I come back to his quote: "This investigative exercise, with that which is reposed in the federal court judge or the magistrate or whatever, whatever it is who gives a warrant for either listening devices or search warrants or anything else, where there is a clear requirement." that there be balanced the interests of the citizen who is about to have his property turned upside down, his premises invaded, his body samples taken or his voice listened to, monitored, reported and recorded on the one hand and law enforcement requirements on the other. There is genuine balancing of competing public interests which requires additional involvement. But even that is currently, he says, and this is somewhat old information, uh, or old comment, but even that is currently the subject matter of challenge in the High Court. Now, uh, as was indicated by the, uh, by the member for Banks, uh, that particular issue uh, uh, in the High Court has, uh, in our view, been satisfactorily resolved by a very clear majority uh, judgment in the Grollo case. Uh, <clears throat> traditionally, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, telecommunications interception warrants have only been issued by people who are judicial officers. Uh, the issuing of the warrants is an exercise of executive power vested in a person who happens uh, to be a judicial officer. A judicial officer may refuse to exercise the power if he or she uh, so wishes. Uh, traditionally, those officers have been selected because as individuals they possess certain skills uh, and, uh, and as, a result, as a result of having had judicial experience, the sort of experience that uh, the member for Banks uh, quoted the High Court judgment as, uh, um, I can't quite pick up the reference here, uh, um, it, it, was, it, was somewhat, it was somewhat more eloquently presented than I'm doing, but certainly uh, examples of the sorts of skills that uh, a judge can be expected to have uh, a neutrality, detachment, disinterestedness, uh, receiving evidence, assessing its credibility, evaluating submissions upon it and reaching conclusions uh, conformable with the law which are expressed with efficiency and promptness in a stated conclusion. Now, it can be argued, I suppose, that the uh, deputy presidents uh, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the senior members of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal may have some of those, uh, uh, but it could, be, uh, it could also be argued that they lack experience in the criminal jurisdiction, essential to, uh, essential to the performance of those powers. It can also certainly be very strongly argued, I would suggest, that they, uh, uh, they, they lack uh, the status and the standing in terms of community expectations for these quite significant powers uh, that reside in judges. Uh, and for those reasons, in terms of getting those balances right that I referred to before, it is singularly important that uh, community expectations and confidence be taken, uh, taken along with this. And uh, with the greatest of respect to senior members of the AAT, uh, I don't think it is sustainable, to, at least in the opposition's view, that. Uh, that they carry, uh, uh, they carry what, the, what a judge carries in that respect. Now, the Attorney General, in his second reading speech, presented two reasons for uh, for, uh, <clears throat> for the proposal he's making. Um, one of those, which uh, really I think was uh, pretty pathetic, was the uh, uh, was the concern about the lack of judicial resources. Uh, the answer, the answer to that issue, is clearly to provide resources for the uh, administration of justice if that's required and uh, for the attorney to be coming to this house to suggest that uh, uh, justice uh, and the standards of justice can be downgraded uh, on those issues is really I think fairly unacceptable uh, an examination of the uh, uh, the budget that uh, uh, that's presented to the, has been presented to this parliament at the present time shows that indeed in the federal courts there is uh, a significant squeeze on uh, my understanding is that uh, the, federal the federal court's workload has increased by um, approximately 4 per cent, uh, and the family court's workload has increased by approximately 10 per cent. Uh, certainly there is pressure on judges, but uh, that does not seem to me to be in any sense an argument for, uh, uh, for downgrading fundamental balances that are required in our system. The other reason the attorney gave us, the member for Banks has spent a great deal of time talking about, are the constitutional concerns. Speech, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Fine. No, the member for Banks makes uh, very, very good speeches in my, in my experience. 
he dispatched, I believe, very, very well the, uh, the misconception or the misperception that the attorneys come to this parliament with about the Grollo case. Um, <clears throat> he also, in his second reading speech, appeared to be referring to uh, uh, the Wilson case. That case, uh, as I understand it, concerned the appointment of Justice Matthews to prepare a report in relation to the High and Marsh Island Bridge. Um, in that case, all the judges uh, noted that the issuing of telecommunications interception warrants was not an issue before the court and accepted previous authority on that subject. Uh, similarly, the attorney in his second reading speech referred to uh, advice uh, provided by the Chief General Counsel in the context of the Crimes Amendment Control Operations Bill of 1996. However, I think once again uh, uh, that uh, uh, that, uh, that, that particular area of concern ought to be capable of being dispatched, and I think has been dispatched in, uh, in debate. Uh, if, 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 if the government's real concern uh, <coughs> is with, with, in fact, with constitutional issues, this legislation does not resolve those issues. They're caught out in terms of that point too. If, in fact, there were constitutional impediments of the type the Attorney General is suggesting, he would be amending the legislation much more dramatically and, in fact, removing uh, uh, the right of judicial officers to, in fact, issue interception warrants. What he's doing is not doing that. He's simply adding, uh, presumably primarily for administrative convenience and as a fairly cheap cost-saving exercise, adding in some additional people uh, with the capacity to do that and, in the process, I would suggest fundamentally getting the balances that I started off this speech by. Uh, by referring to wrong, he is, uh, he is for very cheap uh, purposes, quite uh, uh, undignified purposes, I would suggest, uh, really threatening to upset some fundamental balances in relation to the roles of judges in our criminal justice system. And for those reasons, I, uh, I join with the member for Banks in, uh, in uh, opposing those aspects of the bill and uh, supporting the member for Banks' amendment. Order. The question is that the Telecommunications Interception Listening Devices Amendment Bill 1997 very second time. The member for more. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd just like to first of all start on uh, my, pres my, my contribution to this bill by lamenting the answer of, to the question I gave in the House this morning uh, in relation to the drug trafficking problems we have in this country, because it relates to, um, to uh, the telecommunications interception and listening device use by our law enforcement agencies. And I must say that um, given that as the uh, member would know, just leaving now, Mr Serkin would know, that um, we've heard evidence, very strong evidence, particularly from police uh, personnel from Victoria last week. Oh, well, that's all right then. But um, yeah, we certainly heard evidence from Victorian police last week in the NCA's the Joint Standing Committee's inquiry into um, the uh, National Crime Authority's effectiveness about the extent of the problem in Victoria. And we've heard elsewhere from Queensland Police Commissioner's representative, from um, representatives from the Western Australian and the South Australian uh, Police Commissioners. We heard from the Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence. We heard from the um, Minister's own advisor. Um, for, um, and we've also heard from a number of other sources, including Bob Bottom, a well-known commentator on criminal and other matters um, in Australia. I know the, the uh, Deputy, Madam Deputy Speaker herself has indicated concerns about criminal elements that have appeared in her own electorate at Moncrief on the Gold Coast people who have extensive international criminal connections, who have appeared in Australia for the very first time, and have actually appeared in Australia and purchased using uh, quite expensive properties in the, in the uh, Deputy Speaker's own electorate. And what the Victorian police said in Melbourne last week, which was of most concern, was that there are now 12 to 14-year-olds selling heroin for $7 a pop in Little Bourke Street. Now, they were talking about going to the extent of checking motor vehicles entering into Victoria from interstate to search them for illicit drugs entering into Victoria, because they claim that the drugs are not produced in Victoria, they're coming in either via the road or by air or by other ways into their state. Now, that may be an extreme response on the part of the Victorian police, but to my way of thinking, it goes to exemplify or to, to demonstrate clearly the seriousness of the drug problem in Australia today. Now, we also heard from the Queensland Police Commissioner's representative that as a consequence of the federal government's cutbacks in Western Australia in relation to the NCA, to the AFP and to Customs, 
There is now a conduit of drugs coming in via the Western Australian coast and coming across the country to the eastern states from the west. Now that is another serious problem. The police commissioner in Western Australia, Mr Falconer, has indicated that it is of crisis proportions. We've had a number of heroin deaths in Western Australia, way beyond the norm, and indicating not only that there is a greater usage of heroin, but also that the heroin entering into the country now is of such greater purity that you see the sort of overdoses that we've seen in recent times. And those overdose deaths have occurred in the eastern states as well. They've occurred on the east coast, they've occurred in South Australia and elsewhere. And they're indicative of this serious problem. Now, might I say that when we heard from Mr. Smeaton, who of course has uh, been a substantially uh, well, he's been an integral adviser to both the fed previous federal government, the Labor government, and the current government. Mr. Smeaton made it clear, and I asked him because back in 1994, the federal government undertook a review of Commonwealth law enforcement arrangements. And amongst the things that they discovered as part of continuing and serious problems with in particular in relation to drug trafficking, was the presence of Chinese triads gangs who were organising the importation of heroin to a very large extent. In fact, the ABCI, the Australian Bureau of Criminal Investigation, Australian Bureau of Criminal Intelligence, I should say, indicated that it was that they were responsible for the vast majority of the importations. Now, irrespective of the background of the people responsible, that intelligence was known to the federal government some time ago. And one asks the question, why is it still a problem three years later? And one of the reasons why it is a more serious problem now, why you can buy heroin for $7 almost completely openly in the street, and the police told us with virtually no means for them to do much about it at all, why that is happening is because there have been substantial cutbacks. And unfortunately, and I know why the federal government has introduced cutbacks in these areas, they've introduced cutbacks because, of course, they had a substantial budget deficit inherited from the previous government. But the problem is when you adopt an across-the-board cut, irrespective of the effects, then you have the sort of secondary effects like this. And I know that um, many parents around the country, and I, I'm sure a number of people would have seen the debate on television last night, I think um, on Channel 7, that many parents around the country would be at present greatly disturbed by the threat that drug trafficking and, of course, its uh, sale within Australia on the streets presents to the welfare and the safety of their own children, their own offspring. And as a parent, who wouldn't be? And when you hear from the Victoria Police that 12 to 14-year-olds are now trafficking drugs openly in the street at a price less than the price of a packet of cigarettes, then you have to wonder to what extent the drug problem has become in this country. And I might also say, I think the member um, at the table has commented in the committee hearings that heroin is now apparently the only drug made cheaper by the 1997 federal budget. What an irony that it's now cheaper to buy heroin than a packet of cigarettes. And any government that presides over that, Labor, Liberal, anything else, ought to be thoroughly ashamed of itself. Because in the first instance, it is the federal government that has a primary responsibility for maintaining the, the preserving our frontiers from the incursion of drug trafficking. And let me just say that in this case, the work that's been undertaken to try and stem this flood of illicit drugs into Australia has been greatly undermined by the budgetary cuts introduced in two separate occasions by the incoming federal government, I might say exacerbating cuts that were made under um, previous Justice Minister Kerr, um, which of course uh, was a matter of concern at the time, and I've been consistent all the way through in this. Well, the member for Banks, uh, a person who uh, I've, I do have some respect for, the member for Banks, because I do know that he is um, he is a person who treats subjects like this with some seriousness. Certainly, from his professional background as a uh, def as a public defender, he would know the effects that this type of drug trafficking have on the community, and he would know the sort of people who are victims of drugs who are in the system because of their drug addiction. And I know that he doesn't I know that he and I know that he doesn't treat this matter flippantly. But all I want to say is that we're now dealing with a legislation to do with telecommunications interception and listening device amendments bill nineteen ninety seven. And I want to deal with a few aspects in the time I have remaining. 
because we want to deal with why the government seeks to change the present system. Now, the explanatory memorandum says that the more significant of the proposed amendments deal with the New South Wales Police Integrity Commission, the classes of persons authorised to issue warrants, and the permitted used to intercepted or the permits used to intercepted information. I want to first deal with the new classes of people who may authorise the issue of the warrant. In his second reading speech, the attorney says that this bill proposes to provide for categories of persons in addition to judges who may be authorised to issue warrants. His motivation for doing so, I'm aware of that, is based on the fact that eligible judges of the federal court have decided that they should no longer perform this function. He also expressed a belief that these judges have expressed a quite proper concern that the workload involved should not interfere with the performance of their judicial duties. And the government's proposition is to authorise properly qualified members of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal to issue warrants for the intercepts of the telecommunications. Now, I've got a bit of a problem with this, um, mainly because I'm, I'm a person who believes that uh, telecommunications intercept warrants should be issued by ju judges, judicial officers, not, not semi, but I, well, I'm not somebody who's in a, an administrative appeals tribunal. And I might just say to the member for banks that, unfortunately, under 13 years of labour, the use of um, administrative appeals and, and uh, non-judicial appeal bodies has greatly ballooned to the extent now there's just about an appeal body for every single possible permutation of um, complaint po under the sun. And I was going to say that he would know that that has created a number of problems. I mean, we've, <laughs> we've got a situation where some of these appeals tribunals operate like, um, like star chambers. In fact, some of them are, uh, are so unjust in, their, in the way in which they administer themselves that one wonders whether they are, in fact, consistent with what we consider to be the principles of, of the der derived version we have of the British justice system, which has become the Australian justice, justice system. And I know the member for Banks agrees with me there, but I certainly am worried about the fact that in widening the scope of the issue of warrants, we now include people who aren't judges. And that is a thing that worries me considerably, because one of the grave, great principles behind the issue of warrants is that there should be some very high standards of integrity and, I might say, the high standards of review. Because, of course, a judge sitting in his chamber issuing a warrant is acting as though he's in court. And that means that the whole process has to employ a very high standard of presentation. It means, for instance, that all of the, com the complaint, the application, the evidence to the judge are presumed to be of the same standard as that which would be presented in an open court of the federal court. So that means that there is an added onus on the officers applying for a warrant to present their case in a way which is consistent with the principles, and I think the principles all members of parliament would accept, are, are the basis for the issuing of intercept warrants. As a former policeman, I think interception, telephone interception is a very critical part of high quality police work, investigative work. But at the same time, as a person who respects the privacy of citizens, I am loath to see the widening of the scope for the issuing of warrants um, under these sorts of circumstances. And I must say that uh, that is a matter that troubles me. And, uh, and I was going to say that the judges of the federal court have acted as an important element in the protection of the rights and privacy of Australian citizens and ensured that law enforcement agencies have been compelled to comply exactly to the legislative protections which apply. Now, we know that from time to time there are variations on the theme of this, and individual judges from time to time make um, different interpretations of their responsibilities. However, because it is in that category of review or that higher standard of review and where the interests of a citizen are much better protected, that is where those warrants should be issued. Now, if there is a problem with the workload of federal court judges, then it is up to the Attorney General to, to appoint a larger number of federal judges. I mean, that seemed to me to be a much better re response than extending it to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, for goodness sake. I mean, I know that there's going to be some budgetary considerations here and uh, you know, all sorts of other uh, ER expenditure review committee type um, uh, issues. However, in this case, in, in moving to extend the issue of these warrants, then we really ought to be looking clearly at extending the number of federal court judges to allow them to be able to cope with their constant workload and, of course, the extra workload that's created by the application and the consideration of the warrants for interceptions. Now, I just want to also turn to a number of other issues in relation to 
um, the interception warrants. One of which I might say is that I mean, this bill contains a number of provisions relating to the New South Wales Police Integrity Commission, which was recently established as a permanent authority to continue the work of the Wood Royal Commission. And I must say, having debated in the past on the granting of these warrants uh, or these powers um, to the Wood Royal Commission it was one of the greatest things and one of the greatest um, facilitations by this parliament to the cause of fighting corruption, Sorry. not only, I might say, in the police forces but also in the judiciary in recent years. Because, as we know, one of the greatest tools used in the Wood Royal Commission was the use of things like pinhole cameras, telephone intercepts and, of course, the use of those in such a way that caused what is now colloquially known as the rolling over of witnesses and the compounding of this rolling over to identify and to locate and hopefully to prosecute those responsible for the corruption that has tainted the New South Wales police uh, force over a number of years. Now, I'm just saying that we should um, not restrict this to the New South Wales uh, situation. I think that there is, under the circumstances in Western Australia, where there have been calls for a royal commission, I think there is a great scope here, or it should be a great scope, to extend the powers offered um, to, the, to the PIC to the Anti-Corruption Commission in Western Australia. I don't think we should have a royal commission. In fact, my view is that, unfortunately, the Wood Royal Commission left a lot of questions that are unanswered. And, of course, when you look at the cost and you look at the number of people that were identified, then the Wood Royal Commission did leave a lot of strands um, un, well, I suppose it'd be without mixing metaphors, it left a lot of things still out there that need to be resolved. And I think um, there are a number of people, I know that uh, uh, the member for Banks would have a number of his uh, Labor colleagues in New South Wales, and I know there'd be a number of Liberal colleagues in the New South Wales Parliament who would agree that the Wood Royal Commission really didn't go uh, all the way along the path that it should have done, and there are elements of allegations and aspects of the corruption allegations within the New South Wales Police Force that have not been resolved by the Wood Royal Commission and should have been. And that um, standing commission is something that is necessary to continue the work. Now, in Western Australia's case, we have an anti-corruption commission that has been set up by the state government. It has been given considerable resources, and I'd like to see the anti-corruption commission, given the resources to conduct telephone interceptions, that sort of work, to be able to get to the bottom of the allegations that have been made in relation to the Western Australian Police Force. And I just want to say that policing is a difficult enough job in Australia. It really is. I mean, we're now to the stage where literally every police officer uh, undertaking um, their work, well, I mean, with the exception of perhaps some of the, the more administrative work, but where you are out there investigating offences, responding to complaints at the scene of a crime, and then, of course, dealing in unfortunate, difficult circumstances. I mean, often you're, you're dealing with people who are injured, distressed, under um, in, inclement weather. You have situations where you have to secure a crime scene in, in great speed. You have to speak to witnesses at great speed. There is a necessity to secure evidence as quickly as possible. And we have the problem that a police officer is acting under these enormous stresses on the scene of a crime or at the scene of a complaint, and the review of his actions could take months. And they're reviewed in the cool, perhaps more, perhaps more um, sedate atmosphere of the courtroom or perhaps in the judge's chambers, where the judge may be reflecting on um, his decision, his ruling in a particular case. And, or it may be, in, for instance, in a voir dire, where um, the judge is hearing the case for the uh, inclusion or exclusion of a particular piece of uh, confessional evidence. And so we see a situation where uh, that police work now has become more and more stressful, and, of course, uh, it has made extremely difficult for police officers, who are at times a butt of um, uh, opposition and, and criticism from the community, from people who object to them arresting them or perhaps uh, you know, make it difficult for their, them to conduct their work, for them then to have to deal with across-the-board allegations of corruption without those allegations being able to be properly dealt with as quickly as possible to put the matters at rest. And one of the things that I'd like to see in the case of Western Australia is for these matters to be dealt with by the Anti-Corruption Commission with the ability to use the intercept um, and um, Tele telecommunities and intercept and listening device uh, powers as swiftly as possible. Now, interception of telecommunications is a legitimate and important tool in the fight against drugs. And I mentioned earlier the single the drug problem in this country is one of the most serious criminal threats to our community. And I, 
I know it sounds sometimes a bit alarmist, but as a parent, you have to look at what's happening with the drug trafficking problem in Australia and wonder to yourself whether the law enforcement agents are really being given the resources to fight the problem. And this parliament has a responsibility. And in my view, unfortunately, the $13 million package that the Prime Minister released uh, at the last sitting doesn't go anywhere near addressing the problems that we have. In my view, there should be a $100 million package to fight a full-fledged war against drug trafficking in this country, to properly resource the Customs Department, to properly resource the Australian Federal Police, to properly resource the National Crime Authority, and, of course, to be able to undertake, in conjunction with state police forces, the sort of long-term investigative surveillance work that is absolutely critical to fighting these people. And we're talking about millions, billions of dollars. I mean, for instance, the Secretary General of Interpol, when he came to Australia, estimated the international drug trade at $450 billion per annum. Now, when you consider the distorting effect that has on any economy, then if, even if you looked at it from an economic rationalist point of view, as some on the government benches may do, it is, it is, no, not all of them. There are some that are now coming across to a much more considered and balanced point of view. But what I'm saying is that there is an imperative, even on an economic basis, to examine the true cost of drug trafficking to our community. Crime is not a secondary issue. It's not something that can be swept aside as some sort of side issue uh, with, a, and with a problem that we have with um, the minister not being a member of the cabinet. So there's not even a cabinet presence for the Attorney General, which is unfortunate because he's one of the best performers in the government. Um, but the enormous amount of money involved in drug trafficking has bred and fed corruption more than any other area of criminal activity, not just in the police but in all levels of officialdom. Corruption has been shown overseas to be endemic among petty officials, the judiciary and politicians and police when enough can be paid in bribes. And I do not accept that this situation is not possible in Australia. And at the end of the day, how can you expect police officers on $35,000 per annum, $42,000 per annum, to be seriously equipped to fight the fight against drugs when, you, when at the end of the day we are dealing with what has been estimated anything between two to five billion dollars worth of illicit drugs Order. within Australia. The Honourable Member's time has expired. The question is the telecommunications interception and listening device amendment bill 1997 be read a second time. Member for Fraser. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. The member for Moore made a lot about uh, the use of heroin, the increased use of heroin in his electorate, the need to continue the so-called war on drugs um, and the consequential need, I suppose, in his view, for easier wiretaps to be available for law enforcement agencies. Now, the clinical evidence merely is that heroin as a substance is certainly nowhere near as damaging um, in terms of mortality rates in the Australian community as uh, legally sanctioned drugs such as tobacco and alcohol. That's, that's the reality of the situation. I mean, far more people die from tobacco and alcohol in Australian society. Far, much, far more cost is um, delivered to the community through those two substances than any of the illicit substances which we spend a lot of money on fighting. Having said that, security is a big concern for people commu communicating through modern technologies both for personal privacy and for hard-nosed business reasons. Jeff Kennett found out what happens when communication systems, such as the analogue mobile phone he was using to make some pertinent points about members opposite, are the subject of easy interception. Telephone intercepts is a debate about balancing the community demand for privacy against the challenges, the real challenges, that law enforcement and intelligence organisations face. We have accepted that private communications of citizens should, prima facie, not be subject to the surveillance unless an approved officer orders otherwise. That is the broad underassumption lying this bill, notwithstanding the debate about who, what the approved officer may be. Now, we do not condone industrial spying by way of private wiretaps. However, in the emerging technology of the internet, the same degree of privacy that we might like to enjoy in the telephone system is extremely problematic. Any technically competent individual with a modem and a reasonable grounding in Unix can intercept electronic mail and web transactions. 
Now, this is a very serious issue for two principal reasons. The, the first and obvious one is that it is a concern for citizens' privacy. Citizens send personal emails to friends and relatives. They should be able to do so without a fear of um, being intercepted by some smart but unkind individuals. In addition, organisations um, are increasing their use uh, of the internet as a method of transferring and transmitting information. Lawyers and doctors are sending confidential personal information to each other about clients um, and patients over the net, and it's essential that this personal information should, should not be intercepted and used maliciously. The second and serious but less considered cons uh, implication on uh, security issues in relation to the internet is the limit that insecure networks places on commercial development. Small business in Australia stands to gain substantially if and only if consumers are confident that their credit card and personal details are secure and not intercepted and used for wrong purposes. This is particularly the case when we see repeated stories of stolen credit cards and personal details sourced from insecure net transactions or sites. Many people on the net will not use their credit card to order services or products because of this problem. So consumers don't feel confident about using the net for commerce, and small business suffers. Because Australians have the highest take-up rate of new technology per capita in the world, there is a credible argument that says that Australian's small business suffers the most. So privacy on the net, therefore, is not only one of the largest IT issues, it's one of the lar largest uh, issues for small business in emerging technologies or those small businesses that would like to use emerging technologies to market their respective products. Now, there is a solution to these issues and it doesn't actually require much government action or resources at all. Sophisticated encryption products fix the privacy problem. Good encryption products scramble messages so that sensitive information about people's personal details about their commercial and confidence information cannot be intercepted by some kid with a modem and a bit of a, a, bit of a knowledge of Unix. It keeps uh, that information safe from malicious eyes because it scrambles it to render uh, that information unintelligible to those without the keys to decipher it. Of course, intelligence agencies have become a little concerned, however, that their ability to peruse the personal interactions of citizens will become compromised if they can't decrypt the contents of emails and commercial transactions. And those agencies have successfully convinced governments to prohibit the export of encryption products so that the agencies or those encryption products that the agencies themselves can't decipher. Of course, what agencies can decipher, others can too. The United States have adopted a standard, for example, which they insist is safe, which provides consumers with uh, confidence that their information is uh, not uh, decryptable, but also provides agencies with an ability to decrypt um, the information uh, in a legitimate capacity. Now, the standard adopted by the United States and security agencies elsewhere, not surprisingly, is a poor standard. It's been shown to be unreliable. A number of studies, including those produced by Belcor and the Wiseman Institute, have shown that the American encryption export standard is decryptable. Uh, even students from MIT have been able to decrypt um, uh, emails that have been encrypted with that export standard successfully within a couple of hours. Put simply, personal or commercially sensitive information that is encrypted using software that the Americans approve for export can be intercepted and decrypted by teenagers. So consumers lack the faith that successful net commerce or successful uh, expansion of commerce on the net requires, and it's a legitimate concern that consumers have of this emerging technology. The argument then becomes um, how good the encryption product may be. 
Now, there is an Australian small business, as uh, fortune might have it, or rather hard work has it, that has delivered a solution to the problem. A small business in the electorate of Grainler has come up with a, an encryption product that is a recognised world leader. And, uh, with uh, a bit of indulgence, I'll just uh, explain why it's a world leader. The Fin Review described it as ideal for sending files over the internet. Uh, the Australian uh, PC work, uh, APC said that it offered an unequalled level of protection in January 1997. PC Week in November 1996 said that it was, quote, beating the pants off the overseas competitions, end of quote. Of course it was beating the pants off the overseas competition. Now, the company that de de developed the product is called Nexus Solutions. But uh, who's been obstructing this new technology every step of the way? It's not surprisingly, it's international competitor, but somewhat surprisingly, of course, the Australian government. Nexus Solutions, which is based in uh, Grainler, as I have said, has developed its product relying on a 447-bit key resulting in a combination possibility of a billion times 10 to the power 481. That's a pretty big number of uh, combination possibilities. And to put it in another way, it would take around about two to 3,000 years to decrypt an email uh, encrypted using this um, encryption product. Now, Nexus landed a, a very large contract to sell thousands and thousands of site licences to the World Health Organisation. The Australian government would not let that company fulfil the contract <coughs> using the Customs Prohibited Exports Regulation 13E dual-use technology controls. It acted to prevent the Australian small business from exporting a product to fulfil a contract that it had landed with the World Health Organisation. This was despite the frequent and capable representations made on behalf of the member for Grainler. Now, why the Australian government feels that it needs to maintain a capacity to snoop on the World Health Organisation, frankly, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, is absolutely and utterly beyond me and, no doubt, probably beyond the World Health Organisation. So we lost export dollars. The company certainly lost export dollars. Nexus then tried to sell their product to the Australian government uh, itself. To do this, they were advised that uh, they would have to get their product government approved. And the process is that um, the software has to be tested and, I suppose, we could say rubber stamped to be approved to go on the list for departments to buy from. The government's outsourced the uh, testing pro process uh, of security software to a foreign company. It's an American company called CSC. And that company also, surprisingly, uh, happens to sell encryption software. So here we have a foreign market competitor being asked to test the Australian product. And who pays for the testing? The Australian company, the Australian small business, Nexus. And the overall cost imposed by the competitor overseas for rubber stamping the Australian underdog product ends up being around about a quarter of a million dollars. A quarter of a million dollars. Um, for a, w this is a product that sells, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, for around about $250 per twin site unit. So it, it is a very small margin that the company might make uh, for such a, a very huge outlay being asked uh, under the authority of the Commonwealth Government by the competitor. Worse is still yet to come for our small businessman in Grainler. He's asked to hand over the source code of his product to his competitor. Now, <clears throat> um, those of us uh, that know a little bit about uh, computer software and innovation would be aware that being asked to hand over your source code to your competitor is about as sensible as, or is about as senseless as it comes. Now, the Australian man battler then manages to get financial backing for the testing which only provides him the opportunity of selling his product. That is, he got backing some quarter of a million dollars to get the product tested 
uh, so that he might be able to sell the product. But the government then told him that they won't be able to get around to it. They won't have time to have his product tested by this um, third party overseas. After some time and some interaction, finally uh, the government, through the Office of the Defence Signals Directorate, uh, agreed to allow for the testing to take place, but only if the small business can, uh, can get a letter from a couple of departments saying that they will buy the product. And of course, the departments can't provide a letter saying they're going to buy a product that they can't find on the list of uh, approved purchases. And I'll just go to the letter um, from Mr Alan Owen, manager of the Cryptographics Evaluation Section of the Defence Signals Directorate, to a Mr Peter Pavlovic of um, Nexus Solutions Petrachi Limited, I believe he's the managing director. And uh, in that letter, in part, Mr Alan Owen says, um, you will also be aware that before we can undertake to evaluate Entrust, which uh, is the product, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, you will need to a government department to write to us requesting that we evaluate the product and confirming that they wish to purchase the product. This is our normal evaluation sponsorship agreement. Quite clearly, the Australian uh, small business that came up with this revolutionary solution to the problem that small business confronts on the internet globally was being given the royal runaround. Now, I don't believe this is government bungling on the behalf of the Office of the Defence Signals Director. I believe this is a concerted campaign by the government through that office to deny all Australian small business the opportunity of benef benefiting from consumer confidence in international commercial transactions over the net. It is a government acting decisively to do over the small business sector in order to satisfy the spooks here and overseas. It is a government that is acting decisively to, and patently to put foreign business in front of Australian small business. And it is a government that is acting decisively to deny privacy to the country's citizens. Like phone communication, there is an expectation from the general public that they will not be subject to willy-nilly interception, that they are free to conduct their personal affairs without unsolicited and unlawful snoops listening in. There is a legitimate fear in the community of not only the misuses of state-sponsored surveillance but also privately sponsored surveillance. My view is that individuals should have prima facie a right to privacy unless, of course, uh, an officer, an approved officer um, orders otherwise by way of uh, you know, enabling some kind of legitimate intercept in the pursuit of some kind of legitimate investigation. Now, whilst there can be a role, a legitimate role for surveillance by the state, I don't see the case for every Tom, Dick and Harry with a motive and some knowledge of Unix to have the ability to listen in and watch the personal interactions of everyone on the net. I certainly uh, don't see why my emails or, or other uh, personal interactions on the net should be intercepted by uh, uh, every Tom, Dick and Harry, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that most people on the net don't see why that should be the case either. I think that the, uh, the community who do use the internet would like to avail themselves of secure and reliable encryption products. But that's exactly what the government sanctions by preventing local business from exporting a 448-bit key encryption technology. The Office of the Defence Signals Directorate has invited Nexus to downgrade their encryption technology to a government-approved standard and have suggested that if they did so, then Nexus might have fewer problems. And in uh, the letter that I previously quoted from, um, the, the Office of the Defence Signals Directorate <coughs> suggests that a crypto variable space of around about 40 bits might do the job. Uh, bear in mind, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the product uh, offered here by uh, Nexus is a 448-bit key, uh, key encryption technology. So clearly the standard that the government would like Australian consumers to accept is an inferior standard. And it is a standard which has been uh, cracked. It's a standard which uh, has been shown to be deficient by uh, kids on the net so far, and that's well understood by consumers on the net. 
So the position of the government at this stage through the Office of the Defence Signals Directorate is a position, in my view, which is putting the brakes on Australian small business seeking to uh, exploit the emerging opportunities presented on the internet. The IT industry is one that Labor would like uh, the government to foster. Now, I believe that the government should cease its obstruction of this important encryption tool in the national and the private interest if the government wants to ensure that its intelligence organisations can continue to snoop the net, then it must at least make sure that local companies who develop products uh, which the government might find acceptable, such as the old unreliable 40-bit key technology, then it might do in such a way as to not expose our local companies to unfair foreign interest. That is, local small business shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be asked to cough up around about a quarter of a million dollars and hand over the source code to their competitors by the government um, uh, in order to get approval uh, for an export licence. Clearly, the, the conundrum presented in this debate is that unlike telephone intercepts, uh, the net is a, is a method of or a, provides a framework of communication which does not accept prima facie that people have privacy. Technically, that's not possible without the introduction of sophisticated encryption technologies. And that, that is what presents the difficulties for the spooks who like to rely upon uh, a capacity of having a look at what everyone is doing at any given point in time. And that is the very difficult paling which this government is straddling. With their traditional ideology, which purports to represent the rights of the individual over that of the collective, versus subjuga sub subjugating the rights of the collective for the right of the individual. In this debate, <coughs> clearly, the government is supporting no privacy for citizens on the internet at all, um, and it is supporting the proposition that Australian small business should be disadvantaged, should be slowed down on the internet, rather than exploit this emerging technology and move forward with it. I make the point again. Australians are one of the greatest uh, users of technology. They have, we have the fastest take-up rate of new technology. We are positioned to make use of this technology. Order. The member's time has expired. The question is that the bill be read a second time. I call the honourable member for Kalgoorlie. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In opposing this legislation, I would like to say at the onset that it's a fundamental philosophy of Australia First, the party I represent, that uh, the, government, the business of government is to represent the interests of the people of the nation. And if you listen to the member for Gradler, that's clearly not being done. It's a horrific tale. <coughs> hmm? Gradler, I said Gradler. Fraser, sorry. Sorry, the member for Fraser, yes. Yes, all right. I'm very sorry about that. You all look the same to me. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's fundamental, uh, the, the, from what he said, that the government is not doing this. But then neither did the previous government. It was the previous government that uh, <coughs> brought in legislation to make analogue mobile phone calls route back through the exchange so that they could be intercepted. It's this, this preoccupation that people have, uh, with the governments and bureaucrats have, with being able to control, control people. Now, I'm fundamentally opposed to this legislation because I think already there is too much snooping in Australia, and getting a federal court judge to uh, issue a warrant is easy enough. But, uh, as uh, Mr Fighting said, uh, evidence tendered before the judge, even in chambers, does have to have some credibility, although I'm not sure that is always the case, but it's quite clearly it's easy enough. The second point is this. With the march of technology, it is so easy to intercept phone calls now. It is not no longer done through the exchange. It can be done by placing apparatus parallel to the lines. They don't even have to touch the lines. And there is so much interception done now without any control whatsoever. And in many cases, it is simply having the knowledge that, is power that gives the powerful weapon uh, to prosecute or to persecute, it, uh, not necessarily to have a, the right to bring that into the, into the uh, court. The other thing, of course, is 
despite uh, all this, uh, this obsession uh, with snooping that you have from the bureaucracy in this country and in other countries, uh, with the advent of the uh, digital telephone, digital communications, digital to digital, are not interceptable at the present level of technology. And I understand it will be some time before that is the case. And anyone wishing to conduct their affairs uh, is almost certainly going to arrange them on that basis. So I think there's a, uh, a lot of hyperbole in this, uh, in this uh, proposed amendment to the government. The, um, we're told that we need it for the war on drugs. The truth about the war on drugs is this. If governments wanted to stop the incursion of drugs into Australia tomorrow, they could do it. It's quite relatively simple to do. All you have to do is destroy the profit. And the reason it's not done is this. Governments like this industry to proceed because it gives them something to divert attention, it gives something to blame for other problems in the community. There is the other thing. There is so much money involved in drugs, there are elements of bureaucracy that would hate to see this dry up because drugs are providing the all-pervading corruption that exists in Australia today. Now, there's been some talk in West Australia of a need for a Royal Commission of the Police Force. I don't believe this. My electorate represents 92.5 per cent of the state, in fact the entire state except for the wasteland around Perth, and I deal with the police at all levels constantly. And I find I do not believe, I simply do not believe there is any level of corruption there. I find a lot of dedication, often doing a very difficult job. No one's perfect, and there are um, examples of the police in the police force of less than perfection. I'll guarantee that. But where you're looking for corruption, you have to look at drug enforcement. And if you were to take the corruption out of drug enforcement, you would get rid of at least 75 of all the corruption. Corruption that pervades not only the police force, but also the judiciary and the bureaucracy. Now, how do you do this? Quite simply, you take away the profit motive. If we were to say, right, you're a heroin addict and the state will provide you with a prescribed amount of heroin at a prescribed uh, uh, constituency strength and uh, you will pay for this at a price which just covers its cost, very cheap to make, it will be available for you on prescription, you would cut out the massive crime and the profit motive. We don't get the, the, the big suppliers. We never do. And in this parliament, we've recently introduced legislation to allow the Commonwealth Police to import heroin, for heaven's sake, the Federal Police Force. I can tell, and I said at the time that was done, the Federal Police will shortly be rivaling the triads as a source of heroin imports. It's a, it was an absolute outrageous, stupid decision. When governments know if they were to control this business, they would wipe it out tomorrow. Now, I have got friends whose children are heroin addicts, and I see the agony that causes their life. Quite frankly, the best thing that would happen to those people is their kids die. And I know that if my kids were addicts, I might not be thinking that way. I might not be saying that, because I would not be thinking objectively. But at the end of the day, I don't care how many people kill themselves with overdoses of heroin. What I object to is the distortion of society, the distortion of the law, the robbing of chemist shops and the evolving of other innocent people. After all, the truth is this. Far more people die of analgesic overdose every year. Do we care about that? Of course we don't. Well, why don't we care? Because they're basically middle-aged women and they die screaming silently. But that's the truth of the matter. Now, if the government was prepared to be sensible about this, about and regulate drugs and not create this industry, because every time you raise the penalty, you raise the margin, and we don't get the big people, if the government were prepared to do that, you could put a stop to drugs tomorrow. But we've seen, we've seen people made criminals for marijuana, stuff that in Australia was legal prior to 1951 or 52. It was a constituent of just about every, every uh, patent medicine, but it was made illegal. And of course, you see governments, governments of the present persuasion and the other faction of the government that occupies the benches of the opposition, they're going the way to go the same way with tobacco. I think in my life I'll probably see smoking cigarettes become a jailable offence. The whole thing is a nonsense. 
It's one thing where I think we really should be looking at a few libertarian principles involved here. If you were to take away this, uh, this uh, profit motive, you would stop the industry tomorrow. You would not need then this, this all pervading uh, um, uh, invasion of the privacy of the ordinary citizen. And one only has to ask, ask, why does not this happen? The government can't be that stupid. The government must know. It doesn't happen because they don't want it to happen. They would rather have this war out there, which we must fight, take our minds off the real problems of this country, the lack of jobs in the country, because neither the government nor the opposition has a credible, coherent industry policy. That's the truth of it, Mr Deputy Speaker. Now, I just want to return to the situation in South Australia, in West Australia. You've got Mr Les Ayton, the ex-Deputy Commissioner, calling for a Royal Commission. Now, Mr Ayton was plucked out of the ranks by Commissioner Ball, given rapid promotion, and uh, he held some very senior positions. He was the kingpin of the West Australian Police Force for many years. And what did he do with all the power and authority he had? Why didn't he stamp it out then? If he'd done his job, we wouldn't need this, uh, his calls for a Royal Commission. But what you saw there was the abuse of power. You saw good officers, careers destroyed on the whims of this man. You saw cases where magistrates had thrown out the cases in a preliminary hearing. And to get a magistrate, to get a magistrate in this judiciary we have in this country to throw out a, a, a case at a preliminary hearing is almost impossible. But that occurred. And what did he do? In league with the Director of Public Prosecutions, the man who said he was the only policeman he, that he, he trusted, Ake was the only policeman he trusted, he got ex officio indictments. And there never was a case. And Mr Deputy Speaker, it is just as corrupt, in my view, to use the power and the force of the law for unnecessary uh, uh, attacks on people as it is uh, to take money for bribes. The cost of intellectual corruption is far more damaging very often than simple, simply taking money. And uh, it's more damaging because one can never really come to terms with the motives of the people. But I'd suggest to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that has been rife in West Australia and I suspect throughout Australia. Now, with other technological advances, this bill doesn't occur, doesn't, can't, doesn't deal with and can't deal with illegal bugging the use of directional microphones. All equipment which the West Australian Police Force has, and I suspect other police forces have as well, it can't control that. And uh, I think it's just absolutely fundamentally flawed to make it easier for the bureaucracy to snoop on people. Now, do you really think that people involved in high-scale in high espionage are going to be bothered by this? I'll bet the proverbial London of the brick, that they've already got uh, this equipment from uh, Nexus Solutions. Do you think a government embargo on exports is going to stop that? What it's going to do is create a, uh, a black market where the stuff will get out, almost certainly be copied, and we will lose the technological advantage we have. Because in industries like this, it is being, simply being there first that gives you the big advantage. Of course it will get out. After all, we've just seen a, uh, an invasionist country by the uh, Fujian triads. They got caught because the boat ran aground. And the trouble with that was, though the boat was stacked with the best, very best electronic equipment, it can't warn you of sandbanks if they're not on the maps. But let's think about it. If that one boat ran aground, how many boats didn't? And of course, it's been happening for some time, and it will probably go on happening, because our power <coughs> to intercept is very, very limited. Now, the government could act to do something about this. We now know that overwhelmingly, it is the Chinese triads are responsible for the entry of drugs in this country, drugs in this country probably over 70 per cent of them. We know that it's Vietnamese, Cambodian gangs mentioned in the parliament today, those kids on the street, 14-year-old kids, Vietnamese and Cambodian, 
We know that Koreans come, this country, Korean crime drag gangs coming here came in on visitor and student visas. Yet the government does nothing about this, and nor will these telephone intercepts do anything about adding any real security to Australia. What this legislation is, is about the government oppressing the people of Australia even more. I think it's an outrage. I will certainly be supporting the amendments put forward by the opposition, and uh, although I don't think they go far enough, I'm not going to the trouble of voting against the legislation. I know it will be a futile effort, but I think the opposition's amendments are certainly worthwhile. Heavens knows I trust judges in this country little enough, and the evidence shows that my judgment is uh, reasonably based. But to give this, this, this power to bureaucrats is an absurd nonsense. Does anyone seriously think there will be any real surveillance of this? It will simply be you, uh, the uh, people wishing to put on intercepts will get everything they ask for. And it's nonsense to suggest otherwise. And that may be. But that's what the bureaucracy wants. But it's not what I want, and I'm sure it's not what the great mass of the Australian people want. And I believe that this is a dangerous piece of legislation, a piece of legislation that the public of Australia should know about, but one which will hardly go reported in our media as witnesses by the lack of, uh, of any interest in the gallery. Thank you. Order. The question is, the bill be read a second time? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can I uh, wind up this debate on the uh, second reading by referring to a number of the issues that have been raised by those who have spoken, and I thank the members who have spoken, the member for Banks, the member for Maribyrnong, the member for Moore, the member for Fraser and the member for Kalgoorlie. I, I note that of the two principal purposes of the legislation, really only one has been dealt with in the, in the, in the debate. <coughs> Excuse me. There seems to be uh, no concern at all on those parts of the, uh, uh, of the bill designed to strengthen arrangements for dealing with pr police corruption. The only comments have been addressed to those parts of the bill which seek to introduce new arrangements by which agencies are able to obtain warrants authorising the interception of telecommunications for the investigation of serious criminal offences. And I haven't ignored the member for Kalgoorlie. Um, oh, that. Yes, I, I, I hear the interjection. I, I sus suspect that what the member for Kalgoorlie was talking about was police corruption in general and not those provisions of the bill which are designed to strengthen arrangements for dealing with it. Now, can I come to the, the, the proposed new arrangements? Uh, settling on the proposed new arrangements was not an easy task, and I, uh, I think the uh, member for Banks would be uh, aware, as others might be, that for my part I would, I'm very reluctant to see any change that, that uh, results in the power to issue warrants being conferred on anybody but judges at the Superior Court level. I think it, the, the reasoning by which that the decision was made in 1979 or whenever it was made um, that judges should exercise that power was the right one and it was done for the right reason. But I think the arguments that are being put up um, to oppose what is proposed in the bill are in effect flying blind. They're not looking at the practical um, practical considerations that have arisen since, since 1979. It might have been uh, beneficial to the opposition if they sought some briefing on the bill, and I, I we certainly were willing to provide any information that might, uh, might assist, but, uh, but in Unfortunately, the opposition didn't take up the opportunity of, of obtaining a briefing, and, and some of the seem of the some of the arguments put up, I think, uh, ignore considerations that have arisen since the decision of the High Court in Grollo's case. If you 
if you start with Grollo's case, I think the, and the, the member for Banks certainly referred to it, it shouldn't go unnoticed that Justice McHugh, who is not one of the more um, implied rights-minded judges on the High Court, dissented, and in his judgment, the, the provisions in the legislation under consideration which authorise judges of federal courts to issue warrants are unconstitutional and invalid. At, in, at page, at page 238 in the Australian Law Report report, the judge said that the reason for the invalidity is that the exercise of administrative power that is involved in authorising authorising the issue of those warrants is incompatible with the exercise of the judicial functions vested in persons who are judges of a federal court. Since the decision in Grollo, the, the High Court has decided a couple of, couple of other cases in which judicial power has been uh, the, the focus. One case was uh, Wilson and the, and the Minister, and another case was Cable and the DPP. And I think the trend is, in High Court reasoning, towards an even greater protection of the integrity of judicial power than was evinced in the judgment of the majority in Grollo, or the, the judgments of the majority in Grollo. And the, the majority in Grollo were certainly troubled by the judges exercising the power to issue interception warrants. Now, the, the reasoning uh, is, is set out in the, in the judgments, the judgment, uh, joint judgment of Chief Justice Brennan and Justices Dean Dawson and Tui, and the separate judgment of Justice McHugh. Focuses in the argument um, has been on the, the, the separation of the judge as a judge from the, from the function under the legislation. Uh, and their identification is what are in legal terms are referred to as persona designata. Now that, the, the, what the, um, the High Court said in effect was that the judges could exercise the power. Uh, however, um, they urged caution having regard to the, the nature of the exercise of judicial power and the involvement of judges in anything that might, uh, might undermine the independence and perceived independence of the judges when they're exercising judicial power. Now, judges have consented in the past, both from the federal court and the family court, to exercise the power, and that consent is still current. But the judges of the federal court have decided collegiately that they will not exercise that power in the future. And uh, I understand the judges of the family court have done the same. If one withdraw, if, the, if one is left with a situation when judges of neither federal court at the trial level is willing to exercise the power, you are then left with a situation that there is no federal judicial officer able to exercise that power. It means that you have to look for other authorities. And what we've done is search high and low to see whether there are other authorities, and we have identified senior officers with legal qualifications and experience at the, in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal as the only body that, that we're prepared to recommend. And I do I emphasise that we do it reluctantly. But uh, let me say that quite apart from the consent or withdrawal of consent um, there's another factor that needs to be taken into account. At one stage, and I can't, uh, it was a, about a year ago, I was advised that 17 of the then 44 judges of the federal court were respondents to applications in the federal court for judicial review of their own decisions to issue interception warrants. Now that's, that's just wrong and it's designed to, it, it, it's calculated to to uh, undermine public confidence in the in the judiciary when the judiciary has to sit in judgment of their own on their own judgments, so practical considerations in this situation are absolutely compelling, and contrary to the the, the expressed views of the member for Kalgoorlie, if we're going to win the war against organised crime, 
we're going to have to exercise technol use technological skills and, and machinery, apparatus and equipment in order to in order to catch catch criminals because organized crime is just that. It is organized and it is using all technology that it can. The the level of technology that is employed by international drug running syndicates is alarming and we have to have the best possible means of countering their activities and telecommunications interception is one of the, the few ways where we, we are able to catch them at, at work. Now I don't see anything in the arguments put by the opposition that suggest that they're not in support of the use of telecommunications interception or listening devices for the, for the purpose of capturing uh, and charging criminals, uh, but at least criminals engaged in serious criminal activity. It therefore becomes a practical question of what safeguards will the public have uh, in the use of the warrants for the appropriate purposes. The judiciary as the, the traditional protector is no longer available. We've gone to the next best uh, alternative, which is not members of a judiciary, but members of a quasi-judicial body accustomed to doing the sort of things that the High Court regard as important. Uh, the member for Banks, I think, read from the judgment of the four members who delivered a joint judgment um, as dealing with the, the requirements of a person who is going to exercise the power. It is, an, it is an intrusive power, it's an important power, and it must be exercised with the greatest care, sensitivity and, and uh, independence. The members of the AAT who have the qualifications that are provided for in the bill the government believes are appropriate persons to exercise that, that power. Now, the The, the, on, the, on the question of consent, um, the member for Banks has made a, what I can only treat as a glib suggestion that we appoint additional judges to, to who will have the particular function of exercising uh, the powers under the Telecommunications Interception Act. I, I, I don't treat that suggestion seriously. There is a need for judges in a variety of jurisdictions uh, and a variety of places. They must be available at, at, at a, lot of, a lot of the day. One of the requirements under the Act is for uh, an intensive system of reporting. I actually get delivered to me on a quarterly basis uh, records of all warrants that have been issued, by whom they've been issued, in respect of what and, and for what period and the, the actual records are, are available to me if required. I do review those reports and one thing that is plain is that the judges who have exercised the power in the past are in a variety of places and there is a number uh, of judges at any given time who are, uh, who are exercising the power. So there is a need for availability that necessitates having people available not only in the capital cities, but available to be dealt with from, from wherever the, there is a need for, for the, the warrant to be issued. And having a large number of judges, like the, the 30 of the 35, uh, uh, the 30 or odd of the federal court who uh, have consented in the past to act, uh, and family court judges, is beneficial. And we need a similar number if the judges are not going to be available. Again, the members of the AAT um, would would be appropriate to uh, from that point of view. The, the the problem is a significant one from the point of view of the court, also in the in the in the the time that each of them must spend in order to issue a warrant. A judge doesn't simply look at a piece of paper, read a very short affidavit, and then act on it. In, in, in a normal situation, the judge will receive 
an application and will, will actually hear the applicant or someone on whose behalf the, the, the application is made. And I'm advised that each application can take on average between an hour and two hours. Now that, that is a, a significant uh, time commitment in uh, four judges who, who are appointed to exercise judicial functions rather than the executive function that this is. Uh, on that on that basis, I, th I think we we ought also to uh, have regard to the desirability of finding a, another another source. Now, I note um, that no speaker, um, except the member for Kalgoorlie, has suggested uh, an alternative source of the exercise of the power. The member for Kalgoorlie has suggested. In, uh, employing members of the, the private sector, by which I, I assume he means private lawyers, that I don't think would be publicly acceptable. The, in, order to ex, in order to exercise the power, uh, I think the public must have the, the greatest level of confidence that it will be exercised impartially and uh, for bona fide purposes and on that basis, the, the person to exercise the power must be publicly visible. I don't think that members of the private legal profession, uh, however much respect might be accorded to them individually, would be, uh, would be seen in that category because they would not be members of an identifiable class, the legal profession itself being far too large to, to be identifiable. Well, anything the member for Kalgoorlie says uh, ought to be taken seriously in this, in this front. If, if the member for Kalgoorlie, as he, as he now interjects to say, was making a facetious suggestion, then I will comment no further on it. But I'd suggest he refrain from making facetious suggestions in a, in a serious debate. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I think the uh, the government has made its case. It's a convincing case for reform. It's a, it's a reform the, desire, the uh, government makes reluctantly, but necessarily. And on that basis, I commend the bill to the House. Order. The question is that the bill be read a second time. All of those opinion, that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception Act 1979, the Australian Federal Police Act 1979, the Customs <coughs> Act 1901 and the Financial Transactions, Transaction Reports Act 1988 and for related purposes. The House will now consider the bill in detail. I understand it is the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move amendments 1 to 38 as circulated in my name together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move amendments 1 to 38 as circulated in my name. As I said in my second reading speech, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, my amendments are aimed at uh, amending the bill before us, which at the moment uh, allows an extension to the Interception Act that will permit the Minister to nominate specified members of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal to issue interception, interception warrants for law enforcement purposes. And the bill also contains corresponding amendments to the AFP Act and the Customs Act, which will authorise nominated AAT members to issue listening device warrants to Commonwealth law enforcement agencies. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said in my uh, second reading speech, um, the opposition believes that this is not the way to go. Uh, I understand the attorney when he says that he is reluctant to see this change. It's the opposition's view that if this change were to go forward and proceed, then it is a weakening of what is a very intrusive process that at the moment does have the confidence of the community because it is judicial officers who are exercising those powers. Uh, the former government made a number of amendments to the Act, 
as a result of earlier cases. It's significant that in Grollo it wasn't it was a 5-1 majority, and there was a joint judgment, and it was a very powerful joint judgment um, of, of four judges of the court. And the court in that judgment, I quoted the unreported version, pages 17 through to 19, gave the history of why it was that it was judges that used these powers. Now, I understand that some federal court judges might not want to. Uh, exercise these powers. But the fact is that the High Court has said that they can, that it is legal under the Act at the moment, and it is not a flippant suggestion to, to say that if there's a problem with the resources, and there's no doubt that the judges are being asked to do more and more uh, with less resources, then I don't think it is a flippant suggestion to suggest appoint more judges. Because what you can then do is, in effect, have uh, extra judges spreading the workload throughout the federal court, and then have specialised judges who have consented throughout the Commonwealth, who are designated judges, who actually um, do this particular work, and so that you won't have a situation where you find 17 out of 44 judges, you know, the subject of proceedings. But there should be a moderate expansion of the court to allow this um, important. Um, um, role to be continued by federal court judges, because to allow the AAT um, to to now do this, in in the opposition's view, is to bring the system into disrepute. The arguments have all been put. It is disappointing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but it's important to to point out that on the government side, only the Attorney General has participated in the debate. He opened the debate and he closed the debate. Not one other government member has risen in this chamber to support what is a fundamental change to current principles, and that is disturbing. I commend the amendments to the House. The opposition will be calling a division on them. We believe that the government hasn't made out the case. We believe that a proper reading of Grollo's case would lend the government to conclude that they really should be providing further resources rather than having this alternative of weakening what is a current um, uh, protection in the Act for all of us. I commend the amendments to the House. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the honourable the Attorney General. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, the member for Banks in putting the opposition amendments has not really said anything that wasn't already covered in the second reading speech. Uh, so I can, I can be very brief. I uh, indicate, of course, that the government opposes the amendments and will respond in the division accordingly. The, the opposition has not really addressed the, difficult, the practical difficulties, the refusal of the judges to consent, the, the, the fact that the judges are respondents to judicial review proceedings in respect of their decisions but in their own court. Uh, and has, has not really been, uh, I think, uh, in any way critical of the capacity of the members of the Administrative Appeals to be able to do the job. Uh, the government opposes the amendment. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those that have been say aye. aye. By the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. No. The, ayes no's, the ayes have it. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion will pass to the right of the chair or the contrary to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler, Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Corangamite, Lyme and Riverina tell us for the ayes. The noes. Sorry, Bruce, not Marilyn. Oh, yes, Marilyn. Who's Mr. Fowler? It's Port
Order. The result of the division is ayes 45, noes 78. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. It being past 7.30 pm, I propose the question that the House do now adjourn. Parliamentary Secretary. I require that the question be put forth with without debate. The question is that the House do now adjourn. Those that have been say aye or the contrary no. I think the eyes have it. No, 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 the the noes have it. The noes have it. The question is that this bill be agreed to. <laughs> All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. This bill has been agreed to. The honourable the attorney general to move the third reading, or will you move it on his behalf? The attorney. I seek leave of the house, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to move the third reading forthwith. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The honourable the attorney. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those that have been say aye, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Just, just, just a minute. Sure. Third reading: a bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception Act 1979, the Australian Federal Police Act 1979, the Customs Act 1901, and the Financial Transaction Reports Act 1988, and for related purposes. Order. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend legislation relating to customs and excise and for related purposes, and acquaints the House, acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the annexed schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Honourable the Parliamentary Mr. Secretary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be considered at the next sitting. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that have been say aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Attorney General. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. The question is that the House do now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It appears some in our parliament are confused. National Party Senator Ronald Boswell today launched an absurd attack on me where he tried to associate me with just about everyone except Jack the Ripper. I can understand why Ronald is so hot under the collar, but it has nothing to do with anything he said in his irrelevant triad of silliness. It is all about the fact that rural and regional voters are deserting Order. the National Party in droves. What the Nationals should be doing is splitting from the Liberals so they can have their own voice instead of being caught up and dominated by the Liberal agenda. The Liberals have no interest in the constituents of the Nationals. In fact, many of their left-wing members and senators are more comfortable with Labor Party views and see the National Party as their true enemies. The National Party should stand on their own two feet and start representing the people who elected them. Rural and regional voters are turning to me for hope. The Nationals can only expect to lose more and more support as they continue to allow themselves to be placed under the Liberal Party's thumb. Perhaps next time Ronald wants to have a go at me, he'll say what's really wrong. Order. The Honourable Member for Oxley will resume her seat. The Honourable Member for Bruce on a point of order. Speaker, and that it's uh, correct practice in this House to refer to members of another chamber by their correct title. The uh, Honourable Member Oxley will, of course, refer to other members of the chamber by their correct title. 
He'll say what is really worrying him instead of the silliness we saw today. Maybe Senator Boswell will even find some backbone and speak and act on behalf of the people out in the country instead of just being the Liberal Party's puppet. As our Prime Minister has escaped the issue of rising unemployment by leaving the country, his parting attack on me is evidence that he doesn't understand the priorities in Australia. I speak of jobs and all Mr Howard can do is speak of me. The Prime Minister's preoccupation with wanting to somehow associate me with foreign extremists may be of great concern to the Australian people. When is Mr Howard going to do something to create jobs? For that matter, when has Mr Howard ever been successful at creating even one job? Has Mr Howard ever been in business? Has Mr Howard ever actually even employed someone himself and been responsible for producing the income to keep that person employed? Or is it Mr Howard just a career politician with no real or recent experience of the Australian outside politics? Jobs, Prime Minister Howard, not fleeing overseas to speak of me. Jobs, Prime Minister Howard, not jetting to London for the cricket. Jobs, Prime Minister Howard, not watching the baseball in New York. Prime Minister, when next you speak of me and infer I am a racist, remember I am here in Australia and I am trying to help my fellow Australians while you swan around the world on a trip of a questionable nature that looks like an excuse for a sports tour. Prime Minister, I doubt the Australian people see you as much of a sport. While you were overseas in foreign lands speaking oh. of me and having deserted Australia's unemployed, perhaps you should start to think about getting your priorities in order and whether you are a citizen of Australia or a citizen of the world. If you can't get these things right, then step down before you and your policies put even more Australians out of work. Be the leader you were elected to be and lead Australia from Australia or get out now and give someone else Member a, for a go. In the future, perhaps members and senators could say what mate. they mean instead of what they want reported. Perhaps members and senators could learn to deal with the issues. And also, it's very nice to hear from all you gentlemen and ladies. It's nice to know that you're here representing all your constituents and the people of Australia to the best interests. And the main issue here is let's get employment and get, let's get jobs for Australians first and foremost. Order. The question is that the House do now adjourn the honourable member for Swan. Mr Speaker, the West Australian Trades and Labor Council and its leader Tony Cook are gearing up for another round of industrial strife in WA under the guise of acting on behalf of its union members. Or well, Tony Cook, how about representing all of your union members, not just your powerful mates? But the small individuals that have called you often your office often this in the last few weeks for help and you haven't even bothered to return their calls. The specific case to which I refer is as follows. Two school teachers, Cheryl Soggy and Colleen Reid, were unfairly dismissed from Kalunga School last year. These teachers were members of the Independent Schools and Salaried Officers Association (IWSOA). On request and on behalf of these teachers, the IWSOA lodged an appeal of unfair dismissal to the West Australian Relations Industrial Relations Commission (WAIRC). This was done without informing the teachers that they could lodge an appeal under their own names. Kalunga School held a reconciliation conference with the WAIRC without the teachers' knowledge or presence. Subsequently, the two teachers were informed at the of the meeting and they were told they should accept the decisions that was arrived at in their absence. The two aggrieved teachers elected not to accept the proposed arrangements and preferred to take the matter to trial. At a later meeting with Ivan Sands and Theresa Howe of the Association come Union and Cheryl Soggy, the union said that they would not proceed to trial because they didn't believe the case was winnable. The union also stated that if they lost, that Cheryl would be unemployable. In other words, they were praying fear tactics on her. Cheryl elected to take her chance. Ivan Sands of the union said the IWSOA doesn't fight on principles. They wouldn't take the matter to trial, therefore take it or leave it. Cheryl Soggy informed the IWSOA that she would engage at her own expense a private lawyer to which they replied do, do, replied, do what you want. Mark Diamond, a private lawyer, was given the case of their unfair dismissal appeal and this was subsequently won before the WAIRC on behalf of Cheryl and Colleen. 
Cheryl and Colleen are now waiting to appeal, not the decision but the amount of compensation awarded, which was only eight weeks. Ivan Sands, on behalf of the IWSOA, has now refused their request to sign a Form 7, which will again see the matter handed to the private legal representation that is being retained by Cheryl and Colleen. Ivan Sands has also referred, refused to return the phone calls of these teachers. Eventually, when he returned their calls, he stated his intention not to cooperate with the teachers. He also knew that by taking so much time, the 21-day appeal period had virtually expired. He refused to put his decision in writing and said he was going home early, but when they rang some time later he was still there. He hadn't gone home at all. Tony Cook, the so-called representative of the West Australian Trades and Labor Council, has also refu refused to return numerous phone calls for these teachers when they asked for help. This sad case begs a few questions of this unrepresentative union, the IWSOA. Does the IWSOA only represent people whose cases, in their opinion, they can win? Don't they represent members, members with difficult cases? If this is the case, I send a general warning to all IWSOA members that the union is unrepresentative and not worth belonging to. Other IWSOA members must ask themselves why they pay union fees like Colleen and Cheryl when the union chooses not to represent them or even let some private assistance be used. The IWSOA dishonestly claimed credit for Cheryl and Colleen's win in the West Australian Industrial Relations Commission in the West Australian newspaper on 30 April. Does Ivan Sands and the IWSOA and Tony Cook and the TLC only represent their noisy union mates like those in the so-called tent embassy at the expense of ignoring the other battling and fee-paying members like Colleen and Cheryl? Or is it up to coalition members like myself who have to help the little people because their unions won't? I think it's a disgusting situation that these people aren't being represented by their union. They need the help to get this appeal through the Industrial Relations Court of Western Australia, and they have been blocked by the people who purport to represent them. Order. The question is that the House to now adjourn the honourable member for Fraser. Uh, Mr Speaker, I am going to read from the report bringing them home from the National Inquiry into the Separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children from their Families um, from Confidential Evidence No. 10 in Queensland. The evidence reads, They were very cruel to us, very cruel. I have done things in that home that I don't think prisoners in a jail would do today. I remember once, I must have been eight or nine, I was locked in the old morgue. The adults who worked there would tell us of things that happened in there so you can imagine what I went through. I screamed all night, but no one came to get me. And later uh, uh, evidence from uh, confidential evidence number eight from New South Wales. I've seen girls naked, strapped to chairs and whipped. We've all been through the locking up period, locked in dark rooms. I've had a problem of fainting when I was growing up, and I got belted every time I fainted. And this is belted not just on the hands or nothing. I've seen my sister dragged by the hair into those block rooms and belted because she's trying to protect me. How can this be for my own good? Please tell me. The question posed by that evidence begs an answer. It begs an answer from this government. And it is an answer which this government, in my view, is yet to provide. In the limited time remaining, I'd like to go to some other evidence provided. Because my mother wasn't educated, the white people were allowed to come in and do whatever they wanted to do. All she did was sign papers. Quite possibly she didn't even know what she signed. The biggest hurt, I think, was having my mum chase the welfare car. I'll always remember it. We were looking out the window and mum was running behind us and signing out for us. They locked us in the police cell up here and mum was walking up and down outside the police station and crying and screaming out for us. There was ten of us. Finally, um, 
evidence from this, the same witness, 689, from New South Wales. Most of us went to Crown Street Hospital. That was where when my son was born. And then we went back to the hostel with the baby. Once we were there, we had the welfare coming in, asking you what, was going, uh, what you were going to do, telling you most of the time that your parents didn't want you, the father of the baby didn't want you. They said to me they couldn't find anyone that wanted me and they couldn't find anywhere for me, like a living job where I could take the baby. And then they said the only one they could find that was willing to take me was my eldest sister, who I'd never seen since I was a little girl. She told us before, she'd gone before us, she went away with some white people that were supposed to take her away for a good education. They'd said she was the only one who was willing to take me, but she didn't want the baby, so they brought the papers in and told me to sign, and that was it. The dispossession and the destruction of the family relations uh, evidenced by this report bringing them home requires a substantial and a, and a heartfelt response on behalf of the nation. This is not about feeling personal guilt for the actions of others uh, of past generations and perhaps of people still present. This is about recording a national regret for an obvious wrong perpetrated on part of our community. question is that the House do now adjourn the honourable member for Karangamite. Uh, tonight we have a large number of primary school children from my electorate of uh, Karangamite from the uh, schools of Meredith, Lethbridge, Batesford and Shelford and uh, Anarchy in the, uh, in the uh, seat of Kariah. They have made the trip to Canberra to uh, see the federal parliament in action, Mr Speaker, to witness firsthand the deliberations of the elected representatives of Australia. Recently I visited the uh, group at the Meredith School to talk to the students about the parliament, Australia's dem democracy and the system of government. We conducted a mock parliament and, uh, where the two, two sides uh, debated a very important issue before, the, before that particular parliament. We learned about the procedure of the parliament at, at the school. Yesterday the students came here to the parliament to uh, see the parliament in action. And, Mr Speaker, they saw you in action in your role as the speaker of this parliament, uh, well, trying, to keep order, trying to keep order in the parliament here and, uh, and maintain a, a, a sense of decorum. Uh, keeping. Uh, uh, the stridently held views of both sides and keeping a sense, a sense of balance. However, they, uh, they saw the member for Karaya, who was uh, given uh, a one-hour uh, suspension because uh, he was uh, not behaving as well as he might have done. The member for Karaya, who uh, once, worked for, uh, once worked for Senator Button, a champion of the lower tariffs and free trade, who's now uh, become a champion of uh, no tariff cuts. What a change he's undertaken. So that uh, he was uh, given a little suspension just at the half-time break, uh, uh, the member for Karaya, which is uh, his usual style. Although he had a friend with him as well, the member for Holt, uh, the deputy leader. He had also a suspension. And I commend you, Mr. Speaker, for your uh, uh, impartial, impartial uh, deliberation on that occasion, which you had again today. And I'm sorry my students weren't here to uh, uh, see you in action again in your impartial way, in the way in which you uh, deliberated here in the, in the parliament. But back here in, in Meredith, we had a mock parliament, and the speaker on that occasion was myself, as a member for Karangamite. And I had similar difficulties with the students because uh, they, uh, they showed uh, similar uh, tendencies as members in this parliament in expressing their views, putting them forward strongly, and uh, they showed uh, a couple of points of order and uh, were, were, uh, had to be pulled into line by the acting speaker at, on, that, on that occasion. And as they've seen here earlier in the evening, they've seen that this parliament is a an expression of views throughout the nation, uh, a philosophic differences that people on both sides express and uh, put them in a very strong and uh, robust. Uh, robust manner. And as I often say to the students around my electorate, that is very much better than armed conflict that takes place in, in other nations around, uh, around the world. At an election time, Australians have a chance to uh, put their, uh, their points of view and uh, by the electorate uh, through, the, uh, through the ballot box, and again at the, uh, at the Meredith School we conducted a ballot so that the students could uh, fully understand the significance of a secret ballot. And I must say I'm personally supportive of the compulsory, uh, uh, compulsory uh, uh, voting procedures that Australians have undertaken because it means that everyone participates in the democracy, unlike the situation in America where President Clinton was elected with little over 25 per cent of the, of the population. 
back in uh, Meredith and uh, Lethbridge and Bannockburn and the other areas represented by the schools tonight. Conditions have been very tough in, uh, in the electorate of Karangamite, where seasonal conditions have been poor, where local beef producers are suffering uh, poor cattle prices and uh, the, because of the uh, international high grain prices in, uh, in America. Uh, wool growers are now recovering and the uh, wool uh, price is now edging to 700 cents as uh, sheep numbers recover and hopefully that industry will uh, be better off uh, in, in the near future. The, uh, despite the uh, hardship uh, of those two industries uh, in, in my electorate, the uh, farmers have been working hard under the uh, land care arrangements to uh, contain the serrated tussock, a uh, noxious weed which could have devastating uh, devastating uh, impact on farmers in the in the Karaya electorate. I can see that to the member uh, that uh, he has some serrated tussocks in some parts of his electorate, and that is a weed that needs to be uh, uh, removed. Maybe like the uh, member for Karaya at some future date. Um, the uh, also uh, also in the electorate of Karangamite in the Meredith area, we have a tree planting program where uh, trees are being planted by uh, farmers and by uh, 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 other people and other industries to build up uh, a, uh, uh, the, uh, the problem of salinity and soil degradation and I do commend uh, those farmers who are embarking on this uh, new uh, tree planting program. Finally, can I say I hope that the students of, uh, uh, the, of the American Member's School have enjoyed their trip to Canberra and seen the parliament in action in, it, in it all its uh, competitive uh, arrangements. Does the Honourable Member for Karaya require a right of reply, or should <laughs> I call your colleague? Speaker, <laughs> I, I, uh, I just seek your indulgence for a moment. I was going to draw your attention to the fact that the Member for Karangamite wasn't addressing his remarks through the chair and could have been disciplined uh, as I was, but of course he has completed his speech and I take his, uh, the points that he's the made. The Honourable Member for Barton. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Speaker. I would also like to refer to an extract from the report bringing them home, both in terms of drawing a further matter to the attention of the House and also in honour of the work of uh, Sir, uh, Sir Ronald Wilson and others involved in the preparation of the report. This is a report of William, it's uh, Confidential Evidence 553. And William says, I, can't re I can remember this utility with a coffin on top with flowers. As a little boy, I saw it get driven away, knowing there was something inside that coffin that belonged to me. I think I was six years old at the time. That was uh, William's mother. He speaks of uh, being taken away from his auntie and uncle. And he says, as a little kid, I can't remember what was going on really because I was a child and I thought I was going on a trip with other brothers. I just had excitement for going on a trip. That's all I can think of at the time. And he speaks of being taken to St Francis Orphanage and then being taken to a the home of a woman uh, known as Mrs R. He says that the welfare officer led him and his brother into their home and showed them with the uh, welfare officer a, uh, a large and well furnished room. However, he gives the account that after the welfare officer left, uh, they were taken outside to a caravan and that became their home. He said, I was sleeping in the caravan. I was only a little boy then. In the middle of the night, someone came to the caravan and raped me. That person raped me and raped me. I could feel the pain going through me. I cried and cried, and they stuffed my head in the pillow. I had nobody to talk to. It wasn't the only night it happened. Oh God, it seemed like night after night. It seemed like nobody cared. I don't know how long it went on for, but night after night, I'd see the bogeyman. I never saw the person. I don't know who that person was. And William gives the evidence of being taken away from that family. And he said, they shifted us again and it was into town again. And then they put us with this bloke. They've got the records of what he did to me. That man abused me. He made me do dirty things uh, that we never wanted to do. Where was the counselling? Where was the help I needed? They knew about it. The guy went to court. He went to court, but they did nothing for me, nothing. They sent us off to the child psychology unit uh, I remember the child psychologist saying, he's an Aboriginal kid, he'll never improve. And William gives the account of some behavioural problems that he has uh, and uh, uh, the effect on, of alcohol abuse, um, marijuana abuse and the problems he has 
now uh, communicating with his children. Um, the uh, the, the, the uh, story is itself obviously very moving, and there's a number of other moving reports. Um, the, the accepted um, um, analysis is now the case that the Prime Minister can certainly uh, give an apology on behalf of the nation in this House. Indeed, he could give an apology outside this House, uh, appropriately worded, without uh, being at admission for the purpose of legal proceedings and, and damages. And I think in light of this, these facts that have been given to the government of the day, I think as a matter of honour, uh, it's incumbent on the government to apologise and express the profound regret of the nation uh, for what has occurred. Essentially, the government also has two choices. It can deal with the issue of compensation administratively or it can let the process take place in the courts. And there's no doubt, in, in my view at least, that this report constitutes a material fact uh, which will overcome any time limitation problems that otherwise may have existed. In my view, uh, litigants would have within 12 months of the handing down of this or becoming aware of its contents to commence proceedings. If proceedings are commenced, as they most certainly will be, without administrative compensation, there's every prospect that damages will far outweigh any administrative uh, uh, remedy. Uh, those damages are going to be to the select few who have the resources to commence proceedings, in addition to the higher cost burden that the government will suffer uh, in those proceedings. The government will, of course, suffer an additional burden of legal, Order, legal fees, which will be at least 20 per cent of the cost. The House stands adjourned until 9.30 tomorrow.